section. It is being. Uh, is it being broadcast or just taped? Both. Both being broadcast and taped. Which is something I don't believe we've done in the past. First. So I'll turn the meeting over to our town administrator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you and I had had a conversation uh, a week or so ago. We had a conversation with the entire board at Monday night's meeting, and I had requested a, an opportunity to make a brief presentation with regard to uh, an overview of the operating budget and in particular the town administrator's recommendations. Uh, certainly this is the first public discussion of the uh, individual and of the specifics of the budget that will take place and this will be, a, as everyone is aware, a, a long process. Um, so I appreciate that opportunity. I'll take just a couple of minutes to present from the podium a, a, a brief PowerPoint presentation. Certainly ask any questions, but uh, I would suspect that um, most of the questions that may be out there will be germane to the particular departmental budget, so we could have the discussion at that time as well. That's certainly What's the heat set to here? 71 degrees, I believe it is. Okay, it's feeling a little chilly over I'll, I'll turn side. it up. slides that I wanted to run through and it's really more for the edification of the public because the members of the Select and the Finance Committee all have uh, hard copies of what's being presented here. So just a, a note again, uh, department heads were requested in October pursuant to the conversation that both uh, the Finance Committee and the Selectmen had regarding goals to submit proposals that would consider reducing costs, improving operations and service delivery, and that would create a transparent budget document. The document itself includes <coughs> Fiscal year 2015 expenditures to date through 12 31 2014. It includes recommendations from the town administrator. It includes a chart in which departments outline expenditure changes versus their fiscal year 2015 budget. Uh, and a note that I would make is that uh, in some cases the recommendations may not match the departmental budget, and that would be a result of modifications made after the finance director and I met with the department head. <coughs> The budget review and recommendation process. Budgets were reviewed by the town administrator and the finance director with the department heads. Uh, there were individual department meetings. The finance director and town administrator uh, consulted to create town administrator recommendations, which are, again are reflected in the uh, budget document pending before you. Uh, one thing that I will note is we did not meet with the Hillview Commission, um, and I think that that's the only other exception that, uh, to the top of my mind. So a couple of things that I'll note that are proposed programmatic changes that are, are really a reflection of my observations over the past few months as well as a commentary that I've received in a variety of different forums. The first was, uh, as we're all aware, implement, uh, implementation of the uniform cell phone and vehicle policy across all non-public safety departments. Um, right now, uh, this is in the budget pursuant to the initial discussions that the Board of Selectmen had a couple of weeks ago on each of the policies subject to final approval, which will be uh, requested from the board at the next two meetings, um, at which point then uh, it would be uh, final policy potentially subject to discussion with some collective bargaining units. So it is very much a work in progress, and that's been explained to department heads um, that what has been recommended is not necessarily what's going to occur, but uh, certainly I think that there's a likelihood that that will be the case. Uh, the transferring oversight of animal control officer functions to the police department uh, in the pursuit of potential regionalization. Um, from my observation discussions, it's my belief that uh, the animal control function is largely an operating function uh, requiring uh, operating oversight uh, outside of the normal business hours and that the police department is the appropriate location for it. A note with regard to the pursuit of potential regionalization, uh, I won't mention the communities at this point in time uh, because I'm not sure where their respective managers and administrators are at in public discussion, but there are at least two communities that are interested in uh, regionalizing this function uh, as soon as this upcoming fiscal year, and those conversations uh, continue. Um, it, it's clear uh, from my discussions that it appears that North Reading will serve, uh, would serve as uh, the hub for that type of um, operation because of the fact that we have two uh, employees 
because we have uh, a kennel a pound uh, located at the public works facility. Um, but again, those discussions will continue over the coming months and I'll continue to keep both the board and the finance committee uh, advised. The third thing I'll note is the development of a new model of oversight, maintenance, and cleaning of town buildings uh, with the potential to share resources with the town, uh, with the school department. Um, that'll, be, that'll come up in the DPW director's presentation, but uh, essentially it calls for uh, making a change in the table of organization uh, as a result of uh, both the needs and an upcoming retirement um, to create a .8 full-time employee facility superintendent and a 1.0 full-time employee uh, laborer. <coughs> And the goal would be to ultimately cut down on the use of contracted services to maintain the buildings by using a laborer. Now, um, what I'll note is the discussions I've had with the superintendent of schools is that there could be a potential, and I say could, that uh, point two, of, uh, in addition to that point eight full-time employee uh, superintendent of town buildings could serve as a, uh, a deputy facility supervisor for the school department. But again, as the school department goes through its budget calculation, that remains to be seen. If that did not materialize, I would recommend that we proceed with a .8 FTE um, superintendent. Um, the addition of a financial analyst position in the finance division to serve as a point person on procurement and internal audit functions. Um, the board uh, recommended, uh, supported the uh, funding of uh, consulting funds that are in the finance division's budget for this fiscal year. There has been some work that's been ongoing um, with regard to audit, I believe, and I looked at list to confirm if there's anything I've missed. Yeah, there's a variety of there's auditing of benefits um, and doing some reconciliation. So, so we, we have uh, an investment that's in the fiscal year 2015 budget. Um, proposal would be to add to that and create a 1.0 full-time employee to be uh, located here in the town hall to address, again, procurement and internal audit functions. Uh, right now, there is no centralized procurement function occurring. Uh, there's a check and balance in terms of the accounting that happens in the finance division. I review requisitions with regard to compliance uh, for the procurement uh, law and at the time of uh, execution of a contract. Um, but this, I think, would get us more in the direction of centralizing it uh, and, and maintaining a single point of contact to ensure that uh, we're following the protocol not just in the reactive way when the crisis sees come up, but in a proactive way, planning into the upcoming fiscal year and bidding things out for fiscal year uh, wherever possible. Um, and finally, the restructuring of information technology to include graphic information system functions. Um, they were previously, as everyone is aware, with the Community Planning Commission. They were transferred to uh, engineering at DPW, and I, I propose that uh, we uh, include this within information technology uh, to perform the work in-house uh, as it really is a, a tool that we rely on heavily for, um, for planning purposes, um, in some cases for response purposes in, uh, in the town hall. So the budget document is an evolving um, document. Um, there's a series of changes that I've identified since the recommendations were forwarded that I felt it appropriate to note here. Uh, there'll be a budget amendment that'll be forthcoming at a later point in terms of the recommendation. Um, certainly all of it is up to the, you know, the group to determine what the Selectmen and Finance Committee want to make for recommendations. But from my standpoint, in terms of what I recommend for discussion purposes, there will be a couple of changes. Uh, the consolidation of the oversight of vehicle maintenance to the DPW um, recommendation would be to uh, delay until at least the October town meeting, and I'll, uh, I'll go more into that in the next slide. Um, secondly, uh, stormwater, uh, the proposed budget uh, inadvertently excluded a supply budget of $15,597, which we'll need to adjust um, to include that. It just didn't get put into the budget document. Is that a fair way to describe it? It was requested by the department, just wasn't put on the, yeah, exactly, yeah, that's the best way to describe it. And then the regional housing office, which was a special article funded at the June 2014 town meeting, or previous, 2013. Oh yeah, that's right, because previous fiscal year. So uh, there would be, a, uh, there's a, a need if, if we determine that we want to proceed with regard to that project into fiscal year 2016 for an additional $2,650 in the CPC budget. Again, that is something that I'll be uh, recommending uh, during discussion of that budget at a later point in time. So just a note about the mechanics budgets. Uh, recommendation that was put forth um, to single to go to a single operation and table of organization um, 
generate a good departmental discussion about implementing town-wide fuel protocols, um, single maintenance system for all vehicles, and cross-training. This is discussion amongst the departments that utilize mechanic functions. Um, DPW, fire, and police will work towards these goals in fiscal year 2016 uh, or potentially sooner. Uh, but again, I'll be submitting a budget recommendation amendment uh, to approve, uh, to uh, transfer the salary back to fire. Um, and that's reflected in the fire department's presentation. Uh, noting that as we continue our work, this will be a potential item for discussion uh, and consideration at the October town meeting as opposed to July 1 of this coming year. Just a note about projections and assumptions, and I'll go real th through real quickly. The property tax levy at two and a half percent plus four hundred five thousand dollars, and these are all notes that uh, that these are all uh, comments reflecting the work of the financial planning team over the past six months. Um, projecting level funded state aid, but we'll know more about that on this coming Wednesday when the governor releases his budget and when we get feedback from our legislative delegation with regard to uh, <coughs> how the legislature receives the governor's proposed budget. There's a uh, $15,000 increase in local receipts that's factored in here and a decrease in our reliance on the debt service stabilization from, fund from $550,000 to $250,000. Generating total estimated revenue um, at the time of the release of the budget on February 13th of $60,628,937. In terms of expenses, just a couple of notes. It's, uh, this, this document is predicated on the transfer of $125,000 into our OPEB fund, an increase in health insurance, uh, which was estimated at 6%. Uh, we hope that we can make some gains on that uh, as we go through the renewal process and an increase in our regional school assessment of $19,234. So after applying these factors, um, taking out the fixed costs, you, know, you end up at a situation where the town portion, town operations administration is $13,940,514. And Liz, that does not include the transfer from sanitation, which is $60,000. So there's a transfer that is also proposed in addition to this of $60,000 from, from a sanitation uh, fund. And then as of the February 6, 2015 financial planning team meeting, the school department's available appropriated revenue for 2016 was $27,060,998. And I just offer that as a context to <coughs> where the recommendations tried to get us to. The recommended, recommended numbers in the budget document were intended to fit within the $13,940,000 plus the $60,000 from sanitation. So. Um, I'll just hit the high points. There's a series of goals that we attempted to incorporate uh, into the budget document. One thing that the chairman and I have spoken about is that uh, the board may wish to consider um, conducting its strategic planning exercise and meeting earlier so that we can put the information out to department heads prior to asking them to submit departmental requests in the fall. And um, I think that there are, I think we've done a good job, in my opinion, of hitting a number of things that were in the strategic uh, plan and, and uh, having a, a proposal to implement them. Um, but um, I think we, we could probably even do more if we were to make an adjustment, and I, I think that that's been well received by the, uh, the board members. Uh, but there, there's a series of things we have, um, the use of technology and expansion and, and, and implementation, trying to shore that up by uh, bringing some staffing into I, to IT. The plan for addressing the long-term unfunded liability a reflection of the board's discussions on this. It is funded at $125,000. Maintaining management and labor relations. Uh, human resources has been identified as its own program within the town administrator's budget as opposed to being integrated directly in the town administrator's budget. And working with the human resource administrator over the course of fiscal year 16, uh, it's my intention to continue to increase the department's presence. Um, there's also a proposed increase in the employee recognition line item, which was something that was identified as a priority for the board of selectmen during the strategic planning um, effort. Shared municipal school services. So I spoke already to the school facilities uh, area, uh, area. Another area that I would speak to is human resources. Uh, that's something that the superintendent and I continue to have discussions on. It's not proposed for implementation in fiscal year 2016, but it's something that could potentially be uh, considered in fiscal year 2017. Opportunities for sharing services. Again, I, I referenced animal control, um, and that's something that uh, uh, will continue to evolve. Um, the facility study, again, as I noted uh, earlier, uh, there's a, an emphasis put on the town buildings in the school, in, in the 
proposed in the recommended budget. Uh, notable requests that were unfunded, and you'll see this as we go through the departmental requests. First, $25,000 requested by CPC for technical assistance for economic development planning on Main Street slash Route 28. We have a pending uh, district, district local technical assistance grant application with the Regional Planning Council that would um, fund this. If that's not granted before we get to the budget, the recommendation would be to fund it through a Warren R. Um, at the June town meeting. Um, an additional $23,000 could potentially uh, incorporate um, public safety information technology oversight into the IT department's new .6 FTE position, the GIS position. Um, there's a potential, uh, Chief, I know you're in the room, there's a potential it could be offset by state grant funding, but that's unknown at this point in time. Right. Um, there's a request for an engineering cooperative student employee. DPW, which was not uh, able to be recommended to be funded and fit within the, the allow allocated portion, uh, $50,000 for merit salary and wage increases, and then the amendments that I mentioned earlier, which were the CPC, the stormwater uh, areas as well. Uh, just a note about salaries and wages, if you haven't already seen it, when you go through, you'll note that in many cases you'll see a budget show a 6% increase. That reflects the adjustments that occurred after the June 2014 town meeting and were therefore not included in the approved departmental budgets. Um, so the budget was approved in June, some of these changes took place at the end of June, and only now is it hitting the budget. It is funded, it's funded in the salary pool, if I'm not mistaken, Liz. Um, so it's not an issue of not having the money for it, it's just not accounted for in the departmental budgets and won't be until we go to the special town meeting portion of the June town meeting, which at which point I'm assuming we make all those transfers. <coughs> And uh, there's no allowance within departmental budgets for merit or cost of living adjustments. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But again, much of this I think will get discussed during the departmental budget review. Mr. Chair? Any questions? Yes. Mr. Yule. Yes. Um, on the $60,000 that's, I think, coming from the DPW? Yes. Okay. Uh, how does that impact the 6634? Does that 60,000 just go to um, uh, the town portion of the budget, or does it get split 6634 as well? I do further find it short. The $60,000 is a direct offset to the sanitation budget. It's coming from the sanit sanitation stabilization fund, so it can only be used for sanitation. So it does not go into the 6634. It goes directly to offset the sanitation budget. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Michael? I'm good. Oh, you're waving. <laughs> I'm just waving, John. <laughs> just to point out that he's late and you know, just want to try and embarrass him. Okay. Uh, no further questions from the board. FinCom, anybody? Okay. I, I appreciate the time. Thank well, you very oh, much. Well, you know, actually, oh. just one thing. Does everybody know what that CPC, that $25,000 grant, I just want to make sure everybody understands what that is. Does everybody, I don't know if we, we, we talked about it a long time ago, but that's the, uh, the Mass, Massachusetts Downtown Initiative. We're trying to get that grant from them that helps will help us fund a program to maybe revitalize some of the properties <coughs> along Route 28, so. Right, the, yeah. there's been obviously the work of the CPC uh, and the uh, board's liaison to the CPC talking with property owners. This would be technical assistance fun uh, funding to look at the Main Street corridor and potentially focus on an area where the, right. we may see the most opportunity. Um, we continue to have a presence at the MAPC meetings. I attended the advisory meeting, the council meeting on Wednesday, and uh, we'll continue to ask for their consideration. There is an April grant round coming up for right. DLTA. We're optimistic that we may be considered at that point in time, but um, we won't know for sure until then. Yeah. But other cities and towns that have been granted that money, have gone, it's gone a long way. So mm -hmm. keeping my fingers crossed that we get that same opportunity. And again, if it doesn't materialize, then I, I believe that we can. I think it's worth us to still it. consider it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, first off, great job on, on start, you know, showing this off. So some of the stuff that you're showing us here, I'm assuming we're going to have discussions about during the budget process. Because yeah, I, there's some stuff that I have some questions on. I think I agree with a lot of what you've mm -hmm. recommended here, but I just want to see how it's going to be implemented and sure. how it's going to be. There, there, I think that the appropriate time would be to discuss in the departmental review. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Michael? 
Okay, and before we start, then I, uh, I look, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the FinCom for their attendance here this morning. And uh, also uh, thank NORCAM for uh, participating in getting our uh, meeting uh, broadcasted. Just a couple of notes of thanks. Uh, again, Liz, thank you for all your work meeting with department heads. Thank you to all the department heads for their efforts on the budget, for meeting with us and reviewing the budgets. Again, thank you to both boards for providing, uh, providing us the opportunity to make this presentation. Um, and to Karen, who uh, uh, I'm sure is at home for her work to support today's uh, hearing and uh, the upcoming budget hearings. So, thank you. And I think we'll go on to DBW, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Time you're ready. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the men and women of the Department of Public Works, uh, we'd like to say thank you to the Board of Selectmen, Finance Committee, Finance Director, TA, and the residents for providing us the resources to accomplish what we do. Um, we try to level, provide a high level of service, uh, comparable or better than communities adjacent to us, and we appreciate the support. The agenda. Uh, mission organization and staffing, minor changes there, proposed changes. I'll expand on what the town administrator started with. Uh, I have a discussion about overtime, both proposed and uh, there's questions on existing fiscal year and the budget request itself. This is our mission. It's a lengthy mission, but we did this as a team and the employees want to let everybody know this is all the things we do. With emphasis on the last sentence. That's our organizational structure. Uh, the only change you'll see is under public buildings, what used to be a 1.0 equivalent for John Walsh's position is now a 0.8 equivalent as the town administrator. And we'll go into more detail about that. And a uh, rather than labor, I think a building maintenance craftsman is probably the term I would use for the position that will be used uh, to help maintain the buildings. As you know, we had John Welch who's basic oversight for contracted services. We had contracted janitorial. We really didn't have a go-to person to do many of these things, minor repairs that we contract out. So the intent is it's more timely and more cost effective in the long term. Other than that, the organizational structure has not changed. Uh, a big change you'll see in, we completed a, uh, a study for a, what's called a stormwater utility. Stormwater utility is a uh, fee-based system to charge off, to charge customers on a fair portion basis for the cost to run the stormwater system. As I have spoken in many years past, we are still looking at a revised EPA MS for uh, municipal sanitary sewer system 
permit, which will greatly expand what we have to do. Uh, one method communities have used is this as a funding source for that. ERU is equivalent resident unit. What our consultants did is looked at all the properties in town at a very high level and tried to figure out the average impermeableness or amount of land that the uh, water cannot, cannot seek in, uh, sink into. And that's the rationale for distributing the cost. If you have a business that has a huge amount of land that all runs off, or if you have a property that has a lot of asphalt, um, it runs into the storm system and, and it's a cost associated with that. Um, right now that ERU is taking every home in North Reading and just dividing it equally. Um, and that's a debate when, if we ever get to the next phase, the debate is usually um, a property that's a quarter acre versus a two acre property, should they get the same bill? So that's kind of a political discussion. It's been handled many ways. The most uh, local place, Reading has one of these and they've gone through these discussions. For example, like a building like Walmart has a huge amount of improvable there would be multiples of that ERU. Uh, to that end, yes, sir. You just said every resident, is, did you include commercial properties as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, residential was the same. Commercial treated differently, but they tried to do a ratio. Uh, the study covered commercial at a high level. And again, the ERU will be a portion based on the relative square footage. And I think if there's, say, it's, if, say, 5,000 <coughs> square feet of paved area on a property obviously a Walmart parking lot is way more than that right so so why would you hand, how do you handle it differently to me it seems like wouldn't that be more the priority is to focus on the commercial side and evaluate it on the commercial basis before the residential basis it's actually equal because residential properties also generate stormwater that comes off that has to be handled and part of the new permit requirements are we have to go and sample the outfalls and we have unfortunately uh, over 400 outfalls in town to sample, and they're equally distributed, residential and commercial. So that the cost we're talking about is going to be equally all over town, not just the commercial area. Thank you. However, you, you are correct. Uh, commercial properties generally gener uh, generate more stormwater and of a dirtier quality. So right. sometimes that is a more of an issue to treat and make meet the regulations. So yes, there's probably a higher cost for us to treat that stormwater. Yeah. So. That's and that's why, why I, I mentioned the ERU is um, not a one for one. A commercial, their waste, their stormwater will be dirtier, so the, there would be a factor in it to adjust for that. And, it, and this is just a very high level okay. study, just to get a broad idea. Thank you. Part of that study, they recommended that um, allocation of our costs that actually are directly related to stormwater. That is the town engineer, myself, DPW administration, and Road and Street. So, um, Previously, we started off with a stormwater budget with a placeholder $1, and then we added in a little bit of town engineers, myself, and the administrator's budget. Uh, salaries transferred one for one. This year, we upped it to 25%, so I've been doing this incrementally. So 25% of my salary comes from DPW administration, stormwater, and then 50% is in water. Same for the town engineer and DPW administrator. So we are, our costs are allocated that way. Uh, road and street. But this year, for the first time, we took 75% of their regular salaries and expenses to transfer it over to stormwater. No additional money, except for one issue I'll bring up, the last bullet. So that you're going to see decreases in a lot of budgets and increases in the stormwater, but it's a one-for-one. One. There's no increase in total dollars. The one increase you'll see in the stormwater is, uh, as we're doing through our pavement management program, we are trying to evaluate, fix utilities before we pave. So. Um, we have been taking monies for this out of town road <coughs> for now. So the intent is to take our drain system, which is roughly 252,000 linear feet, divided by 20, try to do 5% per year is a proposal. That's roughly that amount of feet of pipe. And the cost represents, you'll see the cost, and it's represented, typically you're going to see about 75% is light cleaning and heavy cleaning. Light cleaning is. Uh, you run the truck through really fast, and heavy cleaning is like we found on Haverhill Street, for example. It was clogged, so it's longer. So we did an approximation of the cost and the uh, amount of work we believe. Mr. Chair. Mr. Foti. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, applaud you for doing this this part here, especially uh, as far as the cleaning and separating it from where you would, you know. 
in the past, I assume you were using Chapter 90 money and Town Road. Yeah, Town Road money, and you know that naturally takes away from what you're accomplishing as far as road improvement work. Um, this should be separate. You know, it's it's a it's a different animal altogether, but um, it has to be done. And and knowing that you didn't have a, a budget item for it in the past, you know, you did what you had to do. So I highly support this, and, and congratulate you for doing it. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? And that's a highlight of the small water budget. That picture is the culvert at uh, Skype Pond. We put a pipe within a pipe. And if anybody, you get the Construction Outlook magazine. It's on the front page. So this is a very rare project in New England to put a pipe within a pipe. The cost of that was roughly $146,000 funded through FY15 capital. So again, the salaries increased in stormwater to reflect that 25% transfer. It's not all 25 at once, but it, now it is 25% of the uh, town engineer and administration, and 25% this year went from road and streets to stormwater. And again, I've spoken to the expense part. And as uh, the TA, <coughs> as part of the transfer, um, 15,000 was left out, so that's part of that issue they may come up down the road. For uh, I transferred 15% of the cost from highway over here to actually fund some of the repairs for the drain system. The next large item. Excuse me, just one more question on the stormwater for you. Yes, sir. So we had that study that was completed, I, I want to say last year, everything that was pretty much running into our drains. Yeah, that's what was two phase name? projects. So I'm asking funding for the second phase, but that first phase funded through capital has been very helpful. Now right. we have a great idea what the drain system is. Uh, a lot of communities don't have a drain map. Right. Never was done. So it's helping us develop accurate GPS located system. So I thought it was a great report. Um, but I, when I read through it, there were some things in there that caught my eye. And they discovered that there's some people that are having their gutters running off into the drain. They're having their um, laundry, um, right. wash machines running off into our drains. What is the plan for us to stop those types of things short term? Or is that something you're going to try to address long term? Because to me, if we were aware of it and we know, and I think we actually got to pinpoint it down to pretty much where this is coming from. And there's a, do we have a plan to rectify the problems? What, um, if I could expand, that's called the uh, IDD, Illicit Discharge Elimination Program. Part of the stormwater permit is to find things that shouldn't be going into a drain system. For example, in some communities, um, older systems have clay pipe for the water, let me see, the sewer and the drain. Sometimes a sewer service will go into the drain as opposed to the water by accident, sometimes not by accident. Um, in this community, uh, we found about 18 sites so far that have something that seems like it shouldn't be in there. A large amount of them appear to be, um, people would have a cesspool in the back for their gray water, for their washing machines to the drain system so we've identified some of those um, the plan is to address that with them the residents themselves it's, it's a regulatory kind of a mash my regulations say they can't put it in the drain the health department is in charge of septic systems and building inspectors so it's three departments have to get together and figure out an approach okay there are some of these we found that clearly look like failing septic systems so the how do we handle going to a resident and say you need the new thirty thousand dollars septic system? Yeah, I, so that, I don't know. that's that's a. Uh, so I'm asking that. Yeah, I've read that in there, and I I found that very concerning. Right. Uh, and how we're going to actually implement that? How we're going to police that? Right. It seems like a big part of it. Um. It is an issue, and uh, I'm trying to think of a way to fairly do it, so you're not hitting a resident with a huge bill. Um, there are. If you've, anybody's redone a septic system, there are DOR, you get a $1,500 tax credit per year for five years. At a prior home, I did that. And there's ways to help pay for it. So I, I think maybe a comprehensive plan is to figure out if you have to do this, here's a way to help you. Low interest loans or something to spread the cost down. But it, it would be a shock to some of the people once they get that notice. Mr. Chair? Mr. Yule. Yes. Uh, if I may follow, follow up on that, how, how do we know, we the residents, know that we are not in compliance or that we're um, uh, doing this, that we're? Uh, a classic example is you pop a manhole. You a manhole runs, as drains run downhill. You open a manhole, you see something that looks like it shouldn't be there. 
Uh, then you go to the upstream manhole and you find something that okay. it's clean. So then you put a TV camera up and you can literally see the pipe coming into the drain. You can pretty easily pin oh, it. Oh, okay, the okay. Maybe I misunderstood. So, so someone's actually extending their septic system into our pipes? Is that what I'm Some are fairly se septic systems that just happen to percolate through Leach, the ground yeah. come in. There are some systems that are directly connected to the drain system that we've identified. Illegally? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Jeff, under the law, basically, uh, the outflows have to be clean. Right. And if there's a, an outflow that's not clean, then we have to go backwards to find the source right. or sources. Right. Okay. Oh. Thank but you. in that report, we've identified, six guys have identified there's some serious problem areas. Sure. And, and we have to, I think we, I think we have to enforce it, only because look at the significant investment we're making in storm water. And these are contributors to the reason why we have to have the suspense to begin with. I think we have to have a way to police it and get out there and get the notifications out to these people that are violating uh, the stormwater requirements. I think we need that sooner than later. Because look at the investment this town has to make. This is taxpayer money. And I think we owe it to the taxpayers that we don't let these problems continue to go on. Because they're becoming very expensive. And to follow along with Bob, one of the, the, the second phase we're asking funding for is to find the outfalls of the drain system. What the EPA will require in the new permit is we go, I think it's 20% of the outfalls per year, sample them both in dry weather, where there shouldn't be any water coming out in wet weather, to see what's there. To, mm -hmm. And then from there, you would chase it upstream right. and identify the source. So uh, that's a lot of time and a lot of money. Yeah. So the more we can find these things and identify them, unfortunately, it's going to come through property A, take care of it versus mm -hmm. the taxpayer building some treatment system at the end of the pipe. Well, I think the company you used did a great job. If you read that report, it's very detailed. I thought they did an excellent job. Yeah. And we found as part of the study things I didn't realize, like properties like Walmart. Walmart doesn't have any stormwater systems. Anything in their parking lot runs directly into the river. Right. Which I was shocked. I was surprised that they must have been built before that was a, a town requirement. So we found a lot of things that were kind of interesting that uh, surprised us. Uh, Excuse me, Dick, do, have a, do we have gas oil separators? I'm not positive. They may have hoods, Joe, but I'm not positive. Okay. Well, I was just surprised they didn't have, like, just a retention pond. Right. Which, you know they have land to do it. It's not, it, that was surprising to me. So, as part of that study, also as part of the, the same consultants did a report. They looked at all the places we put, collect groundwater and put it back into the ground. Uh, the significance of that is as we look for our MWRI water source and sending sewage out of the basin, to take credit for that, which has been successfully done, take credit for the water we put back in the ground, for example, through Janet Nicosia's group, um, Market Fund Association, we've got numerous grants to put in um, impermeable pavement like Travelway, Clark Park, Martin's Pond, it's, it filters the water and it goes back in the ground. So when you add all those projects up, even the infiltration for the new school, uh, we have positive evidence that we are taking the water and putting it back in the ground and not thinking of just exporting it out of the basin. Right. So it actually, it was actually a very well thought out thing. I think some community used it to, uh, I think it was Town of Sharon. They took that and used it to work with the DEP to say, look, we want to take more water out of our drinking wells and this is what we're putting back in. And they bought the argument. So. Very good. Town buildings is the second significant change. Uh, it's probably public now. John Welch is retiring after 17 years. Uh, the town administrator um, and I have been discussing options. Uh, again, we had one person whose job description is more coordinating contractors. No worker be for lack of a better phrase, somebody actually physically go do things as opposed to calling a consultant or a contractor in to fix a toilet seat or a light bulb or, or some minor construction thing. So. The staffing in the budget represents that 0.8 FTE. Um, that could be something combined with the schools. It could be an offset. Perhaps there's somebody, a stay-at-home mom or dad, that has the professional skills to do this, or maybe find a retiree. Or um, I could see multiple ways to fill that with a qualified person. And if we can coordinate with the schools, some people have done it, worked out well. Some people have done it, didn't work out well. So. Um, that's something that we have to work on. And the second thing is that building maintenance craftsman. That'll be the person that could do all those minor things that we currently either can't get to in a timely manner. And uh, frankly, we have customers, you know, occupants of buildings are not happy because we don't provide them timely services. 
and this would provide us ability to do that and catch up on little little backlog of projects like library and police station have all these little places need a little touch of painting everywhere you know, just little tiny things that would improve it the view or a minor project paint a room or something that's true yes sir so mr. Foley so dick with the thought behind that would be that um, that John Welch's salary would be split <coughs> between those two positions? Uh, no, I think we budgeted 48 for the 0.8 That's position correct. and it's 46. A salary. Oh. We should reduce the salary to $60,000 and then the 0.8 is 48000 12000 at the 0.10. Mr. Chairman, would there be uh, uh, some sort of a corresponding decrease in, in contracted services or are we just expecting to catch up on projects that <laughs> that are being neglected. Actually, I requested an increase in contracts because we have quite a backlog. I mean, long term, it will lead to decreasing that. We have a significant amount of work that needs to be done it. every town building. So, Mr. Chairman, to speak to that, so the DBW director did request uh, an increase, and I think that's reflected in his departmental request. Uh, the finance director and I reviewed uh, the, some of the expenditures over the past few years tried to identify a number that we thought was a consistent need to reflect the, the cost of maintaining the buildings at the level that they were being maintained previously. I do think that there's an opportunity for savings here, but uh, I'm uncomfortable making a recommendation, taking a credit for those savings at least at this moment in time until we get the, the, uh, the system up and running. Michael? I think this is a whole strategy. It, definitely needs to be continually vetted as we go through this budgeting process. I would love to see us complete the vetting of the discussions with the schools about maybe trying to consolidate this to see if that's even a viable option. Mm -hmm. And if not, it maybe there's an additional strategy that we haven't looked at. Maybe hiring two full-time people that do building maintenance and putting the responsibility for doing the contracts and everything, leave it with the department um, DPW director. Um, Look at those costs. We hiring two people at forty-five thousand dollars and have them um, fall under Dick and having them running around and completing these projects that you that have been sort of on the waiting list. Maybe that's another option. I don't know how the costs work out when you look at the retirements and the health insurances and all that stuff. But I just think we have to come up with a better way than we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. And with uh, Mr. Walsh leaving, I think we have a target of opportunity here to really make vet out a couple ideas and try to get it into this FY16 budget. I mean, things as simple as uh, a month ago, I think a toilet seat broke at the fire department, uh, police department. We had to have in uh, one of the little toilets, uh, murals didn't work. Simple fix, we had contracted out, just we didn't have people to do it. So those are the simple kind of things that that cost $500. Simple little thing that somebody in house could do that. But I think if you reduce those contractor services and invest it in a staff member that's here at our services 24 7 or whenever you need them you know six or seven hours a day I think it's gonna be better money spent than trying to contract right, out I all think the time that's what he right. was referring to because it cost the contract the contract that cost five hundred dollars yeah but we still want to have a facilities manager and I'm not sure I buy into that concept I think mr. Cannavale is a very capable person and if we're talking about maintenance contracts and stuff I, I can see why can't that fall under the department the director and give him two FTEs that do building maintenance I think will still save us money and try to reduce that contract I mean the number that was in here for the contractor staff I, I didn't quite understand it so maybe we'll get into that later but when you look at that number and if we can make a reduction and transfer that over to uh, an FTE for building maintenance or we throw all that money and provide it to the schools and allow them to do all our buildings maybe there'll be a savings I don't know at this point, I think we should be really focusing on more getting the jobs completed with quality so these old buildings can continue to get more life out of them should be the priority. Because we're not going to replace any of these buildings anytime soon. Go on. Okay. Uh, under town buildings, we're implementing a digital work request system. Uh, the town currently has a help system for computer issues. I uh, met with Brian and Gene, and uh, they're coming up with a work order system. Your light's out, you need this, you need that. They can put a work order in, it's gonna come to DPW administration. We will process it, we will log it in, we will probably use something like Outlook, very simple too, scheduled to be done. 
So create a system to track, keep track of everything, keep track of the cost. Our current system now is people call John Welch on his cell phone 24 seven. So he's currently being moved around the town in not an efficient manner. So by cleaning that up, the person that uh, facility manager and sometimes the building maintenance person, I thought is they can more efficiently do it. If they know it's something, wait till tomorrow, maybe go to tomorrow and accomplish five or six things at the police station, as opposed to going out for one thing and all that travel time. Dick, uh, my company, we use a, a ticket system that you know, is, is for IT, but Pleasure. Pleasure. it could be used for anything. And I'm wondering if the current system, not sure exactly the uh, system that IT is using, but uh, I'm wondering if you could just use the, the same system. And, because what we do is when we make a ticket, it's pointed to a particular group or a person. So it would seem to me that this. We decided to, um, and the suggestion IT made sense, rather than having I mean, a whole separate system for this, they have an existing system that's free, the software Spiceworks yeah. for IT. So. So they don't have to double their workload to use the same thing in a different fashion made a lot of sense. And the resident will put in the work order, the customer, it's going to come to us. We're going to classify it by building, by type of work, and by priority. Right. So we think it's going to work. We've done some uh, beta testing, and uh, we're kind of comfortable it will do the job. Okay. And I've, and French, I've, I've, over my years, bought expensive maintenance software. Um, Sometimes a high paid software, like I once invested in something called Hanson, it's a work order system. It was just too cumbersome to do the job. So sometimes simpler is better. Spiceworks is free. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost okay. us anything. And we have experience in running the system, keeping it up. Uh, next bullet, custodial. Custodial had not been bid out for quite a while. So in conjunction with all the departments occupying the buildings, we revised the scope of work um, and tried to make and we used what our customers wanted and looked at other examples of the communities. Try to make it specific enough to get customers what they want. For example, the current contract does not have specifics about when things should be done. So we try to set it up on a do it monthly, weekly, daily, quarterly. Um, and to, we also put in language the specific standards, what we expect. Now, my interpretation and claim might be different from the contractor. So some language we found out the contracts and it's been vetted by the using departments uh, gives a lot more teeth and that's ready to bid once we vet our process that's ready to put on the streets. The telephone function. So, can I go back to that one second? Yes, sir. Sure, please. So you have one company that takes care of all city buildings clean? Tom Blank, yes. And they clean them daily? Um, I believe it's daily and six days a week. Seven days a week. So we went through all, every building. Not the fire department, though. M Mr. Carnival, we do not maintain that guy. That company does not maintain the fire department, though. Correct. 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 So every every city, uh, every town building except for fire department is cleaned by the same company. Yes, sir. Do we do we know what we're spending on on that contract annually? Ninety-five thousand. Ninety-five. Sorry. Ninety-five thousand. Ninety-five. Thousand, I Thank you. Mr. Chairman, to the discussion that took place earlier, <coughs> this effort to re, uh, to reevaluate the scope of services and to proceed with bidding out the janitorial custodial work began in November. And uh, with the, going through the budget process with the advent of the upcoming transition uh, for Mr. Welsh, um, we, we've not yet put it out to bid because of the, this very discussion. The fact that it may, may, there's a chance that it may make more sense to bring an additional staff person in, it might be a cost savings for us to do it that way. Um, it's still something that's under, uh, under consideration as we go forward with our discussions with the schools. Um, but right now, in the budget recommendation, it's recommended that it would be contracted for next year. Thank you. Dick? Next bullet is the telephone function for some reason the budget for the phone system was in DPW, but the actual management was in IT. So in conjunction with Liz, that's being transferred 100% over to IT. So you'll see a decrease in that line item in the budget. And the uh, funding for repairs and maintenance, I believe we went from budget budgeting 77,000 annually to 108, I think is the number, for contracted repairs. So those are the major changes in that budget. We 
actually decreased heating. The heating cost of uh, that trends downward in this and across the town building. The other charges on the bottom, that's uh, surprisingly there's a lot of state certifications, um, elevators, any kind of pressurized tank. There's a lot of inspections that, to be honest, I didn't realize and uh, it cost a lot to get, pay for an inspector to come out from the state and to pay for uh, the permit itself. So that's, that's what other charges for the most part are. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yule. Yes. Uh, if I may go back to the heating, you said the heating has been reduced, or costs have been reduced? Yes, sir. Is, is that because of the cost of the heating? Uh, are we using the same unit amounts? Uh, or did we take some measures to... I just looked at the budget trends. I'm sorry? The budget trends seem to go down. Uh, the dollar amounts seem to go down. Well, I, I think what Jeff is referring to is the co uh, cost of uh, Fuel. energy. Fuel. Is, may have come down. Is that what's driving it, or is it due to efficiencies? I'm not involved in the heating contract. Usually, Joe Tassone started it, so I'm not sure who manages that now. The, I'm the, sorry, can you repeat the that? bid for heating? I actually um, am in the process of redoing that. Redoing. Yes, in, in conjunction with the, the school department and um, the energy company, which was formerly Hess, um, and now it has a new name. Direct energy. Direct energy. Direct energy. Mm -hmm. okay. Remember, the, the rates are actually very favorable right now. So it would be driven by rates then, the, the, the lower cost, more than uh, initiatives that we've taken? Well, it may, we may even be able to reduce it further depending upon the rates that we lock in at. So we're in the process yes. of going through that right now. So, so let's talk about energy from the, the point of view. We have electricity. <coughs> cost of electricity is generally trended up. We have a gas, gas uh, was trending down but seems to have leveled off recently, if not going up a little bit. And then we have our fuel, you know, gasoline, diesel fuel, which clearly is, is down but is now on an up, upper trend. So when we talk about uh, heating of buildings, we're talking about natural gas and maybe electricity in some places. So it's the gas contract that we're talking about has gone down. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because of efficiencies. I think it's a combination. Uh, a little both. Uh, right. A little both. So, so currently we don't have a contract with Direct Energy um, that expired. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're in the process of locking in rates for the next three years okay. with Direct Energy. Mm -hmm. there was, there's two different components. We would still pay um, a gas bill, right, Dick? And then we pay a Direct Energy bill um, so we, I'm sure further in the budget process, we'll be able to report back at what rates we've locked in at for that. Okay, but when I think of efficiency, mm -hmm. right, I think of new windows in some of the buildings, better insulation, uh, con controls, heating controls that can manage the heat, so when I'm heating the building in the middle of the night, well, to the level that we need during the day, things like that. So, uh, but I can't think of anything that was spent in that area. Nothing of significance, just a little incremental it drops. And as Liz mentioned, uh, it's a two-part. We buy the energy, they use National Grid's pipeline, so there's a wheeling charge and an energy charge, and when you bulk buy, you get a fairly good rate. And that reflects some of that. Yeah, well, I, I can understand that. that that's a, a reduction in cost as a result of the cost of energy. But it was also mentioned that we become more efficient, and I'm trying to understand that because I don't recall us making any investments. Lights, lights. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. the energy conservation. Is that right? The the energy uh, c committee uh, got new light. Had new lights in. But that that's probably the only thing they can think of. No, they they did a lot of boiler work to improve boilers and the efficiency of boilers. Okay. The, at the we US have some schools. older boilers and there's uh, circulating pumps and uh, I think schools did, I think we did one uh, what they call a, a variable s variable speed drive pump. So rather than just turning 100%, yeah, it goes up and down. All right. okay, so sometimes that, that is more efficient okay. in the usage. All right. um, just one more thing on the town buildings. Down. So in the budget, in your FY 2015 budget for buildings, town buildings, you had the $71,000 um, budget and 
I didn't notice a slide in there that sort of talks about what we've done with that seventy-one thousand dollars. The John Walter salary. I don't town buildings. I don't. That, is that John Walter's salaries in that? The repairs and maintenance. I believe yeah. you mean selectman. That seventy-seven thousand dollars. Um, it's actually seventy-one three sixteen. And so we've already expended thirty-six thousand five sixty-one. So I was just thought we could address that while we're on the town buildings. Sure. That that line is under non-union wages, is what you're referring to. Yep. That is strictly John Welsh's salary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else, Michael? Just uh, an additional point of clarification, and certainly not to belabor the point, but uh, based on the work that the public works director did with the department heads and the feedback that he got from some contractor com some contracted firms on the custodial services informally uh, he did call for an allowance to increase the custodial services line uh, to account for that again that'll be an additional thing that we'll look at to determine is it worth the increase is it worth trying to hire staff potentially hire two, two staff um, but in order to it appears in order to do the buildings um, to the level that I think we all want them to be done in terms of the custodial work, there, there could be a potential increased cost if it were contracted out. And again, that's yep. at the, on the open market. Okay. But again, I didn't that that number didn't get referenced earlier. I just wanted to make sure that folks are aware. Yes, there is an increase, and there's a reason why. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Dick. <coughs> I have two slides on the DPW overtime projected, and we can discuss the uh, report you have. This is our projection for emergency and scheduled overtime out of the operating budget, as I've discussed before. Snow and ice does not come out of this, and then we also do in house construction, which gets charged for the capital project. So, this just represents our regular day to day work, not any special projects. And historically, looking at work orders, um, we worked out about 2,100 hours is the average amount of hours over time for those three categories. And for the rate, I just take the average rate for the DPW employees. So I multiply the rates. And uh, for the emergencies, most of it happens after hours, sometimes very few. It's on Saturday or Sunday or holiday, which is double time by the union contract. So I use that ratio to estimate the emergency amount. Scheduled, the uh, classic example is deaths. For some reason, we've had, ups, we've had up to five, six funerals a week lately. Um, typically, that goes through lunch, and sometimes on Saturday, it's overtime. Mr. Chairman. <coughs> so just for the edification, uh, Dick, to you, the <coughs> issue of scheduled maintenance, and I know that there's a, it's something that, that comes up for discussion regularly. So there's the cemetery work that you you guys do there's a drain work that you do there's a highway work that you do sweeping vehicle maintenance etc the cemetery is driven by the demand obviously some of that work though is really capital improvements that we're using in-house staff for is that correct and so the mechanism by which that gets funded is the overtime associated with it ends up being charged back to a capital appropriation so for example if it were a road appropriation um, or um, uh, the only thing I can immediately think of would be a road, but it could be a, a drain appropriation. Could you talk a little bit about that methodology and the, the and what wh why seen, we do that? Yeah, but what you've seen for through FY end of uh, this calendar year represents that uh, work has to be transferred. Looking at the weekly overtime sheets, the biggest cost I saw over the fall was <coughs> underground water work at uh, on Central Street before pavement. So most of that overtime would be transferred out of the person doing the work, which is water, highway, it could be whatever department it posts originally in there where they're assigned to, mm -hmm. and then we process and transfer it over to the appropriate project. Mr. Chairman, yes. so I, I'm no mean to dominate the conversation, uh -huh. but I, I just think that f as a basis for the public to understand, could you speak to why we do it that way, why we're relying on overtime staff, for overtime for staff to do the... Uh,
I've uh, put together a few examples of why we use sometimes our in-house people in overtime versus contractors. There's three or four different types of projects over the last three or four years. In 2013, the water department had a need to replace hydrants and valves at five locations. They went out and got quotes from contractors per location, and then Mark took our actual, we went up, used the DPW, our actual costs were that. That's just for labor and equipment. Materials, it's the same for each of them, so we put that in. There's one example of oftentimes we can do it cheaper. Sometimes you can't. Dick, uh, in that uh, 1484 number, is that a uh, during the day working hours or is that an overtime? Overtime. 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 It's, just, it's just our labor and the contract is labor and materials. I mean labor and uh, equipment. As you know, we don't charge ourselves our own equipment. So from a dollar standpoint, it shows like this. From a fully yeah. costed standpoint, Joe, of course it's Joe and then right, Joe, but yeah. but for 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 an apples to apples comparison, you should be you should be putting something in there for the, the if there's a cost to run that equipment, not only for for fuel and all that, but also for the the life expectancy of that piece of equipment also. I mean this you know, DOI gives you a breakdown of per each piece of equipment what what that cost is per hour. And I think that should be included in that 1484 so you can get a real apples to apples comparison from DPW average cost to contractor average cost. You know, if you're using if you're using a loader or a backhoe and a dump truck, DOI gives you a and, and actually we probably got it this week based on our you know our MEMA reports for for the snowstorms, it'll tell you, you know. Twelve dollars and eighty-five cents per hour for a dump truck, and then twenty-eight dollars per loader. That should, in an effort to make it a, yeah. a, a realistic comparison, that should be included in the fourteen eighty-four. That's one way to do it, apples to apples. But the equipment purchase is a sunk cost, so we don't really have any expenses to pay for that. That's why I don't put it in the operating cost. Usually for this, I do not allocate fuel out of these projects out of the fuel budget. So it's in the fuel budget. I oh, agree. It but hasn't been put there, but I, I, I agree. I agree, but if a, if a piece of equipment has a life expectancy of 200,000 hours, we're taking, we're, by using it for the, that number of hours when you're, when you're doing the high rent replacement, there is a cost associated with it. And let me just start out by saying I advocate wholeheartedly that if, if it's cost efficient for you to use people in house, I'd rather see our own employees do the work for several reasons, most, most notably the fact that. You know they work here for a number of hours a day, and and they should be entitled to get some some work after hours. I wholeheartedly support that, but I just want you know just for for realistic comparisons, and I'm sure the number is still going to be low. The contract is up. There's no doubt in my mind. We can do it. But bottom bottom line is that the our equipment <coughs> is not free. Good point, uh, Mr. Yule. Yeah, I, I didn't quite. I'm not sure if I heard your question, but was your question having to do with whether this was nighttime overtime or daytime overtime? Was that what your question was? No, I, I, I wondered if the numbers that he used was an overtime number or a regular non-overtime number. It had nothing to do with night and day. Okay. It had to do with overtime and not overtime. Is there a difference between our nighttime overtime and daytime overtime? No, just Sunday. It's just, just, no just, just Sunday right. is double time. Right. Okay. Michael, uh, yeah, Michael. Yeah, so for get back to the overtime. So what was in our budget is a little different than what you're projecting up here on the screen. So maybe I thought we could just step backwards a little bit. Right. What if you're showing is horribly overspent. And again, one of the pushes in the fall was to get all the underground utilities for concrete, uh, the section of uh, Central Street done. So I, I pulled the files and you're looking at 8,000 this week, 10,000 that week. That would get charged back to the uh, capital account for water system improvements. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to get a number. I, I'm just trying to kind of just get me started for what we budgeted for 2015, FY 2015, to what we're asking for in 16. And no, I, no increase. Level fund. And that's where I think I have a little bit of confusion. And only because what you provided us in our packets, it says overtime, 8.1%. I'm not sure what that means. Is that an increase? No, that's just the ratio of the total salaries so that department budget okay it's just an indicator of how much it is 
In, because some, some, some town departments, it's more, some are less. It's just a relative indicator. Yeah, the reason why I say that because the sheets that we're provided for overtime mm -hmm. has a budget number of fifty thousand one sixty nine, but the budget number that's being requested is eighty seven thousand zero three three um, three nine. So I'm obviously missing something. Fifty thousand just for street and highway. There's overtime for mechanics and for uh, cemetery. Yep, that all adds up to that number. And that's what this. The fifty thousand. What you provided me here is exactly that. It's just streets, highways, trees, vehicle maintenance. He's looking at the budget itself. That's everything except for water. Right, and that's what this is too. Everything but water, 50,000. No, is you go down to the next, there's another page in the summer. I, don't, I was only provided one page. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm confused. Yeah, like machinery maintenance is over time. It must be on the second page. Or is it? Printed on both sides. Ah, so that is. that and the fifty thousand add up to the eighty-seven. <laughs> okay, and then okay, that, that makes a lot more sense to me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, example two: We put some sidewalks in um, on Main Street, Cindy Francis Street, a couple of years ago. Um, our cost doing it. And again, that's not a loaded cost. It was thirty dollars, all cost, including police details. Um, contractor quote just for his work along with fifty six. So sometimes it's cheaper, sometimes it's not. Yeah. It's not uh, as part of a grant through the DEP and part of the work Janet Nicosia's group sponsored, uh, they got a quote from us to do the work and a quote from a contractor. Again, in that case, we were cheaper than the contractor. And recently in the fall, we did these two culverts on Haverhill Street. We did them, in, uh, I think, in the fall. So we got quotes from two contractors. That was their price for equipment, labor, materials. And our actual cost came up significantly cheaper. So relatively speaking, that's the breakout of that job. So yes, sometimes it is cheaper um, as part of an uh, initiative from the town administrator. And I, I didn't know we we're going to have somebody for procurement. Uh, but Liz helped me to put together standardized front ends. And now we're trying to get the technical specs. So we would have the ability to bid things out. We'd have some standardized contract documents. So for example, we need to do water work on Havel Street prior to pavement. We'll probably contract that out. But now we'll have a contract vehicle to do that to bid it up. Yes, sir. All right. Abby was before a month ago. Abby? Um, did, um, I had a question about. Um, well, Abby, hold off a second. He's in the process of. Dick, Abby has a question for you. Yes, Abby? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry to go back, but I have a question about your scheduled OT. Cemetery and Parks is eighteen thousand eight hundred. It's eight hundred dollars. We are calling off scheduled OT. Is that out of the units projection? What? It's your budget submission. Like sixteen overtime budget. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Why is that so huge? Is it, is that work on the expansion of the cemetery project? All right. We do a lot of errors after hours okay, so and weekends. Then my question would be, is this uh, cost of 18800 in OT for the cemetery passed on to customers if they have a burial on a weekend or in the evening, whatever? Yeah, I've presented um, to the selectmen, I think, twice. Uh, we look at our rates relative to the cost. Right. So our rates fully support the overtime our rates we charge to buy a plot yeah, exactly. and to do the internment. So we've done that analysis a couple times, and I think we increased it two years ago. Last year, I recommended keep it level funded. So yes, right. we, so do, we do do analysis to recover the money. The rate is, uh, you know, you can get buried at any time you want for this one price, right? We adopted a, uh, after our burial is the same rate, whether it's weekend or weekday. Weekday, obviously, have less labor charges versus overtime. Um, we thought that was fair to people, and even with that, we fully support our cost to provide those services. 
And the OT for vehicle maintenance, I take that's when there's an emergency break or something? Uh, some of it's uh, scheduled work we just can't get to during the day. Sometimes, for example, like snow and ice, we're preparing equipment before the season, so mm -hmm. the day-to-day -day stuff is fixing the day-to-day -day stuff, and then they um, might have a picture of one year we took a dump truck and took it all apart, sandblasted it, put it all back together. A project like that where it extends the life of the truck five years for three to four thousand dollars. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Just, uh, Mr. Chairman, just yeah. a final note on on that area. There were. I can think of two, there may have been three uh, instances where in the secondary school building construction project as well, the DPW stepped forward and offered that they might be able to conduct the work at a lesser uh, amount, um, either using staff or partially using staff and using a contractor that we have. And I know that that was uh, successful as well. So I just thought I would note that. The Sherman Road mm -hmm. and the sidewalks up there being one example, the guardrail along the driveway as well. I know you still have to go back to do the cleanup work there, but that was a, a savings from what the contractor had bid. We often do work for the school. Wayne will bid it out, and then they'll ask us for a quote. For example, we built that parking lot as you go into the bachelor school on the left-hand side. We built that two years ago, and it was our cost, all materials to build it was cheaper than, significantly cheaper than contracted prices. So we do work for other departments for the Hillview um, and the cemetery, I mean the uh, schools. Thank of course, you. Uh, Dick, the, the total charge of those kinds of projects to come out of their budgets, correct? Yes. Yeah. Oftentimes, they'll buy the materials directly and we'll just provide the labor <coughs> equipment to install. And those would also be done off hours? Um, for the most part, off hours, yes, sir. And the other thing is, is the response time uh, that the DPW can, can, can provide to address issues like the Sherman Road issue uh, before school started was uh, far more timely and uh, far more cost effective, so it mm -hmm. seems to work pretty well. We have a number of regional contracts for road type uh, services, and that the one doing Sherman Road, we could take advantage of that and the guy was available to knock it out in a timely manner. Sometimes in the bidding process between central register advertising, it's sometimes a six to eight week start to finish type thing. So it is not the most timely of things, but we are, again, standardizing our specification and putting it out in a timely manner. So that will not be an impediment going forward. Mr. Prisco. Thanks for showing me those, those numbers because it makes a hell of a lot more sense to me now. Just a question then, the way you're budgeting, and maybe we should make some adjustments only because under your current operation, you seem to be burning hours in areas you don't have any budget. So maybe this is the time we should discuss that and make a change. For example, I think you have some clerical overtime that you don't budget for and then, I am not sure what the snow and ice overtime that we're spending money on that's not budgeted. Yeah, um, first one so is, uh, one-time project and I'll explain. The second one is um, to make snow and ice more efficient, currently we have a dispatch down at the garage. Only a foreman sits there, does it? So that foreman has a truck with a plow. So the thought was, let's put an administrator there. Uh, that person can answer the phones, call radios, call the contractors, provide all those same services, yet we put one more truck on the road. So that was an uh, initiative to put more people on the road. For that one, obviously it cost overtime for that person to sit there. So that. If I that's something you're going to do in the future, maybe. Just, just for major storms, just big storms. So maybe we should just make an adjustment to the well, that, allocation. That goes, that goes to snow and ice. Well, Which we is, don't have anything budgeted for it. That's what, Oh, uh, this is going to get uh, transferred out of here? Correct. You're saying this not, this 20,000, this 25,000 will come out of this budget, out of your operating budget now and go to snow yeah, and ice? Yeah, any, any charge like that, if it doesn't, yes. yeah, the snow and ice all goes to one account and I forget okay. the budget for salaries. Before. Okay. When this morning we're up at 190,000 for overtime for snow and ice, so we're well over what we budget for. for yeah. Liz, if I may, um, the report you have in front of you shows um, the clerical overtime as well as the snow and ice overtime, which um, at this point there wasn't any because this is through December 31st. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the caught up quickly. if there you know if any of that clerical <laughs> overtime has anything to do with snow and ice, it would be transferred to snow and ice. Um, okay, you know for that's why I'm asking. Good. Right. Just so wait until you see February, February Michael. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then what a year it will be a little different. I'm confused then. If this is up until December 31st, Michael has a good point. The, the $4,378 in clerical overtime was before the snowstorms. Correct. There are, as I mentioned, just one-time projects we did, and I'll explain what those are. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Right. So if any of that was, I got you. you know, no, I know that. But even but now, you know, if I ran one to date now, um, the this these figures would be higher, and it would be transferred to snow and right. ice. Gotcha. So, you know, part of it, maybe some of it was because there is a little union overtime under snow and ice. There's not no non-union overtime under right. snow and ice. So That's why I asked. Part of that 43 might go to snow and ice. Yeah, I'm not questioning the spending. Mm -hmm. I'm just questioning the allocation. Yes. If we're gonna. I and mean, if we have an opportunity, you, you do something more efficiency, more efficient, Dick. Then maybe we should move the money around to make it easier for you to to go and manage the expenses. That's all I'm suggesting. Uh, for the one-time okay. projects, there were uh, three I have here. Um, as part of the water wastewater project at the EIR, they required information on septic system failures. Oh, you have a question? Oh. Uh, septic <coughs> system failures and drinking water wells. Those data, that data is maintained by the um, health department in one in a Word document, one in paper document. So we had to digitize about 15 years of septic information, septic data to put in a spreadsheet to give the consultants. That cost relative to spending, spending one of their people 50 bucks an hour to do it, I thought that was most cost effective. Because their budget was assuming we gave them digital data. So that was the first one. The second one was the, uh, wells again, the Health department keeps records on a uh, Word document for wells, whereas um, I had to put in an Excel spreadsheet and cross-reference the information from the water department and go line by line sometimes to figure out who's on a well, who's who has an irrigation well, was a big part of it for our EIR. We found some homes have irrigation wells, a well, and they're hooked up to town water. We found a couple, like eight or nine of them are all the same. And I am taking advantage of what you said about turning them off. So we got some good data out of that. So it was a one-time, need to do that for that project in lieu of hiring a consultant to do it. The third project there, I had them digitize um, about five years of our work orders. The intent was to get a snapshot of what we're doing and can we do anything better. And strangely enough, I found that our number one work order request is dig safe markups. So surprisingly, uh, so um, I'm looking to most of its water update the water layer, double check the water layer, get that accurate, maybe contract it out to the on targets of the world. Maybe somebody else can do it rather than us, more cheaper. So right now our water system has been updated for about 10 years since they originally did it. So to update the water layer and for just contract that out, freeze up those employees to do work for the town. So yes, it shows it's over, but there was an intent to it and I think it has value to the town. So, but <clears throat> very rarely we do that. I think that's the first time any significant overtime for administrative six years I've been here. So I don't anticipate repeating that. Okay. So. Uh, I mean, it's all justifiable. It's just, give, just saying if you think you're going to do more of that in the future, this is a target of opportunity for you to make the adjustments. That's fine. No, I appreciate it. But I think, I think we did. And again, in the water, you see a lot of costs, and those costs have not been transferred to projects, so the overtime you've seen is... Uh, it's my what little radar I have even more here. All right, now just the uh, regular budgets. And just one last question, and then let's go back to the last slide. Yes, sir. All right, so the 2200 that includes water, and the number we have here, the 2120, or are these two different numbers? I'm not. Just a little confused. I'm not into transfers and I'm just wrong. It's supposed to be the same number. It should be the same data that's in there, it should be on this. Okay. Side. Thank you. I apologize for the error. Any other questions? Just for clarification. Yes. This, uh, all these yeah. overtime representations include base plate plus the overtime premium. So if you looked at the overtime premium, it would be a subset of the third and a half of this time and a half. Right? When you see an overtime line that he's talking about, that includes the base plate plus the overtime or just the overtime premium? That's just the, that's the overtime Just the overtime. Just the overtime. Mm -hmm. It's the base rate with the overtime premium. Right. Which so would be the, the overtime, overtime rate. rate. Yes. The overtime rate. So oh, yeah, the incremental yeah. cost of using overtime is somewhere between a third and a half of doing it on regular time. Yeah. Of, of the numbers really. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else on that? Dick, break. Engineering, the only change we have here is uh, transferring the balance of the funds out of the town engineer's budget to be 25% stormwater. As the town administrator mentioned, I was asking for a co-op. We could use our 
we have a GPS system to go let him, rather than a consultant, gather that water data and update the water layer. So that, that was the intent of that co-op, to do a one-time update of that system such that we can, uh, I'm pretty sure I can much more inexpensively contract out big safe markets and we have a full-time person doing it. I don't, I don't, do you do that at all? We do it. Yeah. So, Tom Minister, Tom Minister, so are you recommending that or are you not recommending? So not recommending. Not, re I'm not recommending it due to the limitations of the budget at this time. Okay. Again, the salaries increase the part that's already been moved to stormwater to make it a full 25% of myself, my two administrators, and the GIS function that was originally CPC came over to Public Works is going to IT to manage. So that's only change in that budget. And that's Jackie and Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> and again, Roden Street, this represents a full 25% reduction in salaries and expenses going over to stormwater. So every DPW employee. I, I put 25% of the salary. Right. I, 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 <coughs> for, every, for everyone. Just the uh, road street guys. Okay. Not across the board. And just the expenses were just road and street as well. Right. Because they were kind of commingled. They had lines for drain equipment and drains, so it's kind of made sense to split it. Oh, it does. We haven't done it yet, but it's a good idea. Yeah. It's kind of hard. It's very hard number to target. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Yes. Don. The, the, the trans these decrease we're seeing in salaries, and I understand they're not an, an absolute decrease in the cost, but it's a transfer to, to stormwater. Is this reflective of where time is being spent now or where you anticipate it being spent in the next fiscal year? Are we actually it's, spending 25% of our time? We're probably time? doing actually a little bit more. But it's a, um, speak to the consultant, I was part of the stormwater utility study. They thought it was a reasonable number compared to other communities, how they did it. So we looked at some of our workload. Yeah. It, it actually was about that much, between 25 and 33%. So we think that's a reasonable approximation of the time spent on stormwater for the, the high, uh, Broden Street. So the work was being done before, just not being allocated. Right, it would all go on just for the street. Okay. We hadn't, and I just, I did it slow and incrementally, you know, just to, we, I think with Joe Tassone was here, we started with stormwater with a $1 budget, and then I transferred a little bit of salaries of myself and Mike's in there, and we added the administrator. So over the years, I've been tweaking this to get it to where I thought was representative. Can you think you're at it now at 25% or thereabouts? Um, Quarter of the time is being, being spent on that? Uh, roughly. I mean, we can adjust it up and down, but I think that's a reasonable approximation. And again, it's the same dollar amount. We're not increasing anything. It's just a one-for-one one transfer. So Dick. What? This, this is what's bothered me about this, is if, if we're spending now 25% of our total resource on stormwater, and we weren't doing anything in stormwater a few years ago, that meant 100% of our resources were spent in other DPW functions. It sort of leads me to believe that something isn't getting done. No, no, no. He, he's always budgeted 20% for stormwater in the past several years. <clears throat> under the work's always been done, but under Road and Street, yeah. I'm just taking the same work that's currently being done and just moving drainage work to a different. Yeah, no, budget. no. I understood that piece of it, but the you know, stormwater always had hasn't 20%. been around forever. No, but last year, even last year's budget. Well, last year's. Right. was 30% DPW, 50% water, and 20% stormwater is how you are allocated your funds. Right. So this is just increasing, you know, moving the money around. I understand that. I'm going back even further. Oh, okay. What Bob's trying to say I'm is saying there's, we a, doing there's this a trend right. here. Oh, yeah, 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 It absolutely. says that uh, we're putting more into one area, and therefore we're not increasing the budget by 5% this year or 20% last year. That's why it's creating uh, something a fee. else isn't getting done, or we're spending, or uh, we're doing more in overtime. Well, no, that's why we're creating a fee, right, Dick? I mean, that's why that, we're that would be, no, I understand that. Right. Yeah. That'd be potential for down the road for the it, fee. But for right now, the services, we haven't changed any of the services. It just was funded out of one pot, we're just splitting into two pots. So the same work's being done. It just it no, wasn't I, broken I, out Dick, as a separate I fully line. understand that piece of it. I was going back to before we put any effort into stormwater. 
issues on the highway. Right. We had a bigger percentage of the DPW budget either working on roads or doing something else. No, I think, Bob, if you recall, you know, I, I, when uh, Dave Hanlon was here, when the stormwater issue really was coming to the forefront and we were being forewarned that the mandates yeah. were coming, we started allocating more resources to the DPW to start addressing the issue. So it we actually so increased we actually the did budget back then? the budget back then yeah. in order to start addressing the issue appropriately. And now we're just shuffling the funds just to allocate them to where the resources are really being spent. So no, I, we, we did make uh, Some more economic then, yeah, commitments back, yeah. to stormwater management maybe 10 or 15 years ago, 12 right. years ago. Um, we started putting more effort, mm -hmm. meaning money to and resources towards stormwater management. Mr. Ford. Yeah, I think one of the things you have to realize is in Steve made a good point. This work was always being done. I said, at some, some, one point before the mandates were implemented by DEP and EPA, it wasn't initially called stormwater. And so it was coming on the highway, it was coming on highway work. And I think the other thing is the way um, Dick's setting up is at some point, just like water, it's probably going to be an enterprise when you start, when stormwater will probably be an enterprise. I understood that, that piece of it. Yeah, and, and the other thing is the, uh, you know, we started taking, we had a lot of deferred. Uh, what do you call it, maintenance or addressings of the issues, you know, just in the course of doing the business and the budget constraints. And then as these mandates were becoming uh, more uh, obvious, we started stepping up the projects, making the commitments to the infrastructure and uh, allocating the resources appropriately. And part of getting to that is um, <coughs> we've integrated last couple of years we've done looking our utilities underground before we pave which it, it makes a lot of sense so mark goes through his list of things and for example central street and haverhill street you want a 500 500 foot spacing for hydrants for fire uh, fire department we didn't have that so we put a lot of new hydrants in to meet that standard we have several we have to put on haverhill street as well so to bring up the public safety aspects and um, water valves tend to go bad so we've been changing up water valves and the line in my head for inspecting to kind of the season before inspect the drain system we're going to pave and figure out what's broken what isn't broken so we can better schedule fixing it rather than right now we're trying to money's appropriate to try to fix it in the summer for spring construction i mean a little bit more time between would be helpful anyone else snow and ice bubble funded Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well set. Don't need the National Guard. Good to go. Good job. It's been a horrendous winter, and I have to thank the residents. Um, I've never worked in a place where residents call and say thank you. They actually make us food. They bring us food. It's, uh, it's kind of nice. So I, I appreciate speaking to the residents if somebody's watching for some reason. Uh, thank you. First one you know about the rate increase, um, you know electric light is on I think a three-year basis putting LED street lights. They have a, a pilot program now and speaking of electric light, they anticipate about a $6,000 decrease in our electric bill next fiscal year based on what they're going to install. And probably the year after, they're probably this is like a partial year installation to be doing new lights the entire year, so probably a little higher. And the bottom one is um, for the new traffic light for the school, we estimated the cost to run it cost is less, so we're decreasing the uh, cost allocated to that, so that leads to that decrease. Selectively, as residents ask, just the process, if a lot of lights are out, I think in the budget crisis a while back, uh, we turned off every other light in town, and then I believe the public safety officer uh, would look at it from a, does this make sense, and we selectively turn lights back on. So there is a process for that for residents, if it's too dark, if you feel it's unsafe, there's a process to have it looked at by the police department, and they evaluate it and make a recommendation to the TA to turn it back on. Sure. What's it cost for uh, replace a regular light on an LED light? Any idea? We that's all electric light. We don't get involved with that. Um, so Joe's done it though. <laughs> Just the cost of the of the fixture itself is approximately um, depending on what they're buying. I mean, they were up in the six hundred dollar area. Right now, they're probably three hundred or less. So the light itself? Down then. Yeah. For okay. the light or the head? Or both? The, just the just the cobra head. Just the bulk. Okay. And then I don't know what they you know what they 
material, you know, with their time and labor. Yeah. Nice. Can I, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Dick, have they presented you with the? I know they did the pilot program, and now they're talking about moving forward with, with replacing the rest of. Have they provided you with a plan on, on, what they're going to do with? So, like you said, we have every other light that's we've shut off on our own. Right. Are they just going to replace the ones that are active and take down the ones that aren't on, or? How we is had that, that discussion. Um, so <laughs> I, I believe that the board's intention at the time we discussed it with our MLD was uh, to look to the extent possible to try to replace the lights with all of the lights with LED bulbs and to turn them on with the note that the police department will be asked to review and identify the areas where the light wouldn't be necessary. So rather than the presumption being identify areas where we should turn lights back on, we would identify turn all the lights back on except the ones we don't need. It's dangerous. Dangerous in the sense that once you turn them on, people aren't going to want you to, to shut them off again. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know if we look at just just doing what's already active, replace those, mm -hmm. and then if there's a need to go further. I mean, uh, we're going to have some savings naturally, so mm -hmm. it may be worth our while at this point to turn around and say, you know, if there's a if there's a 10 or 15 percent savings, do we turn back an additional 8 percent lights? Still realize the savings, but then still provide additional lighting where, where necessary. Mm -hmm. That's just a suggestion. So uh, we'll personally, uh, I would take any of the savings that we're making and apply it to turning more lights on. Correct. Right. I agree. And, and get us back to where we were a long time ago. Right. Well, but what, I think this one advantage, aren't the newer lights tend to have a, yes, bigger, a bigger footprint for light. That, so that's the thing. The, the other light, the poles are uh, spaced on what old lights are. I think sometimes you don't need it. Right. Right. That's, that's why, you know, there's okay. always been this philosophy that if there's a pole there, there should be a light on it. Right. And that's not necessarily the case, especially with the new LEDs, depending on what they use it for lumens, you may not need them as closely as you have, or you may, there may be blind spots also. So I just think if we look at kind of, and I don't know who that is, I don't know if it's the public safety officer or someone at, at DPW, but maybe look at putting the lights back with the ones that are currently active and then going from there and, and seeing where we need, where we might need more. So we can look at that with both DPW and police with an eye towards trying to match the savings by the number of lights we turn back on, and we're making recommendations accordingly. Thank you. Several years ago, <coughs> there was a big controversy at uh, Reading Light associated with the uh, issues of these certificates, uh, credit certificates yeah. they had that had value, and they decided they were going to let them go to waste. And at the time of that meeting, I had suggested that they apply uh, those credits to uh, uh, purchasing of lead lights or right. efficiencies, which meant that you know the, the the people there on the board at the time, you know, they weren't interested. They wanted to let them go away because they didn't want, you know, it was an energy saving kind of thing. It was good for the environment. And I'm saying, well, we here's an opportunity for us to get some money to make it good for the environment. And you know, to me. Uh, they'd achieve their goal another way. And uh, I don't know if they st they must still have some of these, or they may have some that are uh, available. I, I would well, see to me been a, that... There's been a change in membership down there, and that issue drove a lot of the change, I think. Right. So I'm wondering if, you know, what they're doing with those credits, and they uh, maybe we should, if they're not already, uh, suggesting that they apply those credits to purchase more and more uh, provide all the communities with uh, take that money and equally divide it to provide more LED lighting. Just who's our rep now? Just a point. I am. Mm -hmm. yeah.
So yeah. it's more for in-house, it's when we have time available. Okay. And we've done it both ways. We're probably gonna accumulate a list and we contracted out. We did that the last time and uh, a couple years ago. And this company with this huge chipper that chips and throws in the back of a tractor trailer, he did like 55 trees in like two days in town. So they're pretty fast. You get pretty good rates. We're not doing anything, again, I bring it up most every year, as far as uh, tree replacement. And again, it's never, we haven't had it in the budget for years and years and years. But uh, from a, uh, again, as we're taking some down, some die off, uh, we're not doing anything or enough, I don't believe, to uh, you know, beautification enhancement programs to uh, you know, see what the, change the, the view of our streets going down. You know, and it's, uh, you can see the communities that made the investment a few years ago and continue to maintain that, that type of a program. Uh, and I don't know if there's any uh, grant monies available, you know, for replacement trees, and, but I, I really would like to see us uh, look at that, you know, going Thank forward. You. It's funny, because I made, made a note, my, my notes for today's meeting about it, referencing that you had asked for that last year. You had actually asked last year to add money to beautify our planting year. and trees, <laughs> and uh, and I was curious. Just, just it keep would, it on the radar screen. Yeah, no, I, but I think it's really important. I do. We we do limited put back, but not to the extent you're talking about. We would never be uh, the way we do it now. One of those tree cities. I think I figured out the criteria for that. That uh, you want to lose. Yeah. How many trees you got to do a year? Uh, I don't know how many, but we're doing a lot. We're doing in excess of. 20. Steve said a lot of it's uh, Department of Conservation Recreation money. Uh, we have a small budget for maybe ten thousand dollars, but a lot of it's DCR uh, hmm. grants. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem with that is it's mostly urban environments. Yeah, urban as opposed to suburban. Right. right. But it, you know, I, I think uh, you know, as part of the part of our plan, you know, and with the in concert with the CPC, you know, we should have some sort of a uh, provision within the master plan to beautify, you know, and a coordinated effort, you know, our, our, our streets. And uh, I think it comes back, uh, the payback is pretty good as far as, you know, appearances and, you know, the, uh, the way that we present ourselves as a community and the pride we take in it. And uh, so I just mention it as a matter of habit, I guess, uh, and hope that we can do something going forward. Investigate. Well, we typically like a, uh, what was it, McIntyre? Those kind of mature trees, we had like, trains enough. Um, I don't know if it's a mass law thing or what, but sometimes if a car takes out a guardrail and we have a police report, we can get the insurance to pay for it. Trees, no. When a car takes out a tree, we tried it, the insurance companies rejected it. They refused to pay. And that's, we had that a couple of times, so we had to put some trees back in some areas, some mature 15-year-old trees. So. We got pushback from several insurance companies. Of course, you got to get trees. the pushback. I've, we've, we've been pretty successful with, with getting trees replaced. And mostly it's safety insurance. They won't, they're very. Really? Yeah. Well, I, I think part of it is, and when we do it, is and the pushback that we've gotten in the past is that we try to get the value of that tree. Naturally, a mature tree is worth more than a, than a new tree. Right. That's the only debate we've gotten back and forth whether a tree is worth $15,000 or, or $7,000. But we have got we've been very successful in getting reimbursements for trees. Again, it depends on you know the number. That's all. No, and I think the couple times that we didn't we could load the number up and the total cost to install the tree. Exactly. So we tried to just get the reasonable cost for the tree. And surprisingly, really? uh, wow. a lot of pushback. I was I, I didn't think. But sometimes I'll pay for a guardrail or hydrant, right. which is more money. I don't know why it was an issue. That's so we do we do try though. Just so that we try to stay on our yeah. our schedule uh, best we can. Well, the only one I have on this is that yeah. you and the town administrator are, are part about sixty-three thousand dollars in your budget. So I was thought maybe we could just chat about that real quick. <coughs> yeah, I mean the town administrator is recommending one hundred ninety-three thousand for personal services, and the DPW director is recommending one hundred thirty thousand for thirty-seven. So. That represents the cost for the fire mechanic. Sorry, the eat. fire mechanic salary. Is there a line up like sixty-three thousand in there? Yeah. That represents transferring the, the salary from Mark into DPW. 
That's correct. Okay. And as identified earlier, and it's, it's gonna, going back. It's going to be going back to fire. That's correct. Okay. So the staffing will remain at 2.0 FTE. That's we currently have, right? Two full-time employees in mechanics, and then one in public safety, under the table of organization of the fire department. Okay. So that's why the difference was there. Just wanted to you'll make see sure. A, you'll see a corresponding reduction in the fire department as well, which will be changed. Okay. <coughs> we'll show a cut. And as the uh, town administrator mentioned, we are looking into consolidating, and uh, we had some frank discussions. And uh, from what I've done this previously, other communities, and we need to all get on the same page. We have to have uh, an implementation plan we all can work with. So that's our goal: to put our heads together and get that going. Yeah, we, we've had this discussion over the years, uh, several times, you know, and it's gone back and forth. And uh, for the most part, again, I think the. Um, Philosophically, it may work on paper, but from a, a functional standpoint, uh, public safety uh, officials, you know, the two chiefs sitting over there, uh, certainly uh, have concerns as far as the timeliness of getting their, exactly. their vehicles addressed right. uh, immediately because those vehicles are out there 24 7. And, um, it always seems to have ended up that, you know, we, you know, with the current, you know, not that it has to stay this way, but. It, Probably in my tenure here, we've discussed it at least four times. Uh, tried it a couple, uh, and we, we moved the money around, but the individuals stayed physically where they are anyway, because that seems to work. What seems to work, yeah, and I until mean, and until we get uh, an expansion of uh, of the facilities, you know, to actually set up a, a decent uh, repair shop, you know, for our vehicles. Well, I mean, DBW, last DBW needs need some assistance in, yeah. as far as the, the facility you have there. Um, you know, working out of the basement in the, in the police and fire station, public safety facility uh, is difficult, but it, with the mechanic right there, things seem to be addressed very quickly and uh, get taken well, care of. The initial thoughts are not to physically move people. Obviously, that involves people, but um, my thoughts were the maintenance management aspect. Currently, we all three do it differently. So maybe there's a common way we could do it that serves everybody's needs. Um, so we're all doing the same preventive maintenance on the same schedule. Maybe this economy of scale, like we buy lubricating in bulk, Mark buys it in packages, which is much more expensive per gallon. Maybe there's some economies of scale. Mm -hmm. They don't physically move people around, but maybe there's some way to better do it. Uh, there, there was some other thoughts I had. Steve associated with uh, the fact that, you know, we have what I'd call uh, cars and pickup trucks and then we have these big vehicles right. and the equipment required for the big vehicles is very different than for the small vehicles, lifts and things like that. And my understanding is some of the fire truck work is done either on the fire truck main floor, they probably move the vehicles out, or they do it out in the backyard when it's warm enough to do it. You know? And it seems to me some of that maybe would be best done at the DPW garage where they have Equipment. One of the other issues to deal that, with the we, equipment. One of the other issues that we previously discussed was, um, you know, our current mechanic who's been with us a long time, uh, Mark, who does a terrific job for us. A lot of the tools, and equipment are his, uh, as opposed to the town's, and uh, you know, at some point, Mark's going to want to retire. I would think. Uh, I don't know if we did get our arms around the inventory as to what's ours, and we were also going to. Uh, get into if something needed to be replaced in the way of tools that the town would purchase them so that it is the town's you know, tools and maintenance of the uh, inventory of the equipment uh, as opposed to you know the individual making the, uh, the purchase and I don't know that we ever really well totally finished that up is the opposite uh, argument that most mechanics tend to want to have their own tools oh yeah no no they all have their yeah. own tools that's fine but so. I mean but there are certain Basic equipment and tools that uh, I mean, at one point, you know, I think we were using yeah, compressors, I'm about hand we were using compressors and things like that. But that was yeah. years ago, I and mean, I think that's been straightened out. But um, I think we still need to, uh, just from a timing standpoint, you know, make sure that we own the stuff. And I think the chief has for the for Mark. He has that identified that that equipment. I'm sorry, equipment for Mark's it equipment is an inventory. Right. Um, it's about one page long. Not really hand tools. It's more like larger tools, and computer software. But there is something, and uh, most mechanics that work that work in shops, they own their own hand tools, and then they, they take them. So we 
We have identified the tools that belong to the town, and the rest belong to Mark. And for the DPW, if you're probably familiar, they have those large, fancy boxes of all the tools. That's 100% owned by them. Through the contract, they get an allowance every year. And the only, uh, the common things like a lift or something like that, that's owned by the town, bought by the town. For the most part, their hand tools are 100% theirs, and they, we don't buy anything for them other than giving them the allowance. The only thing about the consolidation that, uh, in a prior job, we actually did it. We consolidated police, fire, and DPW, and the same concerns about level of service and uh, priorities and all that, and it, it worked out. So I've done it successfully in the past with a different, <laughs> different facility, a lot bigger, and at the time, the mechanic for the fire department was asking, so it was the same union, so there wasn't any labor issues. So I have done it in the past. We were a little different than, a lot different than we have here, so. I have done it, and I've met both public safety chiefs' um, requirements for turning things around. So just FYI. What else? Okay. Anything else, Dick? That's my car. Just went 100,000 miles last summer. Getting old. Nice day, huh? It's getting old. It's a good-looking car. Cemetery is no change except um, some newer employees that are getting up to the three or four-year mark. They're uh, Longevity and steps. Which I, just don't change. I just had a quick question on that budget. Um, last year, you spent in this other ex other charges and expenses. It was uh, almost ten thousand dollars, and then it seems like this year already in six months you spent another nine. So, can you just tell me what those are, and maybe we just need to do a budget allocation rather than every year. But that, re that represents. Um, we implemented a um, computerized cemetery system. Uh, you can find your own grave called Cemetery Find. As part of the process, we realized there's no, at Riverside Cemetery, there's no street sign. Joe says he's not in a hurry to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so we discovered that there's no street sign. So 5,000 of that is actually to buy street signs or to purchase ready to install at the cemetery. So it's a one-time cost. That we also develop a map that's on our website. And there's a map where you go into the cemetery by where the brick building is. But people couldn't find their graves. So that's, it's a one-time cost. Again, that uh, doesn't meet any capital criteria that I thought was a good investment. So you just reduce that money from somewhere else? Well, or you just overspend the budget? I, I'm not sure why we, you know. Well, a lot of my budgets, DPW is not a linear thing. Sometimes, like, there's no real cemetery grass repair in the winter. So it's, it's, it's not linear. So it shouldn't be 50% spent at 50% of the year. So in this not, case, I'm we not made saying a, that. You didn't, you didn't have this. It's this one line item every year. You seem to spend, spend about ten thousand dollars in there, but no, you never budget in that line item. So we're here doing the budget. I think we should make a change and reallocate the money so you have this ten thousand dollars to do these types of these other expenses. It just you know. Oh, so I don't know like, how you feel about so it. So, like, just for clarification, yeah. which line are you in? So that um, I under five fifty-seven thousand. Okay, thank you. Look page. Um, oh, 50, okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, under cemetery parks and grounds. Yeah. If you look at the spreadsheet. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. You spent 9,600 last year, you already spent 9,000 this year. And all I'm saying is, if it's a trend, well, let's, let's discuss it. It's 10,000 bucks, so it's not short money. Yeah. 5,000 is that one time expense. Right, but what's, you know, but, you know it's just zero, 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 zero. Some of it, right, put it here. It could be a misclassification for the budget. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm just asking because we did it last year and we're doing it again this year. And mm. you know, if we're going to have the flexibility to spend ten thousand dollars and we're not budgeting for it, then <coughs> I just, we just it's coming out of it's just it's just being nickel and dime from other line items. Liz, when the DPW budget is voted at town meeting. Um, it, it's voted um, bottom line. So by Dick spending um, $9,600 last year out of other charges and expenses for cemetery, that basically is coming off of one of his other categories somewhere else. So he's not able to spend 9600 okay. above and beyond what gets voted at town meeting. Um, he would just have to not spend that $9,600 in another line item, in another division, what have you so yeah but what uh, what michael is saying is that uh, if, if that's an expense right. that is planned going forward 
we ought to put it on that line item. And I have no problem with him spending the money. I, I think he, he has great just rationale. Because it now provides us with a little more visibility yeah. as to where money is going. Right. Let's just give him the $10,000 and put it in that line. Last form. year's 9600 was doing the computer programming for the Find Your uh, Cemetery plot. This year's uh, money spent was for the signage of, of the cemetery. So, you know, they're, I guess, you know, <coughs> one-time costs for those two items. We, we try to put it in the right column, but because the, as Liz mentioned, it wasn't exactly repair and maintenance, I didn't put it in that. So it's essentially, I think, the same money coming down to fund that other stuff. So Don? If you look at, at the, the budget, um, been budgeting purchase services, $11,800, and essentially spent nothing, and, and fiscal 15, another 11800 mm -hmm. So I suspect that these items that are in other charges and expenses perhaps could be in other purchase services and it would stay within this budget. I think we just put it on that, if it's not a repair maintenance of the turf, we put it elsewhere. So is, is purchase services something specific? What, what, what would fall under purchase services? Uh, example why that would is these items fall in there? The, um, a couple years ago we took the veterans graves and had them all sandblasted, <coughs> clean them up, yeah. something like that. Sometimes we have specialized uh, things that we can't do. In buying signs, would you fall into the no budget? I'm just saying that if you put them on that line, it wouldn't have been a question. I'm, I'm the reason why Dick doesn't didn't put it under there is because under purchase of services, the line that he has budgeted is repairs and maintenance, and oh, okay. the computer system getting the cemetery plots um, com computerized and buying the signs weren't okay. under that category so you know we're trying to put the cost in the right place right? yeah but essentially the money in the other one is paying for it right. no, i understand that. that's right yeah i'm not trying to make a big deal about it. it's only ten thousand. i just figured i was going it was actually trending that way i was going to suggest that you don't spend any money in that in the 52 400 line won't we zero that i'll put all the money in the fifty-seven thousand line and move on because it's another and it gives you the flexibility to do these types of things and it just won't stick anyway, out because it's actually it's all less this is consolidated into expense of the PW budget. Right, it's, uh, it's actually less flexible if you. Well, we don't vote it that way at right, town meeting. Anyway, so you know, in a, I could take that eleven thousand eight hundred and do a line item transfer within Munis and move that budget down to other charges and expenses. That just has not been asked of me. So I don't touch other departments' budgets. So you know, easily we could transfer the. Eighty-five hundred dollars that's been spent to date and right. transfer it down. Do, you do what you want. I'm, I'm good. Michael, Just wanted to know what I, it was. Thanks. It's possible I missed the answer to the question, but Dick, you are planning on another phase being done in fiscal year 2016 of the signage work, or no? Just to put them up. We purchased them. Right. And just to install them is the next phase. So, will the, the what will the cost be to install them? Will that be contracted? Will that be existing staff? Straight time. Straight, straight time. time. Not straight time. Oh, okay. <coughs> Thank no you. additional budget cost. Thank you. Okay. Good. Anything else? Thanks. Related to the well, DBW budget. If we don't, we don't through because I just had a couple more questions in yeah, the overall stuff. Yeah, um, just, just trying to nail down the exact personnel cost this year. Um, let's see what slide is it. Oh, we still have a couple more. Oh, okay. Go on. Sorry, I thought we were done. No. Anyway, sanitation and water. You got three minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Don't worry, buddy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman? J just to know, we did schedule each department at 10:15 uh, and then 11:15. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. No, I, I know we were getting close. Okay. Uh, in sanitation, we budget time for people to cover the household hazardous waste day and the weekend drop-offs. To do just um, again, we look at the employees. Some of them are getting the step raises, so they went up incrementally. And for expenses, uh, three cost, our contractual collection contract with JRM so went up that amount. Our tip fee went up slightly, and due to the barrel reduction, we saw a drop in the tonnage. So all those net out to 43.75, with a minimal increase. So, Dick, based on that, there, there's going to be no request to increase the residential fees on. No, I haven't done that calculation. Um, I apologize. You see, it, last year we were well, I'm not, I'm not 
Well, we're transferring, the sur sure. we're transferring the surplus back into the budget, so I suspect that yeah. there's no need to raise right. the... The user mark does an analysis, and I'm, mm -hmm. he didn't call it out, so I'm pretty sure we cover it, but I, I don't have that exact number. Right. I do have to double Thank back. you. Joe, uh, Jeff Rather. Yes. Um, so if we've had a decrease in the, in the tonnage, trash tonnage, why would our tipping fee go up? Tipping fee is independently contracted. You contract at a plant to take it. They, they no limit how much you can take, high or low. So the collection contract picks it up, and just the, the, wild, the wild card of the, the residents, how much they put out. So they put out less. Right. So the, but it's the per ton fee, fee that's gone up, not the total indip. cost. Okay. So, so per the unit ton, cost has gone up, cost gone up, but that doesn't the mean that that's made. Okay. So I mean, the good news here is that the two two barrel limit has had a significant impact. Yeah. Dropping Positive. from the four to the three to the two yeah. has increased almost like eight nine percent recycling rate and, and the drop in the tonnage. In the two years, I think it's been close to five hundred tons, well wow. less. That order of magnitude. We're up in the twenty-five percent range for recycling, which is not the greatest one, but it's pretty good. It's great. Any other questions? On the last is water. Salaries, as because of the enterprise fund, Mark has to program in uh, raises, so the increase represents a raise for uh, non-union and union people. The actual pay is based on what the negotiated contract say. Expenses. Um, we budgeted for electrical, RMLD, 5%. The current projected cost increase for lowering into the water. And uh, generally, Mark used a 2.5% increase for everything else, every other line item. Mm. Under supplies, typically that is supplies to do water work, hydrants, valves, things like that. We've historically underfunded that, so I'm requesting an increase in that. And everything else across the board, only two and a half percent. And the same thing. Historically, that other charges expenses has been uh, under budgeted for what we actually spent. Mr. Chair? So, big question here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jim. Okay. I was going to ask uh, with regard to the fire hydrants, do you have a, a plan where you change X amount of fire hydrants? Per year? Yes, sir. That's part of the capital process that we supplied it last year by location. Mark identifies by location. So we have that list, and also we look at streets we're going to pave. So between those two lists, that's where our source of what we should be doing, in addition to regular car knocked over hydrant. Right. So there's, so there's a process to, to go through. Mark has ones, he identifies them for age. Sometimes the older ones don't work as well. Well, they might for some think have any, but some of the older hydrants are not as robust say, as a newer hydrant. So, but Mark does have a. You mean they're as robust as in flow, water flow, or sometimes flow, sometimes uh, depending on the year. It's it's kind of a it's an urban myth, but sometimes metal pipe from a certain area, a certain time, like my experience, water pipe done in the 30s breaks a lot. Sometimes hydrants somehow I don't know it was during the depression certain metals in certain areas tend to break a lot. And I had like 30 years of data in PVD for water main breaks and it just seemed like it always came back to stuff installed in the 50s and stuff installed in the 30s. It just, it's either the installation was bad or the materials were bad. So some of it's based, it's old, some it's, it's not functioning properly. Sometimes, you know, they sink and I don't know where the ground comes up, they have to be readjusted. And a lot of them are, we're identifying gaps where there should be that 500 foot spacing. We're putting in where there never was one. There's several reasons. So I want to do what uh, if we go back to you know water's an enterprise. So we have a water water rate, and it's generating the uh, the funds to cover this particular budget. And do we have any idea where we are, and should we be dealing with a water rate change? Uh, we I believe we've as of last town meeting. Uh, I mean the June town meeting. We covered all of the money we took out, not yet. So what do we have left? I think at this springtime meeting, we will transfer the balance to make it uh, like $96,000. Okay, like and then we'll what do we have? Pay back. What do we have for retained earnings that uh, is going to cover the increases in the budget here? Well, have we looked at that from a revenue, from an expense standpoint, still there's the 
money that we allegedly owe Andover that was tied up in the last fiscal year. Well, and money. that's that's so, money potentially owe Andover that we should have. Right, but that's FY14 or FY15. We have not put the incremental away right now. Okay. But but it's you'll okay. but you'll have that opportunity now because with the loans being paid back, the money that you were putting away for that should be should be considered. Retained earnings. Yeah, or, yeah it should be a right. available. For right. I'm just trying to get a sense of who we are. Debt service? No, no, no. I said the, the money that we've been paying back on the, the five hundred thousand. Oh, once yeah. that's paid oh, yeah. off, whatever right. we've been putting away annually yeah. for that should now be considered what we can use for surplus or retained earnings. Right. Um, Mark and I, have, we're trying to see where the indoor thing was going. We can easily come up with a recommendation for rates based on this. Um, let us know what you come up with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to get enough. Well, I, so I no, we don't have a number yet. But Mark and I, we were. I think we need hoping to, to get one. I'm, I think we need to take a look at that yeah. before we get into <coughs> the next fiscal yeah. year, so we don't run into an issue with uh, uh, DOR uh, when it comes time to set our tax rate in November. Yes, sir. Michael, in supplies. Do you cover the paint if people want to paint? Fire hydrants because I've had a few like Girl Scout groups or something ask me if they could do something. I, I, uh, I had no idea, but do you is that where this money is? I mean, you look around, our fire hydrants need to be painted, so it would come out of that. We could supply that. You could I've supply done that. that other communities supply like buckets and brushes and things like that. No, I don't even know. I just think they need the paint, and uh, if that's something you'd be okay with before I said okay to anybody, I think it'd be great. I'd send them to you. Okay, we just have to agree on the color. Yeah, we wouldn't have them do one on any main no paint, streets. No paint hydrants. <laughs> no, no. You, are, you would supply the paint. And, uh, okay. Thank you. But no, that would be, uh, I'd be interested in talking to you about that. Michael's got some spare time to do some painting. <laughs> now, since I won't be shoveling once the snow's gone. <laughs> that completes this budget. Any questions? Um, the overall? Overall. I, just a few. Just to make sure. The personal, the personnel budget slide that we have in our budgets, um, is an 88000 almost $89,000 increase over last year. But I assume based on some of the discussions today, that number is now going to go down. And I was just curious what number you guys have for our personnel budget. So that it's one, the fire uh, one million six, one sixty. 63 of that is the fire guy. So we take out 63 right. of that. Yeah. So it's only about a $23,000 increase over last year. And then you got John Walsh's increment from 71 to... The no, it's the, it's the new position that we have. But that's how much? 20,000? 20, 70, 71 minus 95. 23 plus. 30, yeah, about about $30,000. Right. Because we're, 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 we're reducing the superintendent's salary, but we're adding a new position at about $48,000. Yeah, because it will be a uh, hopefully a new contract by then. Yeah. The, uh, the okay. money's okay. in the balance will be in the just salary pool. Step, Great. Raise, step raises, people getting. Um, that tracks. Longevity, things like that. That tracks. Things. That yeah. number is good. Um, in your FY16 objectives, one of the things I didn't notice in there, and I thought we could just take a minute to discuss as a board and, and with the finance committee here, is the wastewater treatment facility at the high school and about us seriously tying into that. I think this is the year, if we're really serious about tying in some of the town-owned buildings into that, that we consider allocating some money to the to DPW director to get the engineering work going and to see the feasibility and to actually start planning to tie into that. Because we got a two year wait on that facility before we could tie in. We're already into it for a year. I think you're gonna need a year to probably get all that planning done and build budgets for us we to actually, actually tie those in. We have a preliminary high level design for a system to send town buildings to it. We regard it on that. Well, do we want, as a board, want to request, because right now you don't have it as one of your objectives. Do we want to, Request that he adds that as one of his objectives, or are we not interested in Where doing this? Where is it anymore? in the capital improvement plan? I don't think it's in the capital improvement plan. It wasn't, wasn't plan. requested. It's kind of like a follow on to the DEIR. Is what what? I, had. I had as a follow on task to the DEIR approval. But there is a, like, a, not, not what I call preliminary, it's kind of a conceptual of uh, what would go into it and where the pipe would go, type of thing. And it does tie into. Um, this initiative to do expand the fire department. I'm sure you guys will be discussing that some other time. But the septic system for the fire and police are right in front where they have to expand. Yeah. So by removing that and making the sewer go somewhere else uh, might be essential. 
sort right. of tie that in. Libraries tie that in too. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, so to that point, um, I expect that there's going to be a recommendation forthcoming as a Warren article to take a, a, a closer look at the public safety facility in the long term there. Perhaps we could look to do, in conjunction with that, some evaluation of the uh, potential of the sewer, the municipally owned buildings, and tie in. As a, a, basically, Dick, this would be to expedite it out of the DEIR process, which I'm sure will take some amount of time. Um, and put a, a more enhanced focus uh, on it. So that's something we should consider as a potential warrant article. That, that would be my suggestion. I guess the, my, uh, I think what, and maybe this is what Dick was talking about being done, is to take a look at the town buildings, the existing facilities, the uh, senior housing area, and determine, you know, what makes sense to connect there, what the overall flows will be, and to, and to see what options we have there before we make the next decision. So we is that have, what you already have? Yes, we already taken all the estimated flows. Yeah. We have that. We have kind of a conceptual where the pipe might go. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be all the town buildings and the housing authority. Could be yeah, housing authority. I was right. PBD court. I'd love to see us try it. I mean, that's the closest one. And I think we talked about it. Um, school. Uh, Wastewater systems have trouble in the summer when there's no population because there's no food. Right. Yeah. So to have a steady source of food for mm -hmm. the system yep. uh, is good. So I think it's a win-win for the town to consider that. And the town buildings themselves don't really generate a lot of wastewater relative to the housing authority, but they do have a need. And currently to consolidate, say, the police and fire, for example, of building on the common into it would uh, there's tight fillet in that area. So we'll put a septic system in. I think the library septic system is across from the police station. Right. The fire station. I think it's right in front in the so to well, eliminate that, that lead, I to believe use that, that for building with I think the library is tied into leach the field in front of the police station that was put in a few years ago covers police fire and, and the library, library. correct uh, I think so yeah, yeah. Yep. okay yeah I thought so too well I think this is a great opportunity for us to try to either <laughs> capture it in our budgets uh, in our planning now if they you know, I'm not sure maybe you're right it's maybe it's CIP or or it goes, some of it has to go here, but we have a year to tie in. I think we should take this opportunity over this one year to really invest whatever little money we have to get the engineering done, the feasibility studies done, and whatever it takes, and maybe even get some quotes from contractors to tie in, and then get obviously a buy-in with the schools to allow us to tie in as well. Why don't I get the report for what everybody take a look at? Yeah. That's schematic level, just, just for your info. That might answer some of the questions. Not, it's not a design level document, though. Is the Jeff. batch a standalone, or did the batch get hooked up to the school no, it's system? Standalone. 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 So that when you go into that batch school, uh, right to the left, I think it's right in that left athletic field right there. You're right, Mr. Yule. That would be a no, great option. The batch is the batch is as you're coming up the, the back driveway to the high school. It's on the right hand side. That that play field is elevated. Yeah. Right. That's, 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 the, that's the batch of the school. Right. right. At the corner, as you come around the corner, yeah. right, right there. That's the, that's that's, the, that's PBD right. Court. Right. That's the housing yeah. authority. Right. The, the, the tennis course used to be there, but, right. uh, but that's now so right. Right next to the baseball yeah. field is that's PB the court. Yeah, yeah. And as yeah. I'm sure some of you know, under DEP regulations, you have to have 200 percent of capacity for your septic system. So, for the purpose of using the land, there's one septic system there, and there's another 100 percent size thing allocated. So it ties up a lot of land. So by eliminating that and putting in a sewer system, it would allow other things to happen if the town does. Right. Pincom, any questions for DEP, uh, for DPW? Mr. Chair, we do have a very brief presentation on fuel as well. That you want to do that now? Yes, please. Okay. Mr. Chair. I'll set up, Dick. I'll set up, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. So be your... Percentage of that 10.5% represents like new employees, what percentage of that? What portion of that represents how many percentage of the salaries? All right, you're looking at the 80,000 number? 80,000 something? Um, it's a, the actual increase is 110,000, and the percentage increase is 10.5%. 63,000 or 65,000 of that is the fire mechanic who will be going back to the fire department, number one. 
Number two, in the um, town building, we had one person at 71,000, and we're, he's leaving, we're hiring two people back at a total of 95,000. That's another incremental. So the only total addition to the budget is one person. And all the balance is um, contractual increases for unions, separations and all that. Do you have any idea of what percentage increase in payers when you take into account all the new people you have? The pay rate? Yeah, not yet. Yeah. There's, no, there's no, no projected pay rates. No pay raises at all. Zero. Pay, uh, the, con the union contracts come to an end this year, with the exception of fire. So <coughs> salary increases associated with cost of living would not show up in the budget. It will show up in a, an estimated amount that the board or the town administrator will recommend for the salary pool. Okay, so, so, no, so all of that doesn't yeah. represent increases. So that just represents new employees. One person. Yeah, we don't typically budget within the operating budget for pay raises. That's usually salary pool or, or so. In, in, in summary, the uh, step, right. the, step increases the, the fire the mechanic, which was moved to DPW, is moving back to fire. Mr. Welch is retiring, and as, as a result of hiring two new people, uh, one additional people plus a replacement, Mr. Welch is about a twenty-three thousand dollar increase in the budget. That 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 amount doesn't change. It's a fixed cost every year based upon. No, I understand. Yeah, I, just, I don't see other departments that have this type of line. I was wondering how it was contractual. Uh, yeah, it's always accounted for. Like, it should be in the other department. Yeah, we kind of call it all separately. Some guys get um, uh, incentives or uh, stipends for a certain amount of being called out separately. So we question it. Right. Put in there. Yeah, rather than kind of blend it together, it's rather complex. It's just laying all out. Any other questions? Fuel. Dick? Mr. Chairman, if I could just make a couple of comments. So what we've tried to do here is to blend the uh, fuel budget with uh, proposed motor pool pr uh, budget, which would be uh, essentially taking vehicles that may not be assigned to a particular department, but that would be stationed over here at the town hall. We have a couple of vehicles that have been identified that uh, we would transition in through doing this. Uh, right now, you'll see that the projections are in there only for the fuel costs. Um, and Dick will explain where the projections came from. In terms of the motor pool itself, what we would do is look what to once we've made recommendations in the next month regarding the assignment of vehicles, any savings that we would have would be then rec be recommended to be transferred into this motor pool for the repair of the vehicles. So you'll see it's funded at zero dollars right now, but that will change as we go through the budget process. Okay. Thank you. Mission statement: We provide 24/7 fuel to the department, all departments in the town. Uh, also under that is the procurement process. We're in a regional contract for procurement, and our gas system provides the accountability. Um, this is our gas boy system. It's kind of ancient. I've asked for capital replacement over the years. Um, it speaks for itself. The bottom bullet, uh, with the help of IT, we got through Maya Grant a maintenance management software called Fleetmate. Currently, our Gas Boy system gives PDF reports. There's no way to put in a spreadsheet to do anything with it. You can't download it. So we're hoping we can get this data for fuel use that each department uses, get it into the fleet mate so we can actually have usable data so we can put in spreadsheets and graph and chart. So IT is it's done most of the work to now. Now it's on me to get the data in there. And that falls to that project. And um, DPW is going to use that as our maintenance management and potentially be all departments use that. 
software for the maintenance management to be, to be determined. Um, fuel spending, just to let you know certain things, and this is um, a kind of list I got from several references and I'm showing what we've already done. Um, alternate fuel, unfortunately cold weather, we find not good success with alternate fuel, but there are alternate fuels out there, ethanol and propane and things like that for vehicles. Uh, reduced fleet size, uh, since I've been here, we reduced DPW fleet by two major vehicles. Um, we currently have private car use, and I think we're looking to transition that to maybe a pool vehicle and telecommuting, which for municipal, maybe not the best solution. Number two, we actually have a fuel dispensing management system that keeps track of it. Um, we don't really have an exception report. That's one of the faults of the current system. It doesn't kick out things. It's more a visual. We have to look for the report and say that this vehicle last year, last month got 20 miles per gallon. Now it's getting two. What happened? And premium fuel, uh, fuel contracts, we're in a regional contract with Andover's the host. I think it's half of Essex County and some communities in Middlesex County. Bid every year. The fuel price is pegged to the, um, the standardized gas rate. Usually it's the price of that plus or minus something. So it goes up and down with the prices. And premium fuel, we don't buy premium fuel for any vehicle. Usually it's not needed anymore. Use a big, big markup for that, as everybody knows. Uh, I implemented a idle reduction program. Um, vehicle idling, just doing nothing, unless it's a reason why it has to be there. We cut back on that. I've looked into GPS tracking. It has some attractive features. Um, besides basic tracking of where you are, there's technology that actually will do diagnostic like a OnStar. I got OnStar in a car, that kind of OnStar technology. More real-time information coming from the vehicle to the system for maintenance management. So it ranges up and down. Uh, rule of thumb number, I've heard, is a dollar per day per vehicle. So it's like $30 per vehicle in, in that order of magnitude. Uh, I've heard higher, I've heard lower. Uh, gas customers, we're all downsizing. I'm proposing, proposing downsizing like the administrative vehicles we have. Um, I've eliminated many underutilized vehicles. It just sits there, it's a drain. You have to pay insurance on it for doing nothing. Um, through DPW, I established a um, recommended life cycle for vehicles 10 years, 100,000 miles, things of that nature. And again, look at the downsized vehicles. And the last two primarily apply to DPW, not the other departments. If we need something specialized, we rent it, like a paver, something like that, a small paving job, or we contract it up through our contracting process. So we don't need to buy the equipment and maintain it and pay for the cost. And number five is what the TAs are mentioning looking at a uh, consolidated plan and hopefully to, I know my DPW speak only, I like to improve how we do preventive maintenance to a higher level. And surprisingly, tire inflation makes a big deal with fuel use. Um, I did some research on it and I was surprised that some big truck fleets have found it made a big difference saving money. All right, this is the uh, total department fuel use for the gas boy system. The 2015, this is fiscal year, is six months times two. I found that not to be accurate sometimes. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. It does show a tick going up for gas and down for diesel. Obviously, diesel use has taken off since January with the snow and ice. So sometimes that last is, isn't necessarily what's going to end the year. So those are our general trends. We went up on the gas, leveled off for a while. What's driving the gas gallon gap? If we're reducing our fleet. Um, let's see. A couple years ago, the big drop of the police department when Chief Murphy took over, he dropped his fuel use quite a bit. Um, that was that drop, and then we all kind of went up a little. So I can't speak. FY15, again, it's an approximation. It's just six months times two, which my experience is, is not necessarily accurate what it's going to be. Mr. Chairman? Well, we've gone up. 10,000 gallons of gasoline over the past, based on your estimate, there, based on the past six years. No, 3,000. What? 3,000. 3,000. Gasoline? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, with, with regard to the comparison between gas and diesel, uh, diesel 
once was much lower than gas, but now it's much higher than gas. Is how, how many pieces of equipment uh, are diesel, and is there an intention to get away from diesel equipment? People use diesel vehicles, heavy trucks, that's kind of the standard. The medium size, at the time, you couldn't get torque, you couldn't get the power out of a gasoline engine. Since that time, you can get pretty good torque out of a gas engine and it's cheaper. So as we replaced vehicles, like we had utility trucks, small pickups, small dumps, that, that a diesel would go into gas. Because you, you can get what you need. If we need the power to push snow and move things. Right. So we are, for a couple of reasons, um, transitioning away from gas, uh, diesel. diesel for those. Okay. So yes, we are. So you just answered my question. Yeah. Right, that's, that's the whole and as you do that, you're going to see an increase in gasoline use, it's going to mm -hmm. decrease in diesel fuel. Yeah. Uh, you find it like uh, we replaced it. Tax it. <laughs> Mark had a, uh, no, Mark Clark had an Explorer, we right. replaced yeah. that with a yeah. Escape. Fuel usage is like 33% better. So we see drop in the cost per vehicle. So that's, as we replace certain vehicles, we can downsize other vehicles. Primarily due to snow and ice, I can't downsize a pickup truck or a, uh, we go to like F-250s for the most part, mm -hmm. F-350s for one ton. So you, yeah. To go smaller compromises the mission. And I can't speak to the police and fire vehicles. Michael? So you know this has always been one of my favorite subjects, right? Um, that's why I put it on. <laughs> <laughs> and I read your, um, your report here, and you talk about the performance workload indicators. And as you start to build these budgets, I assume you get an input from the chiefs and the other department heads that have vehicles. So basically what they're requesting for FY 2016, usage, right? No, not how you do it. You just but you're gonna see later on where the T has a plan to kind of address that. Right now it's been basically look at the totals type of thing. And um, they really have a change in mission that would affect that. But uh, later on you'll see the TA has a plan to address that issue. Okay, because it, it would just be nice to see for future budgets to have a maybe a bar chart of what you know what was budgeted and what they were actually burning, so we can kind of see. It's easier to answer Mr. Masseri's question about why did the gallon of gas go up in consumption. Um, you'll be able to see that pretty quickly if you have like a bar chart that ties to it by department. Um, and it kind of goes back to what you're saying here. You're talking about fuel accountability, volume of fuel dispense. Those are your indicators. It'd be good to see that in the slide. So if that's what the town administrator is going to show, then uh, yeah. to that point, Mr. Chairman, uh, no, I don't believe there's a slide that breaks it down by department uh, in your oh, presentation. No, it's, it's in the budget, but I but, put it in the slide. I'm sorry. But, so I don't what, see it what, in the budget. what we've done is, if you look in the in the budget where the description of the fuel fuel <coughs> slash vehicle pool is, there are now four subcategories for fuel use that we will track yes. fuel use by so that when we get right. to this point in the future okay. you can refer back and see the actual expenditure expenditure for date for what would be fiscal year 16 yeah at that point god willing for us all and so the, the hope Good. is to track it that, that the plan is to track it that way although it will not be presented in mr carnavale's presentation that way thank you and, and to what he's not stated is that it is all tracked in dpw by department oh, yeah. um, yes. it's just not being presented here well, we're not a budget to act Okay. What he's okay. talking about will allow us to. Great. Thank you. By the way, this is just that uh, does not include the schools. The schools budget separately, and we basically sell them fuel and they reimburse us. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so you're increasing the That's more of an analogy for like a long haul truck. We're, we're driving on urban air plowing snow. So if you were having long haul services, that, that analogy would work. But for us, it's right. go to here, go, go short trips everywhere. So that's, it's not very efficient. OK, so you're saying the gas is either more fuel efficient. Well, I'm not saying you're driving. It's, it's it's the same. Not making any comparison at all. No. Dick, I think you said that you, you were sticking with the diesel and with certain equipment because of the torque that you were able to get right. out of it rather than fuel right. efficiency. Right. Uh, five so five performance of the vehicle the for its function rather than gas mileage. Oh, yes. Right. Yes, uh, no, I'm sorry. The reason why I'm just, the reason why I'm just wondering is um, so I, I was under the assumption that <coughs> diesel is more fuel efficient and therefore even though it's more 
expensive. It could, on a per mile basis, it may not be more expensive. Of course, that just depends on the cost of diesel in addition to how efficient it is. But I also was under the impression that an end, a diesel engine will last longer. So you, you might be switching to gas vehicles. Does that affect the longevity of the fleet? The engine lasts longer, but the vehicle around it will run. <laughs> That's the problem. You can get maybe 15 years out of any vehicle, especially using the snow and ice. But typically, the all the rock salt exposure is pretty heavy exposure. You would have cabs rotting out, major safety issues, well before the engine goes apart. So it's it's more than just the engine for the vehicle life. Yeah. And one of the other things you have to look at with diesels, we use it in a lot of our heavy equipment. You know, excavators, front end loaders. And if you know a front end loader is just sitting idle or driving from point A to point B is one thing, but it's going to burn more fuel if it's lifting heavy snow and dumping heavy snow. So there's a lot that goes into it. So you, it's kind of hard to put it down on a per mile basis. That's why last year when we talked about this, we looked at the snow events, we looked at uh, road construction events to try to tie our usage of diesel to not only road miles but usage. And I think that's one of the hard why you can't just kind of pinpoint it all down to mileage. And I apologize, because that represents, if you have more <coughs> snow in winter, fuel use goes up, less it goes down. So, like Mike said, it's not broken up by that. So is your understanding that actually gasoline or usage, not so lifting snow, taking it around, if, if you use gas, that's more efficient? No, I'm not, not saying that at all. I'm just saying when you're using a piece of equipment and and it's doing something in a benign environment versus when it's actually doing something in a very harsh environment or heavy lifting, it's going to burn more fuel. That's what I'm saying. And you're talking about, for a front end loader, about a mile per, you know, down yeah. a mile. I mean, it's the efficiency is to start with. So, well, what is the, so I'm not really sure I understand. So what is the reason why you're switching to gas? Thank you. Primarily the cost. You you're switching to gas. And secondly, the availability of an engine that would do the job. So I guess I'm just a little no. confused because Indeed. you're just looking at the cost of the, the cost per gallon. But if you aren't if you aren't comparing that with the actual cost of the uh, number of gallons, the, the miles per gallon, or the number of hours of lifting snow per gallon, it may not be true that that, that gas is cheaper. And, and until you come, until you look at the whole calculation, it may be full. Do you know what I'm saying? Just because diesel is more expensive per gallon doesn't mean that on a per hour basis it's going to be more expensive. But the use of those fuels are not just miles. They're, it's yes. digging trenches, no, 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 right? Sure, sure. So, so it's kind of hard to... I get it, but you, you, what I'm saying is it could be that to dig a trench for an hour with diesel, you use fewer gallons than to dig a trench with gas. There's no trench but, digging with gas. Or, 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 or you don't understand what I'm saying. But the there's no, I, I think what Dick is saying is that the smaller vehicles, uh, pickup yeah. trucks, things like that, uh, yeah, he's switching to gasoline. <laughs> the trucks are cheaper. They still develop the amount of torque that's required. You talk about uh, uh, front end loaders and, and the big trucks, they're all diesel. Yeah, you're not going to charge. Forget the cost of a diesel vehicle is, is probably, a, you know, I mean, uh, for a big truck. on a big truck is 10, 12,000, 15,000 more. On a smaller vehicle, it's you know five to ten thousand. So, so this so switch I got is just for the small yeah. cars then, and not really for the large trucks. Yeah. Right. Right. Correct. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, kind of sort of. Think of it as this way: yes. we're essentially city driving. <laughs> and your car has city miles, highway miles. We're at the city, the city mile lower, so a very low efficiency to start with. So some of those things I think you're referring to are, if you were driving cross country or a bus or something, where you're running, but we're constantly off one, off one. It's the operational use is very in, inconsistent with fuel savings, I guess. Wait. The, the equipment that's using the diesel fuel right now is prim primarily just the heavy equipment now. So <coughs> we don't have any more smaller vehicles. What do we have? What do we have? Yeah, we have a couple, one or two. Yeah, left, but I those think. are going to be rotated out. Yes, sir. Okay. Ford makes an F450, F550. It's a. Uh, yeah. Right, it's a robust engine. In the interest of uh, yeah, good. getting That's coverage good. for all the rest yeah, of the budget, do so we have any other real? Uh, go ahead, Dick. I'm sorry. Here's the good news: the actual cost is going down. Yeah. Amen. It's coming back up. Actually. It's kind of been a trend. Use is going up, but cost is going down. Hopefully, it'll stay there. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But it's, <laughs> well, it's already. Yeah,
it says used by department, and again, 2015 is six months of 2015, FY yeah. multiplied times two. So, so not necessarily accurate when we get to the end of the year. So I think I did this last year in FY14, showed an increase, but it actually shows a slight go down. Big users, gasoline, police number one, DPW number two, fire schools, yeah, right, consolidation right, relatively low. <laughs> this is data manually taken out of gas board. Mm -hmm. And diesel, right now we're down to two departments. The school department got rid of their last diesel vehicle. And at one time, you guys had an ATV or something that was diesel. They got rid of that, so only two departments left with diesel. <laughs> Yeah, it shows the drop in diesel of 2015 with the last month of snow plowing. That's not a correct number. Not possible. And this, I think we showed you last year, the winter drives a lot of this. A lot of the winter use goes up. So years with good winters, it's down. Um, as TA mentioned, the budget actually includes an allotment of fuel per division. And we'll be basically budget to actual, be able to give you those numbers. Um, to come up with a number for fuel, I do it. It doesn't include the schools. We take our usage, all the town vehicles, less the schools. I take an average, four year average for both. And then multiply times a unit rate. When I submitted this last fall, I took our November 23rd <coughs> last bill and used that rate and assumed 20%. At that time, the market was in a free fall. I know that was high. Wasn't really sure where it was going to go. So that was those numbers. Uh, since that time, we re-looked it again. You can go to the website for the Energy Information Administration. They have uh, projections for fuel use out a year. And if you're not familiar with Gas Buddy, it's a pretty good system and I have a copy of the report. They project fuel use. So using both of those, are kind of revised the, uh, what the projection unit price would be to that. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Steele. Just a quick question. On the uh, gas use by department, you uh, were able to break it down. If I recall the last term, last, my last term, uh, we, the, the discussions were consolidating everything under the DPW. It appears that that's been done, yep. correct? Is everything under the, uh, all the gas uh, gone to the DPW to get the fuel? And that was done for administrative purposes. There's a interdepartmental billing process every month. And at the time, getting the bill signed off and the money transferred to pay our vendor time was an issue, and it's since not an issue. So um, administratively, it's that part's not a problem, and it did remove some of the direct department accountability. Uh, I do supply the reports to the using departments every month. But I think the thought is to have it accounted for so they see it every month out of a budget item. It'll be a little better. And maybe it'll transition the next fiscal year to be put right back in their budgets. But right now- so we're kind of moving away from the consolidation. Mr. Chair. Okay. more accountability. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair, and I'll look to the finance director to correct me, but my understanding is that during the fiscal year 15 budget process, the budget was consolidated to be under the oversight of the town administrator into essentially one uh, bucket of funds for all departments. It is still one department that is in a place separate from the DPW's budget that's being administered by the DPW and now is proposed to be, while being administered by the DPW, broken down into the four major cost user categories for purposes not only of accuracy and presentation, but to allow um, the Public Works Department to identify where there may be an issue, refer it to me, and then I may need to take it up with the department head to say what's going on with that department's fuel. I mean, the, the goal here is accountability. It's, it's virtually impossible for the Public Works Director to control the fuel use by other departments. It's really up to the department head to do that. And I know that the major departments, particularly police and fire, have policies in place to do that. Uh, but so it's a little bit of both to answer the question. Okay. Don? Question, Matt. I'm having a little bit of a problem. With that chart and the table in the budget book that's labeled the uh, fuel vehicle pool, where you've broken the budget down by EPW, fire police, and elder services, this table shows that the 
police uses more fuel than any other department. Yet the budget, the $185,000 budget is broken down, $95,000 for DPW and $53,000 for you got to look at this. This is just, just gas. gas. The other chart he had was diesel. Right. You got to add the diesel into it for the other departments, and I think you're going to get that. Oh. Can you go back one slide? That's gas and diesel together in the. Um, is there another table in here? Both in yes, the table so in, in the budget chart is gas and diesel combined. It's not a combined. Dollar wise. Yeah. When you look up here, you got gas on one slide and diesel on another, where you don't have any police in the diesel. So. You got to take DPW diesel and DPW gas add them together. The same. Same okay. Liz, some Liz? If I may, um, so at the time of after Dick had submitted his budget submission, we decided to break it out by um, department usage and the dollar amounts that are in the budget. Um, versus what is on the <coughs> graphs for the presentation that Dick has given um, was based upon usage in FY14. So I took each department's usage for gas and, and diesel with the average rate that Dick is proposing for FY16, and that's how I arose at um, the, the budget figures that are broken out. Any question about the methodology? Okay. Restroom break. Kind of good. Well said. DPW budget. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Very good. Five minute break for everybody to yeah. get rearranged here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> defuel. Defuel. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, do you have any comments before? Um, regarding fire? Uh, the only thing I would note uh, is that uh, unlike the Department of Public Works, uh, where there were a couple of changes beyond the me mechanic, there the only change, in, in the only difference in the recommendation between what the chief requested and what I was recommending was the mechanic. And again, as I identified, um, I'm going to be proposing to put it back into the fire department, and he will speak to it as if it were part of the fire department's presentation. Okay. Other than that, his proposal was what I recommended. Bill? Good morning, everybody. Thanks. Uh, Appreciate the opportunity to bring my budget before the uh, committees this morning. Um, this is the North Reading Fire Department uh, fiscal year 16 budget. And the first thing I'd like to bring out about the first slide, it's usually uh, the starting slide, but that's the new vehicle that the town purchased this year, and it'll be put into service as soon as the snow banks dissipate. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, August. I was going to say, I'm sorry, what's about, that? About August? <laughs> well, July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> well, opening day to the Red Sox is only five weeks away. Yeah, right. It is an awesome Good vehicle. Luck with that. <laughs> the chief did take me through it, and uh, it's it's pretty special. Uh, it's a uh, Schmiel pump. We're a Schmiel house. Almost all of our vehicles are Schmiels. Um, it's uh, purchased in collaboration between a committee from the union, the fire officers, and it's custom built for the North Reading Fire Department. Um, you may notice that this is a little different than the vehicles that we've ordered in the past. It's got roll-up doors, an elongated cab, and it's a single color. So um, I look to uh, enjoy this as it's driving down the street because it's a pretty vehicle and mm -hmm. it's going to work well for our uh, department and the town should be proud. I know we are. So the organizational chart, there were, as uh, everybody's heard in the room already, there was some discussion on where the mechanic was going to fall. So I received instruction from the town administrator to produce my organizational chart as it is. And if we had to alter it, we could talk about it. But as it stands, the organizational chart is unchanged. Chief, deputy, the administrative assistants, the mechanic. I have four work <coughs> groups of five. I'm in the process of hiring our last firefighter. And we have nine members on uh, the call department. So that organizational structure really has not changed in years, and that's how it looks. We have five men per group. We're talking about some accomplishes, accomplishments this year, and we've got some pitches up there to look at with some training pitches, some fire pitches, and uh, we actually had a graduation last year at the fire academy. That's a picture in the top corner. 
The breakdown of the calls this year for 2014, calendar year 2014, um, there is an uh, increase, as we always say every year, it's about 1%, but as you can see, our rescue calls and EMS are the backbone of our department. 55.4% of our calls, 1,162 calls are medical aids. The rest of the calls <coughs> make up the rest of the 100% with hazardous conditions at 5.2, service calls 15%, good intent calls 7.4, um, false alarms 14%, uh, severe weather 0.2%, but next year that'll go up. <laughs> um, Special type calls, 4%, and fire calls, 2.3. Bill, uh, go back to that slide sure. for a minute. Uh, on the false alarms. Yes. Right. Yeah. What are we doing to bring well, that Well, that, that false alarm criteria is not like someone going out and pulling the box. It's a false call, not false alarm. It's broken down into probably five or six subcategories in that title. But if people are having... Uh, the same alarm go off and off and off. We usually take it out and it doesn't happen again and they get the service people to come in and uh, take care of it. There is a process that we can find people, but in my tenure here, and I'll look to Captain Nash, have we ever find anybody? You know, th that's really the false alarm definition. It really should be renamed properly. It's the detective's doing what they're supposed to be doing. You're cooking poorly. Uh, yeah, it's like five things. Uh, it could be steam for shower. It could be any right. number of things that are not junk, they're not fire, but they're a result of friendly activities. When most people think of false alarm, they think about someone coming over here and pulling this and then running away. That's no, I wasn't thinking of it yeah. that way. I was thinking of it from the point of view of you have to go and make a yeah. call for something that really. Well, in today's age, we have what's called an addressable system. So if we get a detector that goes off, we can actually isolate that detector, leave it in alarm, turn the alarm back on, and that eliminates the problem in that particular building at that time. That's a new construction. Some other, some other buildings in town have what's called zone detectors, and we'd have to take the whole zone offline, and you really don't want to do that because some buildings have very big zones. So that's why it might happen one or two times. Mm -hmm. But we try to alleviate that with the new construction comes in and putting in addressable systems. Fire, pre fire prevention, uh, through inspections and permitting, this year we issued 405 permits totaling $10,165, conducted 201 smoke detector inspections for $5,025, received requests for 20 fire reports, and we billed 111 master box fees and collected $33,300 for those fees. I would like to talk a little bit about this briefly. Uh, there was a change in the state fire code this year and now these permitting fees that we've been accustomed to since I started the job are now covered under the building department. Building department. <coughs> and we're working to continue the fees but those numbers would be generated from the building department. And I'm working with Liz to set up a database that we can uh, make sure that we're still accurately reflecting what we're bringing in through the fire department at the building department. Our safe grant educators provide fire and life safety education to all nursery and kindergarten students at all elementary schools, elevate, uh, elevate, evaluated all third grade students' knowledge and retention of the programs that they were taught in kindergarten, worked with science teachers in the seventh grade to enhance their curriculum to teach fire behavior and methods of heat transfer, and the safe educators provided training to the citizens from the mass fire services on retire the fire with the emphasis on in-home protection. All of the safe grant uh, actions that happen here are provided through the fire services on a grant that we receive annually. We haven't had it not been given to it yet. Yes, Mr. Gill. Uh, Chief, on the uh, 201 smoke detector inspections, are those new inspections? Or no, are that's, uh, that's generated on what we call a 26 F and a half. So if you sell your house, that's where the fire department comes in. We do an inspection in your house, and in order to pass papers, you have to have a certificate that the fire department was there saying that you had smoke detection and carbon monoxide detection. That's what that number reflects. <coughs> fire alarm division. Uh, they conducted numerous inspections at the high school middle school project this, this year and are continuing to do so and performing a lot of acceptance tests. They maintain the town-wide system and made, make sure that all aspects of that system are operational and functional. 
Um, I'd like to thank the Finance Committee because of the last bullet there. We had a catastrophic malfunction with our old bucket truck and they uh, allowed us to purchase a newer bucket truck and that went into service and it's uh, functioning very well, so thank you. The EMS Division. This year we responded to 1,162 calls for emergency service, which was an increase from 1% from last year. We are still covering more than 90% of our calls with our own ALS service. The number is actually 97%. That's right, 97%. And I have slides that will show you the money that these gentlemen are bringing in and the coverage and dedication that they're actually doing by making this program work. This percentage will also increase as, as they gain more experience and our last firefighter paramedic is hired. As I said earlier, we have one vacancy. We're in the process of hiring that and the town administrator and I are moving forward and we're going to take care of that very soon. Also, three veteran firefighters have earned their paramedic certification and now they're completing their in-house training period. The truth is, is they're all certified paramedics. They're all out working and they're all doing a great job. So these three guys that we've been talking about over the last two years, they're out there and doing it. And if anybody else wants to take the program, they're encouraged to do so. The more paramedics we have, the better it is for the department. Uh, this year we hired a call firefighter, and uh, three new call firefighters as basic EMTs, and one was a paramedic. And of one of those three guys that we hired, he's in paramedic school right now and almost done. All EMTs and paramedics have been converted over to the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. The paramedics have completed their NCCR program and their 12 lead EKG refresher course. New airway management training mannequins have been purchased and placed into service. All of this keeps our skills up. So when the bad one hits, our guys are ready to react. It's all muscle memory. They know what they're doing. We've completed emergency medical dispatch refresher programs, which allows our firefighters to deliver pre-arrival instructions that help deliver life-saving techniques to callers waiting on the other end of the phone and for our ambulance to arrive. With our in-house quality assurance and improvement program, our members have achieved exemplary call-taking technique. I throw this slide in here because a lot of people keep saying, what's BLS, what's ALS? Um, on the left-hand side is BLS. Advanced first aid, oxygen therapy, semi-automatic defibrillation, and limited drug administration. On the other side is ALS, airway management, uh, intubation, 12-lead electrocardiogram, administering of approximately 40 drugs, and IV therapy. These guys are uh, doing a great job, and this is all the stuff they have to know. So it's really working out. <clears throat> this is a uh, seven-year graph of the ambulance transports per year and as you can see that we've had an increase every year since 2012 and the increase has been a lot. This year alone more transports than any year that we've ever been keeping record for. 884 transports. Yes? Does this include um, uh, private ambulances? No. This is all the North Reading Fire Department. Phil, uh, yes. In the past three years, uh, there's been a significant increase. Is there something? People are getting older. People Our services are being called more and more. We have a pretty significant elder community, mm -hmm. according to Ms. Prenny, and that's what we base it to. And I'm one of those numbers there. Did we take you? <laughs> Uh, yeah. 2014 is a yeah. number. Yes, we did. So there you go. <laughs> thank you. So these are we thank you for the good key to <laughs> It wasn't me. So the ambulance receipts for both ALS, we've got. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, just thank you. It isn't part of the increase there because you're we're that that's what we're doing ourselves. No, that has nothing to do with it. Because the truth is, is that if we didn't have ALS. We'd still be transporting, but we'd be calling in private ALS okay, to take the you. call. Okay. okay. Any other questions? All set? So this is the re uh, report of the ambulance received receipts that we've re received from ALS and BLS transports. You can see on the far left margin, it's BLS with ALS and then combined. <clears throat> so for fiscal year 2000, uh, calendar year 2014, we 
billed $722,000, 787. We had to pay our 4% fee, and we netted 693, we took in 693,875. Bill, would you explain to everybody what the fee is? We provide, uh, uh, we give all of our billing to a uh, billing company called Comstar. They charge us 4% to send out our bills. We do that all electronically now, so I'll speak to a hotspot a little later on, which will increase the billing process, but that's their fee for collecting our money. Any other question? Okay. Uh, as you can see, back in 10 and 11, we were just BLS making a little over $250,000. And in 2012, April 9th, 2012 to be exact, we swapped over to ALS. We had a little upstart there, a little under 300,000. And then by changing the way that we were doing ALS, in 2013, we went from a little under 300,000 to over 600,000 in less than a year. And that's remarkable. And we've been that way ever since, and we're getting higher and higher and higher on our, our revenue intake. And this year we're looking to make 600, and that's an estimate now, $693,000. So it's, it's working well for the town. And it's citizens. This slide's really important. Within three months of starting ALS, we were doing 74.2% ALS calls with our own ALS, and I believe we had five paramedics at the time. Is five the right number? <coughs> in 13, we still had five, maybe six, but then as the Board of Selectmen allowed me to bring on more manpower, we were able to get it up to 88%, and in fiscal year 15 this year, we're up to 97.6% of handling our own ALS calls. Of the 2.4%, we're splitting 50% of the net of the money that we take in on that bill with our mutual aid providers. So we still get half of that money as well. So that money's still coming into us. <coughs> Chief, if I may. Yes. So, we, so just as, as a clarification, so the calls that you're not taking are going to another a mutual aid, so another community, not, Correct. not a private. Um, you have to have two paramedics. So in cases where we can't provide two paramedics, right. I get one paramedic from Middleton. Oh, okay. So we meet up together. I get you. Regional-wise, if I take in a thousand, they get five hundred. We get five hundred. If we were the old way back in two thousand and ten, we get two hundred bucks for that call. That's it. Yeah, my own question was, I didn't know if those calls that you, you because you didn't have a second paramedic available, that it may have been going to a private. We're we're partnering up with the surrounding company. communities. Great. And if we have to use a private ambulance company like Action or Armstrong, mm -hmm. I've negotiated the same deal. When they work with us, you get half, we get half. Great. Good job. Thank you. Call department. This slide is the same as last year for the most part except for the numbers. Because we train monthly, they, they have to function as a unit, unit when they come into the fire station. This year we hired four call firefighters. They've gone through the 911 training, the emergency uh, medical dispatch training as well. The call department in whole responded to 21% of the total responses, with some individual members having as high as 23 to 43%. And in today's times, that's a pretty significant number because many employees, I mean, many business owners don't want their employees leaving their job to come in and service the fire department. So we're really getting them on weekends and nights, and that's when we need them. The mechanic accomplishments this year uh, from the fire side. 11 state inspections, he prepares to make sure the trucks are ready to pass all the uh, state inspections. Uh, general service, oil change, tires, batteries, wipers, lights, 40 times he serviced the vehicle. Major repairs, brakes, transmissions, and drive shafts, 23 times, and minor repairs, door latches and emergency lights, 21 repairs. Our objectives for 16. Again, these are some pictures that uh, you'll be seeing a little later on, a year in review. A year in review. <coughs> Excuse me. You need a paramedic? You good? <laughs> <laughs> John's here, I'll be all set. 
Provide the community with trained firefighters to respond to calls for service in an appropriate, timely, and safe manner. Provide fire prevention activities through state-funded safe grant programs to our elementary <coughs> students. Continue to work with elder services <coughs> to provide and test smoke and carbon monoxide detectors and replace any faulty detectors. Ensure complete and accurate processing of construction permits using the state building code. Mass General Law Chapter 148, and for the first time in Massachusetts history, a single fire prevention code, the NFPA 1, which is the uh, nation fire prevention code, which also came in with the national building code about two years ago. So we're using the same building code, the same fire code, with some mass amendments, just like uh, every other state. Determine the safety of employees and their patrons of commercial properties through annual and more frequently if required by code fire inspections. Continue to foster good working relationships with other enforcement agencies within the town and the commonwealth and continue to discuss options relating to combined dispatch. Okay. Fire alarm. Continue to monitor the existing fire alarm system which includes testing and repair of areas as damage to human error or storm related events. Install new master boxes, perform acceptance tests for new fire alarm systems, and available for questions from the public and contractors relating to fire alarm. Emergency medical services. The department's objectives are, write specifications to purchase and equip a new ambulance, which I went through the capital improvement process and it's still in their hands. Provide emergency medical dispatch to the citizens of North Reading. Provide emergency medical services for North Reading delivering excellent pre-hospital care to its citizens and visitors. Examine and implement advances in emergency medical care that will benefit all of our patients. Call the department. Continue to implement the firefighting essentials and monthly drills to enhance core firefighting skills. Implement monthly driver operating training to increase the percentage of qualified personnel to operate the apparatus on the fire department. There will be two members that will be attending the call and volunteer fire academy uh, this year. I think it says attending, but I think they're in it. Are they in? One point is it? Oh, just one. Okay, so one will go later. That's not recruit training. That's <coughs> something a little different. Mechanic, provide the department with reliable vehicular maintenance and ensure that vehicles are ready to respond as needed for emergencies. Sir. Sure. Through you, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, one thing that I know, and I know it was probably discussed after you finished your presentation, but there was a consensus among, amongst uh, DPW fire and police that so we would work towards a singular uh, software uh, and protocol program for vehicle <coughs> maintenance as well. I, I believe that that was a goal that we had uh, discussed. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, embrace that goal because I think it's important that someone's keeping track of that, and it's very difficult in a reactive, excuse me, a reactive type environment to get that done so uh, you know I think that's a good idea so um, I think we're all for that at least from the fire department side thank you Chief. so these are the budget requests in operation and really these are just the cost of doing business um, I really didn't ask for anything major um, personnel services because the union side a contract this year during negotiations a three-year contract we have a COLA increase of two two and in 16 there'll be a one and a one for an increase of hundred and fifty thousand six hundred and eight dollars Telephone is an increase of 276. And I'd like to talk briefly about this. You can see that we obtain more services through consolidation. Um, and that is true. We put a couple of phones on the police department account that I pay for through an interdepartmental transfer. And for the price of one phone, I'm getting two phones now and an iPad. And the increase is for the ambulance hotspot. The ambulance hotspot is something that we needed as we were leaving the hospital. We had to wait to get back to North Reading to send the billing, the billing uh, company the information on the ambulance call that we just did. Now by doing this, by sending it off at the hospital, they're starting the billing process so much faster that on certain calls, we're getting the insurance money before someone else gets the insurance money. Is that correct? So that's why we look to do it that way. We want to make sure that we're securing the most funds for the town that we're able to do. And that's exact, and that's what we did with the uh, ambulance hotspot. Bill, just a question. Yes. What, what is the lag between billing and collection? 
You, uh, three, three months. Three you months. mean months. like actually getting the money? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we send About the bill months. in right away. They yeah. put it out right away. And there's usually a three to four month lag time before okay. we receive money. I, I question on that. Yeah. Michael. Billy, in the same section last year, there was a $3,400 request. I think it was for um, channel, the channel radio or clear channel radio. Um, uh, yeah, the fire ground channel. So this is different than that. Um, I'm sorry. You mean about you mean the, the telephone side? Yeah. Um, yes. This has nothing to do with that. Yeah. I asked for funds for a fire ground channel last year, which is a radio frequency, and in those radio frequencies, Rick, help me out if I get this wrong. You need telephone lines to go from radio towers back to the base station. So although it's being taught, I mean, it's being talked on by a radio, you need extra phone lines to do that. And that's another reason why we brought the um, microwave, um, and I don't know if the police chief will talk about it. We want to get away, because we're still paying for yeah. those lines every month. With a microwave, it don't cost us nothing. <laughs> so I'm not sure where that lies, but that's the reason why. Got it, thank okay? you. The Scott bottles, we need to replace eight one-hour Scott bottles this year. Scott bottles only have a uh, useful lifespan of uh, 15 years, provided they pass all their testing. We have eight this year are going, that are going out, and last year I had half-hour bottles up there. Well, if you were going to ask me about that. So no. every year I'll be coming back with more bottles because we try to do it so we don't have to buy hundreds at a time. Bill, uh, we use two ambulances on occasion. We'll have Correct. two of them out doing ALS. Yes. Uh, but you're only asking for one hot Correct. spot? Correct. Yes. So We're buying a new one. That one will come with one. The other ambulance will be gone soon. So okay. we that figured that that would be the time okay. to bring that one in. Okay. So, because I, I had highlighted that 3300 3, bucks. Where, right here? Yeah, on yep. my, in my budget, because yep. you had increased, I think you asked for that last I year. I asked for well. it last year, I just increased it because the hour bottles cost more. Oh, they so okay. that money was still in my budget for this year, yeah. so I just added the $3,000. <laughs> so next year, because I need half hour bottles, I'll subtract the $3,000 and bring it back to where it was yep. the last year. Okay. Any other? Anyone else? Okay. All set? Yep. EMS, professional services. We need to increase $6,350. Reason? We're doing more calls. We have to pay the 4%. Professional services for town buildings. We need a line item added, and it needs to be for $1,000. Um, before Mr. Balliconis left, he bought defibrillators for all the town buildings, and we will be doing all the maintenance and servicing for them so that, <coughs> so that will be on our on our line item budget, and Deputy Galvin will take care of that for all the buildings. Sir. So the, the two fifty each for the, the defibs is for what? Replacing a battery and pads. They have to be replaced as a unit. Okay. They have to be replaced as a unit, and if it gets used, you have to replace the battery and the pads um, right after it's used. Are there any other areas in town or town buildings where we should be adding? Well, I know the schools have them, but that's a question that should be brought to Mr. Bernard. They have their own, and I don't know about their maintenance stuff. I only from a town point of view? Uh, as far as I know, all of our town buildings, except for the, like, the smaller water treatment plants and things like that, is that true? There's two here. There's one at the BBW garage and one at the library. Right. So, except for schools. What about the senior center? There's one there as well. Oh, okay. Right. So, but she, Mary takes care of that. Mary purchased that one um, probably. You're doing maintaining on that too, yeah, right? If we get a um, we get a discount on the pads and stuff yeah. because we mm -hmm. buy from them. We buy a lot, sir. Through you, Mr. Chairman. So this was an item that came up in discussions when we were reviewing the budget. And uh, the question that came up was, it's, is it something that's more uh, better suited to be put in the town building's account, or is it better suited to be in the fire uh, department's account? And talking with the chief, I believe it was his recommendation that it go in the fire department more because that seems to be where the ownership is of the maintenance of the program. And, and so to ensure that the whole program is being administered in the same place, we've put the money there. Right. I, I appreciate the fire department stepping up, deputy yourself personally. Thank you. Uh, training and education, we need to increase $2,700. Uh, we have more EMTs recertifying due to an increase in personnel. Uh, and the new paramedics have to have changes in national and state certifications. So that's an increase of $2,700. No, I don't. You can. Go ahead. <laughs> 
just so you don't think the 27 will probably go down next year because with our guys, new guys coming on, our guys getting certified, they have to be certified every two years, and that's a fee through the state. So normally we were about half and half, but because of all the changes, now we're skewed to one year. So next year will be less. This year's a heavy. So every year you'll have that. A heavy, heavy year with a lot of guys needing the certification. So I like the idea. I don't care if they have to get recertified every year. This is okay. Right. Okay. It's a good thing. Other supplies, $4,000. Uh, $2,000 for a new life pack, $1,000, and $2,000 for additional supplies for the ambulance due to call volume. Call department. Um, member from the Finance Committee last year asked us to uh, look at the call department. Uh, we had some reductions in our call department and increases in our call department, but it all washed out. We did a forecast and we felt that even with the 4% COLA for this year and even another raise later on, that a reduction of $8,000 would allow us to operate the department at its, uh, uh-oh. Both well. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So operate at that level. So there was a decrease that was brought up by Mr. Keller last year about uh, <laughs> uh, but some money savings. So I defer the finance director. I was just go going to note in case anyone was questioning why it's 4% uh, COLA in 2015. The reason for that is is typically the call department and historically the call department has gone with the same cost of living increase as the fire department. Um, however, because the contract was settled after June town meeting, we could not go back to 14 to give them a 2. So giving them the 4 brought them up to where the fire department is at this time that was well, part, that was part of what I was going to say and I'll, I'll continue on that to say that um, this puts the call department on par in terms of the uh, the increases year year over year with the union employees the full-time employees and uh, we're also projecting to make the same adjustments in fiscal year 16 which would be the one percent the one percent that's called for in the <coughs> fire department uh, union contract as well that's and that's accounted for that you wow, I thought I said something wrong with those hands <laughs> <laughs> so the mechanic we also have an increase there and that's for a uh, 14 merit in a Kohler in 2015 for four thousand two hundred eighty six dollars so um, now I have a year of responses. I've got some pictures. Oh, you have a picture of Bob being brought out? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a violation of the HIPAA law. Oh, man. <laughs> He's a so public figure, though. I don't think it counts. That last one's supposed to be a video of us going to a call during the blizzard, but uh, I can't get it to work. Oh, look at that. that. There we go. There, you go. there we go. So it's just a small video of Engine 4, and you can see. Um, the driveway's been plowed like five or six times already. There's already four inches of snow on the ground. But uh, it's just something to take up time. It's pretty, <laughs> ain't it? No, there's nothing pretty about the snow. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a slide on fires that we responded to this year. The top fire is a fire in Middleton. The bottom fire is a Thanksgiving weekend fire on Park Street. Top fire is a fire, well, the two slides are a fire on uh, Concord Street, and you can see the Wilmington engine uh, sitting right behind the pickup truck. They came on the, uh, the line box. This is a fire on Woodland, uh, Woodland Drive. Uh, I think it was Memorial Day weekend. Fire started in the garage, extended to the house. This is a fire on the back side of the pond on Elm Street and Engine 4 in Wakefield. Uh, this is a devastating Thompson. fire that happened on, um, is that Memorial Day? Yeah. Memorial Day weekend um, to the Thompson Country Club where they lost everything mm -hmm. in the, uh, maintenance, the maintenance shed. This is a fire <laughs> last week in Middleton where a car fire extended to a house on the North Running Line. Uh, look at the big snow banks, a lot of fun. <laughs> we had a lot of vehicle accidents this year. This is down Benavidez Pit. I don't know how it happened, but the truck rolled over. These are just four pitches of four accidents that happen all the time in North Reading. <laughs> you can see the jaws in the top, the top picture, so they had to extricate someone out of probably the other vehicle. 
The car on the left, did it fall off the roof there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it rolled into the house. Yeah. Uh, we had some significant storms this year, never mind the snowstorms. Um, I don't know if you recall in the summer that uh, microburst came through, took down a lot of lines. Um, the picture on the left is uh, right before yeah. the phone started ringing off the hook, the and the aftermath is on the right. <laughs> this is a, uh, a carport that collapsed <coughs> on Kingston Street because of the weight of the snow this year. We had some brush fires too in the, in the uh, spring. This was a fire on, uh, off of Kings Row, um, a large area oh, wow. over an acre. Uh, we do testing and inspections every day at the fire station. Um, you can see Firefighter Carter there. I think that's him. He's getting his uh, SCBA mask um, fit tested. You have Captain Nash and Captain Murata doing inspections at the new high school, middle school project. And Firefighter Nash in the top corner doing a daily check of uh, their assigned vehicle for the day. What's the picture of the uh, staff in full uh, uniform jogging? Well, the only one that does that is me, right? No, I've seen a couple other guys out there. Say that? Is he the only one? Oh, I've got that. Those are coming. No, um, I don't know the. I don't know if I've ever seen that picture. I'd like to see it. <laughs> so we did some training this year. This is up at lovely Lake Martin. Um, we got some boat training. Um, with the new fire engine, we got a new set of jaws. These are battery operated jaws. They're the most powerful jaws that they make right now. And you can actually have a conversation while you're cutting somebody out of a car before you couldn't hear anything. So these are a, these are a, a big asset on, out of the rescue toolbox. Some ladder testing and some search and rescue. Ladder drills. Now, the, the, the picture on the left is uh, the sim lab. We contract out to a, a sim lab. They come to the fire station, they back in the rescue bay, and they put all of our paramedics to what they call a mock code. So you have no idea what you're gonna get. They go in, the, the mannequin actually talks to you and it starts giving you cues of what's going on and the next thing you know, it's either having a heart attack, it goes into cardiac arrest, they have to intubate, they have to start IV, IVs, they have to put the monitor on, defibrillate. So that's a great training tool that we use twice a year. Twice a year, they come and they do that training. The Ebola scare, we had to do our training for Ebola. I added this picture here because I think it's important. We have uh, five or six members on the Essex County Technical Rescue Team, and this picture is from two years ago, but it, it depicts what the Technical Rescue Team does. This is a trench collapse in Ipswich. The victim lives in North Reading. So I thought that it was appropriate to add that. Bill, the uniforms that the, uh, on the upper right hand, where yeah, do those Ebola? come from? That's the Ebola. Those are uh, garments that we put over so we can tape and, you know, I mean, but where did the garments come from? Were they supplied by the state or did no, they came No, they came from the fire department budget. They came from the budget? Yeah. We had to buy that stuff on our own. Did you use that for other? That's a one-time use because they're they're right. <coughs> they're called pyrex. Yeah, once you put the duct tape on them, yeah. they just rip apart when they're over. Yeah. The respirators that we're wearing and the SCBA mask, those are our own SCBA masks. Those are clean. The respirators, in this case, they're they're training respirators, so there's no loss there. We have other stuff that we put on it, but. You know, those things can be used over again, but the uh, Tyvek, are the booties reused? No, disposable. So all that stuff's disposable. Okay. Steel. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Ebola uni uh, uniforms there, uh, are they required, or is that something you did on, uh, to be proactive? With everything going around, I thought it was uh, the smart thing to do. So yeah, yeah, they were required. They were required. Yeah. Use those as soon as it has those materials. That's, yeah. Okay. Okay, so every year we get asked a question about mutual aid, so I decided to add a couple slides. Before you do, Mr. Chris. <laughs> um, I saw in all your little slides there, they were nice and all, but can we just have a short conversation with the police here and, and the finance committee here? 
about drug addiction, heroin issues, the calls that you're going out on now, can we just chat? I know it's not a sexy subject, but I think it's important that we have this discussion because I read in the paper, I hear a lot of things, and I, and I think you must be having more calls now than you ever have. Well, I can say this, is that through the data that we have secured for the community impact team to be placed into a grant, that we've done more overdose calls than we ever had in the past. Yeah. And that's about all that I'm really comfortable about saying yeah. up here in a public, would, public forum. At this point. But I'm sure that the police chief has a presentation on his side with the, with the community impact team. Is that in your budget, sir? Yeah. So I would prefer to dis defer your questions to him about that because really all I can say is that We've had a lot, and we that's really it. Oh. You agree with that, Mike? I don't think. Okay. I think it would be appropriate right now, Michael. That's fine. Uh, I, but I, I'm not going to sweep it under the carpet. No, I not think not it's a discussion we have to have. Yeah. Uh, be good. Be good. I plan to have a frank discussion with the board and plans to meet about the problems. So is, it, is the chief going to gonna stick around for that? I'll stick around. If yeah. you can? Yep. I just think it's important. I don't and think it's, uh, and I think it would be appropriate to talk about uh, your safety when you go on these calls. Have you guys run, in, run into any of those issues associated with feeling just safety for well, your Well, uh, it's department policy that if we feel that the situation is not safe, we don't enter until the police department clear the room. And, you know, we work hand in hand with them, and it's a great working relationship. So I would say from my days in the ambulance and from what these guys do, they feel safe. If they don't, then they don't put themselves in that environment until it's cleared by the professionals, which are the police department. That's a fair statement. You agree? So that's how, that's how we would handle it in a departmental function. If it's not safe to go in, we don't go in until they clear it. That's their job, not ours. <coughs> Thank you. So mutual aid. So we did... Uh, I asked Captain Stats, who does all of our, um, what's it called, NIFRS? INFRS, which keeps data on everything that we do. And this year we did uh, approximately 200 mutual aid calls to surrounding communities and beyond. And as you can see from that pie chart up there that our request for fire coverage, fire assignment are 34 calls out of all the 200. Hazardous materials, technician response, um, technical rescue, rescue team response, and many of these calls are reimbursable through the state. We had eight calls all year. The rest of the calls, 158, 79% of them, were ambulance, mutual aid transports to other communities. I actually have broken it down to communities and at the end of the day we gave out 200 but people sent 116 to us so it really is mutual you can look up there and see that we went to places where they didn't send anything to us but the reason for that is if we had a fire of that magnitude and size they would send it to us but we did it so I just wanted to show that it really is mutual aid. It's an important part of any firefighter's job and their safety to know that people are coming when you're in trouble. So I wanted to put this up there because I know it might generate some questions, but I feel as the, as the fire chief that North Reading cannot survive without mutual aid. And I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Bill, though, when you look at the numbers, right, Yes. We're providing more mutual aid than we're receiving. By four. By four. By what? By four. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was... No, that's right. We received 160. It's almost two to one. No, I, I was looking huh. out of the side looking? of my eye. Yeah. Right. And, and when I look at it... Yes. Uh, you know, it, it bounces around. Some is kind of even. Then we get to the town of Reading. Yeah. Well, let's talk about running. How many times we go to the fire engine with running last year? Zero. We went there 110 times and built the services. Okay, That's so the what you're saying is ask. ambulance yes. mutual aid. That's all included. We get, yeah. we get paid for. 
Yes. Well, not all of it, right? Or we get paid well, 50, 50 or something. 50%. We bill. Okay. If we're the transporting ambulance, we bill. Okay. So, uh, so for fire, I can understand. That. Right. Okay. So, but there's always been a discussion that we're going to all these places and all of these fire calls. But from the last graph, everything that we're doing, we went 34 times last year to fire calls. The other 158 and the eight that are up there are stuff that we get revenue back on. Hazardous materials, the rescue team, and ambulances. Now, I'm not saying that every one of these numbers is an ambulance that we collected on, but if it is categorized, if we did transport and we did submit a bill, then we should be getting revenue on it. Okay. So, I have a quick, just a quick question. So, so that uh, those 200 calls include mutual aid calls. All mutual aid calls. It's all mutual. Okay. Well, those are all mutual aid. Here. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, it's just more Michael. of a process question. So, you get called out on one of these calls. What's the process to backfill? If a captain and three firefighters leave, we call in a captain and three firefighters. So you, you, throw, you throw those, can you go back to the numbers? Sure. Oh, wrong one. There we go. So you get the 200 versus the 116. And I think that's my concern is with, you gotta call back, bring people in. Yep. You know, 200 versus 116. But those 200, we're not calling in. Only 34 right. of those calls are we calling in that amount of personnel. So not, not even on the ambulance side. No. Well, that's for like and kind. So if two firefighters leave town yep. to go to an ambulance call in Reading and we're building at a minimum of $1,800. That's the minimum for an ALS call, right? $1,800? BLS, yeah. BLS is $1,650 or $1,250? $1,250. We're billing that. So we're making, even with those two guys coming in, we're making a, a significant amount of money for the town. It's still covered in that. It's basically paying for that. The only time that we're not getting money back is on the fire calls, and that was only 34. And, you know, the other cases where if uh, someone doesn't have funds and things like that, which you're aware yeah. of. So what are the 116, what's the breakout ambulance? I can't, I can only tell you from this chart. He's going to go back to percentages. It's only, it's only kept this way right here. Okay. So it's kept on our report as mutual aid given, mutual aid received. But I can tell you that of the 200 calls, we only went to 34 fires in a year span. Yeah. But the rest, we were able to bring in money for the time. And that's the most important thing. But of the calls received, uh, mutual aid received from other communities, we don't know how much of that is ambulance and how much is fire. I can make a guess, but no, we don't. I mean, we had we had six work and fires a greater this year. So that means we received at least six times mutual aid, mutual aid apparatus to the calls. The call on um, Park Street was a second alarm. We had eight pieces of apparatus here. The call on uh, Elm Street at the Country Club was a second alarm plus. We probably had 12 pieces of apparatus here. The most important thing to remember is that when we need help, they're coming. Yeah, but Chief, you know, to be reasonable yeah. though, I think Reading is a little bit out of control just based on the numbers because again, we have to go out and buy the equipment, we have to go out and maintenance in the equipment, and yeah, I understand. You're making, you're making money on it, Mike. That's not the point. I, I, it's just not mutual to me. It just doesn't seem mutual. Oh, I can't control that. Okay. A question, just kind of a follow-up to that. When we do an ambulance call out of town. Yes. And we then will call in two more. Yes. Call firefighters. Yes. Is there a minimum amount of time they're going to be in that we call them in? Two hours. Two hours. Yep. Okay. And by the time they get back, it's usually so an hour and a half. Okay. All right. I mean, so that's not all the time. If you have to take somebody in, into Boston. No, it could right? be more, but right? he, yeah. he asked them. But then it's a lo then it becomes a loser, right? Well, if it's an ALS call, probably not. Very rarely, though. Like, when they, on top of the, the bill, is mileage. So if they go to Boston, well, now he's coming in through mileage. And Reading runs one ambulance. We can't control how many ambulances the town of Reading. No, but we could control telling Reading they need to call someone else occasionally for. I mean, because it just seems. I know, I know you're whistling there, but 
No, it I just doesn't was seem was like mutual. It doesn't <laughs> seem mutual. That's all I'm saying. We are supplementing. That clearly to me just shows that we're supplementing Reading. You're actually using the answer. Well, hold on. There is a supplement there, but Reading came to us 23 times. When we called, they came. Okay. We get quite a few also um, cancellations to Reading. They're in multiple free up. They're one of the closest to the hospital than we are. So they'll take calls from the hospital if they want an ambulance. And they'll cancel us you know, within two or three minutes of calling us so that there's no you know, callback cost incurred. Well. They also have internal issues over there, and that may change from, from one rescue to two over there someday. We can't say for sure, but most likely will happen. No, but we circumvent them. Because they have issues, we have to bear the brunt of it. And again, it gets back to it's not only making the call and building the hours. It's the it's issue of maintenance in the vehicles, yeah. replacing the vehicles. They're not doing that, and we are. So I, I'm just, I'm let you know. I know how, how you feel. feel. Thank you. And I know you've always felt that way. I love mutual aid. I think it's a fantastic thing. I just don't think it's mutual at Reading. Well, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. At the end, I mean, I guess I'd make a suggestion. I mean, there's really only a couple of lines that jump out when you look at the mutual aid uh, line, and Reading is one of them. Perhaps the chief and I could look a little more closely at what's going on with regard to Reading and give the board a, a, an additional report that might add some more detail on some of the questions that have been asked at a later point in time. Sure. Mr. Chairman, and to the selectmen, maybe to answer your questions with yeah. that. But I thank you for the, the data. It's really important. I well, I mean, I'm not uh, trying to beat you up on it. I just yeah. I appreciate it very much. So. I mean, if, if there was a breakdown on the list of how much was ambulance versus for each category, mm -hmm. it would maybe alleviate some well, of Well, you could talk about We just talked about Reading, sir. We didn't go to Reading at all with a fire engine last year. So the amount of times that we went to Reading, according to the... 110 times were medical aids. They didn't have a fire. We didn't go. Uh, so, but but so the issue the, comes in. He says two hours. We have a guy come back. At, but sometimes no, they've gone I, for I, longer. I, no, I understand. Just, it adds up. But, so, but I also heard that Reading only has one ambulance, so that might explain part of the issue. That's not should be North Reading's problem. No, I understand. Just okay. Hey, thank you, Bill. And that's it. Oh, sir. Oh, you can't ask anything. You abandoned me. Got pushed away. Hey, the uh, the revenue numbers from the ALS are, are terrific. I know we're talking about budgets and everything, but can you are there is there some evidence or anecdotal evidence of actual lives that we've saved since we've implemented ALS? Do we believe we've actually Big saved time. lives as a result Big of time. doing this as well? Good. I, I think okay. it's important to know it's not just a budget driver. But there's actual uh, human benefits as well. What's going on? Well, I mean, it, clearly, it's a, it's a giant step forward in terms of the services that we offer our community in terms of getting getting to an incident quicker. And you know, because if they had to in the past, EMS would transport maybe to the town hall, and then they'd do a transfer to uh, an ALS ambulance. So time, we're saying time. They're getting advanced life support care and more than more than uh, as half as plus. Seen. As soon as we're on scene, right? They're getting ALS service and medication right away. Whereas before we had to wait 10 to 15 minutes. Fantastic, great. So they're happy. Yes. When you go out on a mutual aid call, specifically for an ambulance. Not for the guy's name again. Yes. yes. What proportion of no, not costs? Jonathan, the guy over not just right. personal costs, but overhead, I just, I was just introduced maintenance, just off my head. but divided, just, divided sort of proportionally for that pool is covered by the revenue you bring in. Do you think I don't have numbers on that, but I would say that for one Ten, ambulance right. call, and we're building, building more than $2,000 a call, there's plenty of money to cover the maintenance cost on the ambulance if anything happens. So at the very least, you're breaking even when you include all your costs whenever you do a mutual aid call. At the very least, yes, but I'm saying we're making more than our manpower costs and the maintenance costs. Okay, so that means it's really financially in our advantage with respect to ambulances to have as many mutual, to actually give out more than we receive because we're making money. Well, that's my thought. I, I guess I would personally be interested if at least next year 
you could get some more hard numbers on that and kind of show if that's really true or not. Because I think that makes a really big difference. I think if people can say, look, we're making money every single time we do this, I think a lot of, maybe a lot of people will be Well, right. I can tell you today that when we go to mutual aid to Reading, we build. That means we collect all the money. So every time we transport to Reading, and of those 110 calls, they were all ambulances. If they were billable transports, we made money. There's no doubt about it. 50% though, right? Say that again, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's 100%. We get 100%. No, it's only 50% if I use one of their yeah, medics right. or one of my medics. Right. If I go there with two medics yeah. or a BLS ambulance, we're getting 100% of that money. Yeah. So let's get that clear. I want to make sure that everybody understands that. When there are not two paramedics working at the fire station, and we have an ALS call, and I need to secure another medic for state law, I have worked an agreement between the private ambulance companies, the fire departments that we share with, that when we work together, it's a 50-50 split. If North Reading is doing the call all by itself, we take all the money. And, and it goes mean. into that $693,000 that this department's making for the top. But the more important number is you're doing that 97% of times. No. Yeah. So Ted, uh, you had your hand up? I think it would also be more helpful if you could also in the future provide like a more of a breakdown. So you can say, okay, these are not, this is the mutual aid calls. These are the number of calls that we build at 100%. These are the number of calls that we build at 50% specifically after ambulances, so we can have a sense of like what proportion of those things we're making. Yeah. I, think, well, I think we did because 3% is uh, half. Mm, no, he's yeah. asking about mutual aid versus mutual aid where they uh, have paramedic and we, don't keep, we really don't keep track of that because at the 97%, it's only 2.6% of the time that we're looking at that particular avenue. 97 and then, well, is it 3.6, no, 2.6, 2.3 of those calls is what you're talking about. So well, it's I'm a very I'm minor number. But I'm also just talking about just general and mutual aid. Well, that talking, that's what I'm speaking to. Of all the transports that we did this year, 97% of them we covered with all North Reading guys. Jonathan, I think if, if It makes you me feel the, better if, knowing that. If you look at the big picture, yeah. right, since we switched to ALS, uh, ALS, the revenue is paying for five additional firemen. It's paying for the ambulance to be replaced every four years, meaning that we have two ambulances, so it's really eight years. And uh, we're putting money aside uh, to help pay for a future fire truck, too. So the, the program is very, very successful. Yeah. And the more business, to my, my perspective is the more calls they make, <laughs> if they're able to make the calls, they're generating revenue, even if it isn't quite as much as if it was an internal call. Well, yeah, if we're getting 100% right. reimbursement, yeah. I, have a, I have a much more comfortable feeling about that. I, I'm glad you explained it to me because, you know, out of those 100, if we're getting 97% of those are 100% reimbursable. It's, it's definitely a, a better return on the investment. 97%, 100%, and the remaining, we're getting 50%. So that's a very small number. Yeah. Ted, Steve, you yes, had Steve. a question. Oh, uh, Ted, over there. All right. Um, I had some questions for one of those topics, but I'll read it. It's more of a bonus, so I'll move on to another question. Um, <clears throat> I see it's about 800K of overtime. Now, that's 50% of regular pay. What are the discussions around? That topic. Most of the overtime is covered by contractual agreements, uh, forecasting for station coverage, forecasting for callback, all of those things that have been figured out. It's also in the union contract that that particular number is maintained as long as I make 600, we, the department, $625,000 for the town to support the functions of the fire department. I'm not sure I understood that at all. You so asked about has there been any discussion about overtime? Yeah, the, the, the town maintains the town maintains to level fund the overtime as long as the EMS division of the fire department makes six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year. So I can have five guys on a shift. So we can buy an ambulance. 
so we can put money into the fire engine. So the town has made it a commitment to honor that overtime, maintain that overtime as long as the EMS division makes six hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year. It's part of the contract. It's part of the yeah. contract. And Ted, you have to look at uh, the overtime is broken into a bunch of pieces. There's the emergency aspects of it, but it's a twenty four seven operation. So the uh, the the thing has to be staffed for all of that. So you got to cover vacations, you've got to cover sick leave. And then you've got to cover all the emergencies where they have to bring in additional personnel uh, when there's a need to. So you guys have had the conversations on the do we bring more people in or do we overtime and overtime wins the argument. That's the smartest way to go. The uh, As opposed to staffing. He's the saying, yeah, do we hire more people? Hire more people. Oh, you guys have done it in overtime wins. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, but we, we, had, we had contractually said that we would maintain the overtime budget so long as they hit a bogey. Oh. And no, but I, I think yeah. what Ted was referring to is that we hired more staff yeah. rather than spend the money in overtime. We're, right. it's, it's still on the wrong side of it at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeff. Yes. Uh, on the, uh, in the case of Reading and, and all the, the calls on that list there, uh, the, of the 118, are all of those billable or are all of those, are all sure. of those just calls? Most of, them pro most of them are probably billable. Most of them are probably sure. Better. I don't have the data on that. I just did specific numbers and percentages of versus fire versus ambulance and versus uh, hazmat and technical rescue. So I would say that if we transported anybody in that 70 percent percentile, we received money for it. Most of the calls to Reading, we usually end up transporting. So I would say yes. But that's not documented, is that? No, it's documented with a medical report, but it's not documented on the numbers that I produce for mutual aid. <coughs> Can that be done in the future so that we see 118, but 110 were, were billable? I, mean, is that I can see what we can do about that. Okay. Michael? If we made it to the call and transported, it's billable. Well, oh, I'm sure. If they canceled us two minutes down the road, that's not billable. But right. We're also not incurring Didn't costs because we're not hiring anybody. Right. I understand that. Uh, Michael? Again, the chief and I will submit a report <coughs> for the board to consider that, that evaluates what's going on with regard to the town of Reading. We'll provide a copy to the finance committee as well that uh, we'll probably be able to show some of the questions that have been asked and show the whole picture. Okay. Jonathan? I'm, not, I'm still not sure I understand. So am I correct in saying that what you're saying is that it's cheaper to spend approximately eight hundred thousand dollars on overtime than it would be to hire more people and pay them approximately thirty dollars an hour as opposed to forty eight dollars an hour. I'm not saying that the town is. So I'm just I'm confused as to how that's possible. I mean, even with the issue of health insurance, how could it be cheaper to spend forty eight dollars an hour than thirty dollars an hour? Because I was going to say, you don't have someone here on every single shift, every single minute of every single shift. That's the first thing. So, so if you're only calling a guy, you know, if you're calling two men in, if you get one call a night, say, and you're calling two men in, it's costing you four to eight hours as opposed to having, an whole, you know, two more employees in for an eight-hour shift. Hour, well, not yeah, so they have shift is 24 hours. Yeah. Or, yeah, but, but I meant just to yeah. kind of go with Apple. You know. I guess has anyone looked at this and said, okay, we can't eliminate all of the overtime, but could we, for example, eliminate, let's say, a third of it or a half of it by hiring some more employees, they're going to be periods of time where you do need people on an ad hoc basis, and perhaps we could save hundred or $200,000, and we're talking about a lot of money. Steve, I just don't know. Yeah, no, we, we, we've looked at it over the years as far as, uh, you know, hiring more staff and cutting back on the overtime. I mean, it, the, the dollar amount is, is probably pretty much the same, only because in the whole tail end of things, when you get into the retirement benefits and all the that stuff down the road. I mean, you own them for you health them. insurance, you own them for retirement, you know, forever and a day until they die. Uh, I just assume if we're adequately staffed here, provide some additional overtime and callback for these guys here, they get, it also incents <coughs> them to be available rather than going out and getting second jobs. I mean, you can pay your firefighters sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars $65,000 a year, or yeah, they can go out and they can get $110,000 a year from us, but it's still one guy one health insurance policy and one retirement, and the overtime doesn't go towards the retirement cost. <coughs> so we've done the analysis over the years to determine. Again, and the chief and the previous chiefs have come in here and advocated for more personnel, you know, 
uh, over the years, but from a cost standpoint, the board historically has maintained, you know, let's keep the staffing level as minimally to keep them safe, provide the services, and from a cost standpoint, looking down the road, uh, more cost effective. Uh, but as the services have evolved, and again with the ALS, it certainly warranted adding another person onto a shift in order to, first of all, get people up to, up to speed on the uh, paramedic certifications, requiring that being a, a minimum job requirement, entry requirement, uh, and allowing you know, the current staff to go to school and, and get the certifications. So, yeah, the analysis has been done, and we've made a conscious decision to say, we'll maintain the overtime. But in this last set of discussions, you know, over the last three years, we put a bogey on it. You know, you have to get $625,000 a year so that we won't hit the overtime budget. We won't cut it back. And they've been able to do it. And again, Liz, you want to make a comment? Just to follow up with what C was saying, we have done the analysis and, you know, we, the finance department is more than willing to, you know, do a current analysis to show um, the, the cost savings. Good thought. Yeah, we're talking, we, you said about 200 calls a year. Yes. Uh, including fire calls, but time was about, let's say if it was 200, we're talking two people for a two hour shift that probably is the minimum that gets called in. You have to have two men on an ALS ambulance. You have to have two men on any ambulance, whether it's okay. ALS or ALS. All right, well, two men, two hours, times 200 calls, that's about 400 <coughs> hours or 800 hours. And a full time, Two men on a shift to try and avoid any overtime would be four thousand over four thousand hours a year. So I would presume the saving is that's the savings right there that we have by not trying to maintain a full shift to allow to avoid any overtime. Which is five times more if we shifted it rather than overtime. Is that right? About well, right? My numbers about well, right? So I, I really didn't understand what you were trying to say. I'm trying to say it He's, was loose. Oh, yeah. oh, no, okay. I thought we were talking about mutual aid monies. No, no, uh, he, see, he's, no trying, he's trying to say it's, it, it, he's trying to say it's probably more effective to do what we're doing now than yeah, there's a high people at this time. Right, just just one last thing, just to go back to what Jonathan asked about, you know, the 45 hours versus the 30 hours. You know, Steve brought it up also. Is is the, you know the cost of having an employee on is not thirty dollars an hour. A full time employee on is not thirty dollars an hour because you have sick, vacation, uh, retirement, health benefits, and all that. So that you know, it's usually twenty. But we using twenty percent of we using twenty percent as the. The, yeah, yes. so it's 20% on top of the per hour cost, which brings it a lot closer. All right, uh, any other questions on fire? We need to move along. Can I just say one thing yes, about the no I'm sorry. Listen, we've got five guys working on a shift. I'll make this really quick. We don't have enough people working, okay? For a first alarm response, we need to staff two engines, a ladder truck, and an ambulance. That's 13 personnel. So to do what you guys are suggesting, which I think would be great, let's put 13 guys on the fire department so we can roll out the door and do away with right. the overtime. Times four, it's, it's not financially responsible for the town. By the way, when we do that, we'll and, have to build a new fire station. And, and, <laughs> well, you gotta do that now. The point is, right. is that when we need the men, we call them and they come. And that's what's been going on here since I started this job in 1982. And we do a good job at it, and you're getting a good bang for your buck. And the bottom line is it works. And that's all I wanted to say, so thanks. Good job. Okay. Good job. Thank good you. you. Five minute break for change over. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you to the Board of Selectmen, Finance Committee, the Town Administrator, and the Finance Director for allowing my department to present this morning. I just wanted to make some introductions. Um, Lieutenant Brennan, who is my administrator, Lieutenant. Um, Lieutenant Detective Tom Roman was in charge of the Detective Division. Lieutenant Mark Simmons was in charge of the Patrol Division. I also have with me today, you'll see as we um, get further in the PowerPoint, uh, Sergeant Paul Dorsey, who's our firearms instructor, and I have uh, walked in police officer Chuck Tachara, who will be here to speak about um, one of our goals for 2016. Um, just to start off, I did not include the animal control 
um, portion for my budget presentation this year. Town Administrator informed me a couple <coughs> weeks ago that his decision was to turn it back into the police department. So I just wanted to touch base that the numbers that you'll see here uh, in the program budget that I did submit does not include that. However, um, based upon the presentation today by the Town Administrator, that would, um, um, the finances will come over to the police department. And part of my, um, my goal will be to sit down with the two animal control officers and discuss what's happened in the last year, um, get them back to where we were um, when, when um, they left the department, and start working towards the regionalization efforts um, with some surrounding communities. So um, if anybody has any questions on animal, animal control, you can certainly answer them now, or we'll just keep moving forward. I'll just add for everyone to understand, it, it is a program listed in the police department budget at this point in your budget books. But again, it did not change from um, the amount that was in the Board of Health, with the exception of the cell phone request. Under and, the, uh, and I'm sorry? Under the town administrator's request. Under the town administrator's request, yes. There was a change in the cell phone allowance, and that was the implementation of the policy. Thank so you. The, my, the numbers that we'll see here, though, is, is it will not reflect the animal control budget. Um, so some of the things I'm going to be going over during my presentation is just reviewing some of the goals that I presented here last year. Um, and, and to let the board know and the finance committee know where we are with those goals. Um, we we'll discuss about the grants that we've received both on the state level and the federal level. Um, then we'll get into our budget statement for the year. And I'll also give a fleet management update and then discuss our upcoming FY16 goals and objectives. Um, last year, um, as you know, I stood before you requesting a community services sergeant. Um, that program has been in place. And uh, the most significant change was um, the firearms licensing was, was now under one um, person, and it was also um, essentially a Monday through Friday position, which has relieved a lot of the um, angst amongst the community who have applied in the past, and, and their appointments would be um, one to two months um, delay. So we, we've streamlined that position. Um, so that now we're, we're completely up to date. There is no delay on any application. So I'm hoping that the community um, appreciates the fact that we've done this so far. Um, also, the um, community services sergeant is also in charge of our sex offender registry. Um, so we, he's instituted um, a few programs. Um, we did present to a community group on, um, on level three sex offenders this year um, at the town hall. And we've also instituted a mailing of all level three sex offenders to um, child care institutions and maintaining them here at the government buildings and also within the schools. Um, he's also oversaw the transition of a new safety officer. Uh, safety officer, longtime safety officer Scott Tilton um, was promoted to school resource officer last year. Um, so Officer Ryan Haggerty is now a new safety officer and just getting him up to speed, um, working with the town in, in making um, the safety of the community a priority. Um, he's also been more involved in our elder affairs um, with Mary Prenny. Um, Lieutenant Zimmerman, who was in charge of that before, has now transitioned that over to the community services sergeant. And um, we're starting to get more involved in, in, um, in our senior affairs. Um, he's also been heavily involved in the social media, which I'll get into um, a little further down on the, on the presentation. One of the other um, goals from last year was specialized training. Um, our autism training occurred um, in the last month. Um, essentially, um, we trained all officers to um, assist in developing the techniques needed to re when responding to an emergency involving a person with ASD. Um, it was geared towards developing the knowledge needed to protect and communicate people with autism. Um, the, tr the officers absolutely love the training, um, and I'm hoping that it does benefit um, um, the families with people with ASD. Um, we've also initiated an informational form, which we just put out uh, about two weeks ago, which essentially would be a form that, you know, it's a volunteer um, program where if a family does want to um, fill out the form and give it to us, at least we have some uh, biological information um, if they chose to have, uh, if they, they're one of their um, family members with ASD. Um, does go missing when we respond to an emergency. At least we would have some background on the person before we did get there. The other specialized training was less lethal devices and munitions. Um, that has not occurred yet. That essentially was um, it's a beanbag shotgun training. Um, so 
I'm, I'm not going to discuss that because we haven't gotten actually gotten to it yet. We're hoping to get there before June. And as far as the improved services with the community, this is uh, when I spoke about the social media. We have um, expanded our social media role, and um, we d developed a new website which we launched in August of 2014. And we're hoping that that um, new website can be expanded upon. It does have a platform for mobile devices, which our old website did not have. Um, and we're hoping at some point in the future that the community will be able to interact with us through the website as well. Um, we did initiate a community survey in 2014, essentially to see what the community uh, needs, wants, and thinks of the police department. Um, we did get all the, um, the results back. I forwarded that to the town for their review. Um, for the most part, and I think a few of our guys responded to the survey, but for the most part, it was very positive. So we were able to now take a lot of that in significant portion was more communication with the community, and that's where our social media has addressed that issue. Um, so we're gonna continue to develop more strategies to try to get the word out. Um, our Facebook page, our Twitter accounts, uh, we encourage the community to, to um, at least join those, those two sites um, because we're able to get essentially up to the minute information about traffic advisories, um, crime trends, and whatnot. So we're, we're hoping that more and more people, we understand that there are, there are people that just don't have Facebook, so we still have to utilize our, our uh, traditional um, monthly or weekly transcript articles if, if, if we can and press releases. Uh, but we continue to encourage that. Um, one of the other things we were able to do with our social media is um, reunite people with their pets. Uh, we, had, we had a pretty um, interesting case this year uh, where a person thought his pet had died um, and um, the pet ended up in one of our offices backyard. Uh, but just through the social media sites, there, there were a lot of people that were able to give us a lot of information and we were able to reunite that owner with his pet. <coughs> One of the other goals that we had last year was the, to explore the viability of regionalized public safety, lockup facility, and dispatch center. Um, I'll talk about the lockup facility first. As you know, our, our department is, is adequate to uh, maintain and house prisoners overnight. However, um, Middlesex County Sheriff's Department, in cooperation with Middlesex Chiefs Association, is exploring regionalization of a locker facility. And they're the, they're the experts in the field, we're not. We, we you know, we're, we're police officers and maintaining prison is, is, a, um, is a science. You, you really have to have the expertise to deal with, um, with prisoners. We don't have medical facilities, um, so we do have to transport now and again. Um, it's actually happening more and more. So. Um, we, we feel that at least exploring the viability of it there, I'm not sure what costs associated with it. I filled out a survey and certainly said that we would not um, be willing to, um, you know, to expend or pay for any service like that because we can do it at, at this point. Um, we can t continue to do that uh, without any cost to the community. Um, that's a 12 to 18 month project and I believe we're right around the six to eight month mark right now. Um, the Sheriff's Department did get a grant from the state to um, conduct a study and um, I continue to get monthly updates from the Sheriff's Department and will continue to work with his office on that project. Um, as far as the regionalization of the dispatch center, uh, myself, the town administrator and the fire chief have had discussions. Um, there are a few regional sites around um, that do um, that some surrounding communities are involved with. Um, the jury's still out on those facilities. Um, there's some positives, but there's a lot of negatives. Um, so we're kind of watching what's happening there. There has been some discussion about combining the dispatch at police and fire, um, but we're still in those, those talks as well. So that, um, that objective has not been realized at this point. <coughs> Last year, we had total grant funding um, of 139,000 um, from various state and federal agencies. <coughs> so, um, part of that $90,000 approximately was 911 
grant, uh, training grant, which covers the fire department as well, and there's a reimbursement process that we go through for that. Um, we had an additional $30,000 um, in, in what's called 9 one incentive grant, which essentially helps us with upkeep um, in the dispatch center throughout the year. We pay for a, um, a um, IT service company to come in and maintain our, our servers and whatnot, um, and that's gonna continue throughout next year, from my understanding. We had a $12,000 traffic safety <coughs> grant, um, which essentially was an enforcement grant um, trying to control aggressive driving, distracted driving, um, had click it or ticket. Um, we had a click it or ticket um, session as well, as well as two um, drive sober, get pulled over um, grants. We also had an underage liquor enforcement grant, which was approximately 5,000, and then there were some smaller grants um, to make the total of $139,000. This was an increase of approximately 60,000 from the year before. So Lieutenant Brennan continues to look for alternate funding sources um, through grant funding. So our budget statement each year, we, we really look at our budget. Um, and a lot of what you're gonna see here is more about the um, unknowns today, not the knowns. Um, we don't have any organizational changes that I'm, I'm looking to propose. Um, so certainly I, the, the presentation is short, but it's not meant to be short. Um, so I'm not gonna give you the information. I did submit everything um, through my program budget, but I just wanted to touch on a few things going forward. Um, <coughs> So each year we do go line by line, and we and we take the um, we get quotes for every dollar that we ask for. Um, and if if the year before we looked at it uh, and we decided that it's not in the best interest of the community, we eliminate it. Um, there are some items this year that I've, I will ask for that we did not have last year, and, I, and I'll get through that when we get into our um, objectives for FY16. So this year's budget reflects an increase of $112,184. And as I said, that does not include the animal control. These are some of the um, highlighted um, increases and decreases. They're the more significant ones. I didn't include anything that was under $1,000. So our small capital, one of our requests this year for $5,700 is two semi-portable electronic speed control signs. As we all know, um, speeding is a, is a real concern of, of the citizens in town. These two signs will be, when they say semi-portable, um, they have essentially um, racks that we can put the speed signs in and we can attach them to the poles in, in, in the areas. Um, we tried the trailer and it, and it just didn't work. It was, there was too much maintenance involved um, and we had some vandalism to them. So these would be put in areas where uh, we would have a little bit more control over. So these would be pole mounted, and um, we they could either be hardwired or um, solar. Thank you. So um, we, we decide on that option because um, at this point, um, we I, I, I gather that the community will want these signs in their neighborhood. So I, I <coughs> we feel that we're probably gonna be moving these pretty frequently. Um, so we're not sure exactly how. We'll have to um, see how the process goes to decide whether we're going to be hot wiring these or not. Um, and then the, the second request is for... Um, oh, excuse me, Chief. So they're portable, sure. but they're not on a trailer. They are right. not on a trailer. So essentially, the, the um, and I have photographs of, of one if you need to look at it. I submitted it with my budget. Um, essentially, these are... Uh, approximately two foot by three foot signs, similar to if you've been down um, Salem Street in, in Wilmington, come by the train track that's mounted on the post, it says your speed and, and then the current speed. So that's what we plan to do. Um, but when I say semi-portable, the sign just slides in, but the, the rack itself um, has to be installed. So it was just a matter of taking bolts out and, and installing them to another pole. Mr. Yule. Yes, uh, uh, Chief. You have hot spots noted right. here. You have hot spots noted here. Yes. It, it, are those defined, or is that uh, something you, you're working on to identify they, which the hot spots would be? 
they're defined by complaints, they're defined by accident data, uh, they're defined by enforcement efforts. So there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, there is no one area that, you know, there are many areas in town that are hot spots. Okay. Um, so <coughs> it could vary from winter to summer, depending on you know, school being right. in session, uh, parks being more Fine. frequently visited. Okay. So Thank you can have a number of poles around town that you can just take these things and put them on. Correct. So this well, we, we and, and right now we bought two racks, so we may have to buy racks mm -hmm. in the future. I'm just not sure how how convenient it's going to be to move these. Uh, I know that the DBW certainly would help us out. Um, I anticipate you know we may leave them in place for three or four weeks or more, depending on how the enforcement action is going. So the racks are installed on existing poles that we already have, poles. right? Yeah. Poles are already there. So whether it be a utility pole or or a, or a street light pole or something like that, and then. The racks are installed, so you bracket on the back of the. Okay. So the, the even, I mean, it is time consuming to remove the, the, the full bracket, but you can do it. But if, if there's spots that the chief thinks that it needs more attention, maybe you leave the bracket up there for, for a long any period of time, even though you're pulling out the device. It's true. It just means you're allowed to buy more brackets. Correct. Right. Mr. Prisco. Hey, are there, an, there are other options, though, putting in a permanent one, right? Are this could be permanent. Think this could be permanent? This could be permanent. You leave it there forever. And what, the reason why I said portable is because we're only purchasing two. Yeah. And there's clearly more areas in town than oh, two. Oh, yeah. And I think they work. I yeah, do. I, I've I do. gone down roads myself that I would go a little fast around and I see that I slow down. People do. They, they work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you you got to catch me first. Uh, I applaud you for doing this because I think it's... It actually answers a concern in the community. I, yeah, I've received a lot of calls in my four you know, half years on the board, five years on the board. And it's about my street, Southwick Road, I get a lot of complaints, uh, Lindor, all those areas. So well, I think, you know, one of the, I think a lot of the hot spots are these feeder roads, you know, where people come from neighborhoods and they have to travel down through a residential yeah. road yeah. to yeah. 62 and get out to Chestnut North. Street. Chestnut North. Street, North Street. Uh, yeah. Question I have is, is there a capability built into these devices such that they could record data and give you some information as to whether, uh, you know, if it's set for 35 and you're recording 45 all the time, right? Yeah. Can you extract data from these? Not uh, this particular not ones. ones. No. The ones for 30,000, probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Trim them out the one. Yeah, not this one. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Jeff? Yeah, uh, I think 30. you alluded to it before. The, the trailer one, we, we bought a bunch of years ago. And I recall when I was last on the uh, time I, I was on the board, I inquired to it, and it had fallen by the wayside. I guess it had broken and, and so on. Uh, the maintenance on these, is it, is it really that much improved? This, this is warrantied for five years, so, um, but I'm, I'm not sure because we haven't really, we haven't experienced it yet. Um, you know, they, I have documentation here that talks about what they do cover, and I, I'm just not sure of all the internal components that would need the maintenance. This is gonna be essentially a trial and error for us. Um, when we decided to go this route, it was the more expensive ones, the big trailers. Um, and, you know, you have to have a, a hitch on a car. I mean, there was a lot that, right that went into it. Um, and I look at Orchard Drive as a prime example. We've, we've had, um, I've had numerous complaints in that neighborhood. And we've done selective enforcement, we've put signage up, we've put crosswalks, and we've done everything on an engineering end of it and an enforcement end of it. And, and we were hoping that you know, we could utilize this in, in that type of a neighborhood because I don't think people really realize how fast they're going when they hit that street. Right. Um, right. You know, when the speed limit is 30 miles an hour, and they look to see, and they're actually going 37, we're hoping that it's gonna be an education tool. Well, I, I believe Wilmington uses a few of them. And you might wanna to touch base with them to see well, what we their have, cost were. You know. We have touched base with them. They're, essentially, they work great. That's, that's what we get back from them. You know, as far as, you know, there may be some minor, you know, we're gonna to have to put, replace some bulbs um, right. and things like that. Um, but I think that, that Right now, it's warranted. So if we're, you know, we start getting into maintenance costs, then we're going to have to address that in future. Right, okay. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, so uh, item number two, uh, well, just as far as the marked uh, unit goes, uh, Lieutenant Romy is going to give a fleet management update report, so he'll address that number um, when we um, get to that fleet management report. The contractual contractual step salaries, uh, um, same with the other departments. Um, this is from the um, contractual step increase over FY15. Um, one of our objectives this year um, is the purchase of tasers. Um, the officers here are going to be uh, doing a presentation on that, so I, I'm going to skip the next two items for that as well. Um, and then the leases and rentals. Um, this is a um, this expenses for a lease for a copier for the administrative floor. Um, when I became chief, one of the one of the things I looked at when I went through the budget was the amount of money we were spending on um, in cartridges, and um, it far exceeded that number. We were up in the $7,000 range per year. Um, so I essentially eliminated all our printers and went to one copier on each floor. And um, it's been a cost savings for us. Um, our current copier um, is out of warranty. Um, they, they gave us a, a contractual price for maintenance, which was probably four times that. And, and I just decided at this point we're going to um, we're going to ride it out and try to get through the year with our um, current current um, copier, and, and that's why I know that the finance committee is not really keen on, on leasing. But um, you know, for a, a new copy machine, it, it's probably in the twelve thousand dollar range. Um, and it typically, you know, we have a three year um, maintenance plan with that, and then at that point, it, it's just. What I'm looking at, I'm no expert at it, but it's costing us more to maintain it than to actually lease it on any basis. Um, these are three of the um, more significant decreases. Um, our overtime has decreased um, $11,000 this year, and that includes our, um, the cost that for the contractual stuff increases. Um, a lot of it comes down to the um, uh, we had an officer who was a 40-year veteran of the department who was at his top step with um, vacation time and um, holiday time. So that includes a lot of that. And we also had an officer transferred to another department who was um, had an additional um, 48, 80 hours of vacation. Um, the, the new people that we're hiring are obviously going to be starting at the lower steps. Um, and for the whole fiscal year, they would not have vacation time um, on the books. And then the other ones are just um, the vehicle supplies. And like I said, Lieutenant Rome is going to discuss that in more detail. Um, and the clothing is just more of a contractual obligation. Um, right now we have two um, recruits in the academy. And um, that they would essentially get their clothing allowance um, in June when they get out. And then they will only get the one um, the contractual obligation for, I think it's $900 for each officer. But typically, in their initial hirings, they get 900 plus 900, so it's a total of 1,800 dollars. So this is our um, total requested, um, and it's a comparison from FY15 to FY16, and you can see the increases, um, which totals the 112,184 increase for the year. This is a um, detailed overtime request. Everything on the days off calendar is just um, essentially the, um, the days on the books. Uh, we replace, if you see the hours and the replacement, the difference, we don't replace man for man, hour for hour. We replace it based upon, um, because of the um, schedule of the offices, we schedule it based upon the average overtime shift, which is 5.5 hours. Um, and the reason why I left the SRO, we've had in the past um, that they would have um, overtime hours, but the SRO is working Monday through Friday now, and um, there's no overtime involved in that. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm not going to go through each line item, um, but each one of those we're gone through. And essentially, we looked at what we spent last year, what we project to spend this year, and those are the totals. And this is just a continuation of that. No question? 
Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Lieutenant Romeo for our fleet management update. <coughs> Thank you, Chief. Um, currently, um, we maintain 15 vehicles in the, uh, in the police departments, some administrative vehicles and eight marked units. Um, at any given time, depending on staffing uh, levels, we could have uh, six cars on the road during the peak hours at nighttime. Um, so the eight cars uh, are rotated through we have some new, as you probably have seen, some new SUVs uh, in the fleet, and that's what we're trending towards. Is, is the, all our replacements will be the SUVs, and there's a couple different reasons why we're going with the SUVs. One is it holds about 60% of the national market for police vehicles is, is the Ford Explorer. They're all-wheel drive vehicles, um, climate-controlled inside for uh, the AEDs that we carry and, and other uh, things that we carry, medical uh, bags that we carry, so everything's temperature controlled inside the passenger compartment. There's an additional upfitting cost associated with these vehicles that, uh, I don't want to say it's a one-time fee, but certainly when you're switching from a Crown Victoria to a, an SUV, nothing fits. So you can't retrofit anything from the old cars to the new cars. Uh, and with an SUV, you need two prisoner compartments, one for the rear, uh, the driver's seat and the one from the rear of the uh, prisoner seat into the passenger compartment. So now you're dealing with two different uh, prisoner compartments. So there's additional upfit costs. It's about ten to eleven thousand uh, dollars to upfit a vehicle for police use. For the, that's with all the emergency equipment uh, incorporated. So when we did an analysis of the of the police fleet this year, um, first of all, in, in 2014 we didn't replace any vehicles. It was a status quo. Uh, and we continued because we had a, in 2013 there was a uh, a late arrival of the new vehicle, so there was a delay. Um, so in 14 we we forego we, we had foregone uh, any replacement vehicles. In 15 we had replaced one vehicle. That's now in service. It has about 15,000 miles on it. In 16 we're going to re we're requesting two vehicles. And the factors that we look at are maintenance costs, road miles, engine idle hours, uh, and warranty issues. Uh, any given time, the, the entire North Reading Police Fleet averages between 800,000 to 1.1 uh, 1 .1 million miles on the fleet. That's everything in total. Right now, we're about 950,000 miles totally on our fleet. That's spread, average spread over 15 vehicles. Um, Something like the animal control vehicle uh, might only have 10,000 miles on it, and that's projected to last seven to 12 years. Uh, a marked car lifespan is three to four years max. Uh, and once you incorporate engine idle hours in. So we looked at two, we have identified two vehicles that we're gonna replace or are asking to replace. Uh, one of them has uh, 9,600 hours on the engine, and the other one has 7,200 hours on the engine. When you incorporate the math, uh, the formula that we use, one vehicle has almost 400,000 miles on it, and the other one has 300,000 miles on it. That's on the drive line. Uh, <coughs> so those two vehicles are both 2011 Crown Victorias. Those were both put in service in 2010. Um, well out of uh, manufacturer's warranty um, and a, a potential financial liability to, to the community if they stay in service. During, during 15, FY15, we had two engines. Uh, we lost two engines in two of our cars. Both were covered under factory warranty. Didn't cost the town anything. One of them, ironically, you can't make this stuff up, had 59,900 miles on it. The warranty expired at 60,000 miles. That's how much, that's how close it was for us having to pay $5,000 for an engine. Uh, it was covered under warranty. They weren't happy about it, but they did it. Uh, those two vehicles that we lost engines in are still remaining in our fleet. We're not replacing those two. These are two older vehicles that we've identified that we were asking for replacement. And we have a slide that actually breaks it down. The price of the, of the unit itself, that's a black and white, you know, we pick up at the dealership is 28137 The upfit 
is like I said, ten to eleven thousand dollars each unit, uh, with the, incorporated with the lettering. Grand total of ninety-four thousand four hundred dollars. We are removing the two-way radios because the radios that we have are well within their lifespan that we are going to retrofit out of these cars. Uh, they're, they're digital. They're already uh, digital, and they have all the channels that we need. Yes. Yes, I, I, um, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Is the change over from the Crown Victoria to the Ford Explorer? Is that what everyone's doing now? Is is the Ford Explorer, uh, Explorer they don't becoming make them <laughs> yeah. the car of choice? It, it's a, of it choice? holds sixty percent of the national market. Right. The SUV does. Yes. Not the sedan. So the SUV is sixty percent of the market. I'm not sure about the sedan, but we're, we're <coughs> getting away from the sedans. We're going to stay with all right, the SUVs. Right. Yeah. Okay. But is that, that trend not only with yourself? Is it with the other police departments? And you, you can see the other communities are all are all going that way. It's okay. it's okay. It's a, it's a, it's the I don't want to say it's the only choice, but it seems to be the most logical choice of, of this area. Okay. I, I have two questions. Oh. One is there's still some of the old Crown Vicks on the road. Are those when these are purchased, uh, are those all gone now, or you still have No, we'll still, we'll still have two. One. one. One? Yeah. Okay. I think, oh, I, I believe we'll have one left. I think that's a supervisor car, so it has less miles on it and gets yeah. used less. And you talk a lot about idle time and the accumulation, and I understand a, a piece of that, but there are hybrids out there now that, you know, the engine will come on and off as, uh, as a matter of need. Uh, this guys looked at that. Yeah, or is it we just actually, the, I actually, uh, yeah. Technology hasn't evolved into police cruises yet. Well, there are aftermarket, aftermarket companies that do address that with police vehicles, and, and then we actually did a study on this, internal study on this, about three years ago, as part of our multi-phase fuel savings program. The the companies that are out there will actually automatically shut the vehicle off. Uh, from 20 minutes to 40 minutes an hour and only turn it on when it's needed. The issue then becomes uh, if there's an officer is running selective enforcement and it's summertime, he doesn't have air conditioning. Or if it's wintertime, he doesn't have heat. So there are, I, ideally, I mean, it, it can work if the car is being unattended and it's, it's only uh, remaining idling. We have an internal policy that the car should not be idle. Ten, ten, shouldn't be idling more than 10 minutes. And they, okay. So, there are to address it. Yes, there are companies that that do address police fleets, um, but there are other things that come into play that we don't know that that would work for us, as far as shutting the vehicles off. Well, I, I bring it up. Uh, my wife has been driving around in a, a Toyota Highlander hybrid for a number of years, and you know whether you're. Uh, in the summer, when you have the air conditioning on, right? if it needs the air, if it needs the air conditioning, the motor comes back on, right? and it goes off. So I mean, it's not like you have to turn anything on or off. Uh, yeah, but that's in a that's in a hybrid vehicle. This is this this company that has this product. You, you know, you're dealing with a straight, you know, gasoline powered vehicle, not with with a hybrid vehicle. So I don't know if. It would turn it on just based on driver comfort. Well, I'm not talking about this company that's adding it on. I'm just saying that there are vehicles out there, and Ford has yeah, the a, eco a, option. They call it a, a number of vehicles, vehicles that uh, are true hybrids. Not even and hybrids, I, though. And I don't know if they've reached the point of becoming, uh, you know into the what you call the specialized uh, police cruiser line yeah there's no current option on a police vehicle to have that installed okay this is an aftermarket company <laughs> okay. that just uh, on a fuel the maintenance question. yeah thank you mr chairman <clears throat> yes yes sir sorry uh, actually two questions two questions one um is that in, when the chief was talking small capital requested one marked unit the 38922, and then we're talking two. Then the second thing is just a math thing, I guess. When I add up those numbers, that second column up there, I don't come to 94,000. I come to 77,845. Yeah, but then we, then we, uh, I believe, then we deducted 
these uh, that sixteen thousand. Then you should come up with the same, the right number. Because we deducted, you know, this, this, this ninety four thousand was the what it would cost to get two cars up and running. But then we backed out the laptops and we backed out the radios. And, and the reason why that the, that the additional capital that we had in last year's budget we had one car right this is an additional mm -hmm. car so that's why it shows an increase of that thirty eight thousand okay. okay that chart yes. was just showing increases in the categories not the total right. thank you Michael just a couple quick questions so you're getting two fourteens instead of fifteens there'll be there'll be fifteens oh they will be fifteen maybe that's that's a typo they are fifteens okay they are fifteens yep. okay. And then the um, vehicles that you're going to get rid of, traded in. They get they get traded in. Although the last vehicle that we uh, replaced was was uh, retrofitted for other town uses, um, the value has dramatically. Uh, there used to be some residual value in the trade-ins. The Crown Vix is old technology, and um, they used to be recycled into taxi cabs. That's where the majority of them went. Is is for other uses as, as taxis. And taxi companies aren't using these big V8 sedans anymore. Okay. Uh, so the the value is. Yeah, I, I figured they were next I, to nothing. I, you know, probably fifteen hundred bucks a piece, probably. Okay. Jonathan. Uh, you said you um, tried to you know, leaving this stopping using um, Crown Victorias and now you're using SUVs. Why is that? They don't make the Crown Victoria anymore. They stopped making that in two thousand and twelve. <laughs> and. The SUV um, is an all-wheel drive vehicle. So obviously during the winter months, it's very crucial for a mercy vehicle to be able to get to where it's gotta go. We used to run snow chains on the rear wheel drive vehicles and there was a lot of issues with that. Um, you'd have to have an extra set of tires. Uh, they would, you'd have to call the mechanic in on overtime to put them on, call the mechanic in on overtime to take them off. Um, you couldn't exceed certain speed limits uh, because the chains would fall off and create body damage. There was a whole litany of reasons why it just, they don't work. How much more expensive are the sedan, are the uh, an SUV versus a sedan? In, How much more expensive is it? For example, in 2012, a Crown Victoria would cost the town about 22,000. Um, now with the SUV all wheel drives, they were about 28,000. So there is an increase, but certainly the, Flip side to that is, is you can't get those vehicles anymore, and now you're getting a much more utility type vehicle, more suited for what we need them for. And do you have a sense of how much it costs? Do they cost more to operate the SUVs as opposed to the sedan? It's actually less. They're better fuel mileage. We're, 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 we're probably gaining between three and four miles to a gallon increase because we're going from a V8 to a V6. So there is an, uh, an immediate savings, fuel savings. Um, and once again, you're saving, like I said, with the the chains and the and the two sets of tires, snow tires, and all this, uh, you know, switch over. We don't have to do that anymore. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, I think I addressed everything here. Once again, this is a this is a this is a way to be uh, back on track with the replacement program. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, when, when I first started, we used to replace two cars a year, uh, one of them. And then on the third year, we would replace an administrative car. We, we've been funding our administrative cars through other sources. Currently, uh, I believe two or, uh, three of our administrative cars have not been funded through the town. They've been funded through uh, other alternative sources, haven't cost the town anything. Our administrative fleet is... Um, Increasing mileage-wise, uh, we have, I believe, three cars administratively, which well over 100,000 miles. Um, those aren't being addressed now, and probably won't be in the future until a need arises. Um, right now, our main concern is the uh, the two patrol cars. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I think it's just a minor thing, but when I. I assume that the numbers that you had here and the, and the cost estimates, uh, that 94, 435 was the total of all these numbers here? Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, but I come up with uh, $790 less on that. That must be just a typo. Yeah, the math isn't. It could, it could have been a typo. Okay. Yeah. Just take that. 
And once again, we're, 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 uh, the radios are, are, are fine. In the, as far as the laptops are concerned, uh, we backed those out. We believe that there is still a lifespan left on those laptops. If they fail during the lifespan of the car, then we'll reassess replacing those. It just, I think what Jeff was saying is you get 56 and then 20, 21. Yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah. This is probably a typo on this, and I yeah, apologize. That's, that's so the total request for the small capital is 83644 That includes the two signboards, electronic signboards. So the, the numbers for the cruises are 56274 and the emergency equipment upfitting is 20771 So the total for all small cap is 83644 I think what happened here is that it was... Um, that was what we were originally going to pay, and it still doesn't add up, but the two numbers on the bottom, when we took those out, because we requested that they um, essentially talk to the lieutenant, we needed to um, save a little bit of money in order for our request to go through. So we took the um, laptops and the two-way radios out of it. Um, but this was more for a visual, and it clearly does not add up, because there's a number missing. Yeah, that's so, the concept. Yeah, the con it's the concept more than anything, but the, the actual request is, is for all of the small capital, including the cruisers, and the purchase of two power um, speed signs are 83644. It's not, not the fault of the Not to prolong this anymore, but I think that I was just looking it up. So the engine that comes with these, they do talk about an EcoBoost engine. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but is that what we're getting? I assume that's what we're getting. We do, we do not get equal to speed guys. Not getting enough. Either, no. That's an additional three or four thousand dollars more. Than oh, it is. None, none of our patrol cars have that. No. We currently have uh, three of the SUVs and one of the tours on the same platform. We have four cars on the same platform of what we're requesting. Half of them. Okay, so mm -hmm. there's some analysis to say not spending. Three thousand dollars because you don't think it's we'd ever get the return on that investment. To be quite honest with you, based on other communities, they're not testing as far as reliability and whatnot. We just, I just, I wouldn't feel comfortable. It, it's it's a much higher technology and ultimate maintenance cost down the road to get that engine. So, with these are early on. These, like I said, these have only been in service since 2013. I just think it's. Okay. And I'm not the only one. That's like I said. That's the standard. We're just not challenging you. Anybody that's buying a vehicle, we are going to try to push, to make sure they do the research. For yeah, buying and vehicle. it's. Yeah, I think it's something we do need to take a look at because of these are so new. Um, probably the data is not out there, but you know he gets the information. Um, he belongs to several different organizations that study right. the vehicle Makes fleet sense. maintenance. So um, certainly we'll take a look at it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Jonathan. Any reason why? Once again, they, they hold 60% of the national market for Ford SUV, which, you know, I'm not the, the Ford expert, but certainly if 60% of the, of the municipal and state agencies are going with that particular vehicle, there has to be a reason why. Um, the other manufacturers don't offer an alternative uh, as far as an all-wheel drive type vehicle in, in a midsize. Uh, Chevrolet doesn't offer one. And um, there were other, Boston police had, had tried to go back to the Chevy Impalas last year. Um, they did buy a, an initial allotment of them, stopped, they went all back to the Ford Explorers. Mass State Police just ordered 500 Explorers. Um, much bigger organization, a lot more uh, um, input. That, I remember the State Police actually belongs to the, the uh, it's a committee that Ford uses as far as how to design police vehicles. So um, for them to make the swap, the switch to all those SUVs, um, I think speaks volumes as far as what's the standard in the industry. Well, you only, to my understanding, there's only really three um, vehicle manufacturers that are making police intended cruisers, and that being Dodge, Chevrolet, and Ford. I'm not aware of Toyota producing any police vehicles. They do not make a speed rated vehicle. Oh, and Honda as well. You couldn't convert Honda Pilot into a, a police vehicle. Not that I'm aware of.
Okay. Um, so the next um, next slide talks about our goals and objectives for the upcoming year. Um, one of our requests is for um, electronic control weapons, which um, are known to be um, for the public to be tasers. Um, back in 2004, Mass General Laws permit permitted the use of electronic uh, control weapons by law enforcement personnel in the course of their official duties. So since that time, we've been preparing and studying um, the use of tasers, not only in Massachusetts, but um, throughout the country and, and also worldwide. Um, so with that, um, I've, I have the confidence and uh, the tangible proof that the, not only are uh, tasers or, or electronic control uh, weapons, um, they, they use worldwide in this country and the Commonwealth has been a resounding success. And I believe that, um, as you'll see through the presentation, um, clearly responsible for reducing injuries to officers, suspects, and, and increasing the overall safety to the public. Um, today I actually have um, somebody, um, a Baltimore police officer, here to um, do the demonstration. He has the, um, the institutional knowledge on, on tasers. Um, and as I read his biography, you'll understand why. It is lengthy, but um, I, I really feel as if it's important for the board and the committee to know um, who is presenting here before you. Um, officer Charles DeChar has been a police officer for the Wallachian Police Department for the past 26 years. Uh, for the past 22 years, he's been assigned to the NMLEX SWAT team. Um, and as many of you know, it's a multi-jurisdictional tactical team. It's responsible for responding to critical incidents uh, with the 62 season towns in the greater Boston and Northeast region of Massachusetts. Um, he's been involved in over 500 high-risk SWAT call-outs. He recently received a resolution from the city of Walton for his role in the Boston Marathon incident, as well as his role in the apprehension of both terror suspects during the Watertown events in 2013. He's a state and nationally certified instructor, trainer in the area of firearms, defensive tactics, use of force, physical fitness and patrol procedures. He holds the rank of a master instructor in the Commonwealth, as well as being a master instructor through Taser International. 2011, he received the distinction of being nominated for Master International Instructor by the Mananoc Safari Land Training Group. After training with officers from Switzerland and the UK, he became the 113th Master Instructor out of 52,000 instructors worldwide and 3,500 advanced instructors. He's been training police officers since 1999. He's trained in excess of 10,000 police officers as well as 500 law enforcement instructors across the country. He has trained the Colombian National Police Force as well as officers from Canada, Switzerland, England, England, and Singapore. He's a member of the Defensive Tactics Executive Board for the state and is a qualified expert in state courts as well as the um, United States District Court. He's currently the lead defensive track tactics instructor and firearms instructor at both the Lowell and Boylston Police Academies. So I'd like to uh, bring up Officer to charge to kind of give you a background on what um, taser, what taser actually is, um, and certainly he's here willing to answer any questions regarding it as well. <coughs> uh, there is a separate PowerPoint for this particular <coughs> presentation. I just uh, set that up. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come here. The chief had asked me to come here basically and talk a little bit about tasers. And, uh, and my role in training police officers and stuff, and then they answer any questions. So I'll keep it pretty brief. Uh, I'm a Waltham guy. I do have ties to North Reading. All my crazy relatives sold their double, triple deckers in Medford and bought uh, castles out here in North Reading. So <laughs> I still have dinner every Sunday with my 92-year-old grandmother over on Heritage Way. So I, I have a lot of friends and family in the area, too. So that's part of my motivation for coming here and stuff. Um, and as far as a master instructor, what that really means basically is I've been training police officers for years. Mostly in police, officer survival, self-defense, that type of stuff. And um, master instructor just means I train end users, but I also train instructors to, uh, to teach other instructors. So that, that's basically my, my role. I got on board with TASER in 2004. And basically 2004, EOPS, which is the Executive Officer of Public Safety, they allowed for the use of conducted electrical weapons in the state of Massachusetts. As of 2014, right now there's over 200 police agencies in Massachusetts County. So I think uh, statewide there's like 341 police departments. They're, going, they're gearing more towards tasers in the state, and uh, there's about, 
Uh, I think there's about 212 police departments uh, carrying them in Massachusetts. The goal and philosophy of TASER is to protect life. TASER has been studied extensively across the country, including IACP, which is the International Association of the Chiefs of Police, PERF, which is a police executive research forum, and the U.S. military. And uh, you know, just as, as far as as far as police use of force options, if you look at if you combine all the other options between chokeholds, police baton, pepper spray, if you added all them up and combined them, they haven't been studied as much as Taser. Like every organization that's done a major study on Taser. Um, the ones I'll probably stick to mostly is the Chiefs of Police and, and PERF. So PERF is Police Executive Research Forum, which is kind of a, a big, kind of a heavy hitter study group out of Washington, D.C. A lot of big chiefs are involved, and they look at different force options. And all the studies have come out with really the same thing, which is, which is facts, which is the use of TASER as a, as a force option, it, uh, it cuts down on injuries to suspects, it cuts down on injuries to police officers, and it cuts down on officer-involved shootings. Like, those are facts that I, I can't even debate with you because every study has said the same thing. Very similar to if, um, if I told you that seat belts and airbags cut down on injuries and uh, deaths, that would be a no-brainer. You couldn't really argue that fact. And that's what all the studies have said in TASER so far, is that it's an, it's an effective force option that cuts down on officer-involved shootings, and it cuts down on injuries to both, both good guys and bad guys. And that's pretty much the studies across the board. Um, conduct electrical weapons, and they, they, they call them ECW, CEWs. We, we refer to those mostly as TASER, because that's what the public is used to. But the conduct electrical weapons are designed to use propelled wires or direct contact to conduct electrical charge to primarily affect motor functions and also the sensory and motor nervous system. There's a couple different ways of getting hit with a TASER. Uh, I brought one. I'm not going to uh, break it out. I think when the chief saw you had a heart attack anyways, but I'm going to keep it a bit. It's, it's not a live taser, but um, operationally, I've shot people with tasers before. Uh, I've been shot myself uh, four times, not by choice. Uh, people ask me all the time what it feels like. The best analogy I can come up with is um, if you took, it's a five-second ride, so if you took 30 years of marriage and condensed them into five <laughs> seconds, <laughs> that's pretty much what it feels like. <laughs> just kidding. That's just tough. Kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> My wife's watching I'm it all. Yeah. I'm dead. But the way of really two ways of getting taste, they have a drive some which is similar to the old stun guns that you've probably maybe saw years ago, which is direct contact. I won't direct contact with the skin, which is causes mostly pain compliance. And then you can get shot with these two probes, which is basically a number eight. It's basically a small, tiny number eight fish hook that's straightened out. And you get shot with two probes. Electricity falls the path of least resistance, and you get the same thing, electrical five-second ride. It affects a uh, motor and central nervous system. Basically, the drive stun, which is strictly pain compliance, that affects sensory, but the, those two probes, that affects sensory, motor, and nervous system. So when you get, the easiest layman terms I can explain it, when you get hit with those two dots, um, it affects, it's painful, so it affects sensory, but it also affects, it's hard to make decisions. It's overloading the brain wave, so you can't really make decisions. When, you, when you're taking that taser hit, you can't really think of other things like fighting and all these other things. So, and the other thing, is, the third thing it does is causes involuntary muscle lockup, which they call it NMI, which is kind of a big word, neuromuscular incapacitation. And uh, it really just means involuntary muscle lockup, so that the police officer is able to control the suspect, but he can't bend his own arms and feet and things like that. So it really affects three ways when you hit with those two probes. So it affects, uh, sens uh, affects sensory and more than nervous system. This is just a quick training demo. That's where they call one like this and come up. Then you click on the lower mic. Just click on the book. Yeah, right there. No. Will the video come through? May or may not. Yeah, the video's right here. The video's behind that for some reason. Can you shrink that? Can you shrink that? Compatibility with the video. There's a, there's a mismatch with the, uh, 
Yeah. I need an upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Whatever version, probably the same. I was used. We get the point. <laughs> well, you said you have one with you? And yeah. Romy, uh, going to take Lieutenant game. Romeo. That was actually him crying on the video, but. <laughs> Tom, come on, take it for the team. <laughs> you tried the dog collar, didn't you, there, Jeff? Uh, I did, yeah, I tried it, yeah. Why don't you step up on this? Yeah, so, sure. Uh, while they're playing with it, <laughs> question wise. So, this device shame on looks me once. more like a revolver. Shame on you once, shame on me twice. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's a couple of different versions of it. There's, um, which, which I recommend that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking there's about the yellow that. version and the black. I couldn't the one I have is black because I used it for the squad. Uh, which which, which recommended by Perfect Machine like is this. to carry the yellow <laughs> version, which I think is what most writing is looking at, which is it just looks like a yellow contraption, so it doesn't really oh, resemble a firearm at all. And there's, there's two reasons for that. One is the only that there's, there's less chance of that sympathetic fire that you see an officer with one out, and everybody knows that yellow thing in his hand is, is an electrical weapon and not a firearm. So that's it's good for patrol in that point of view. And also, um, also it has that uh, people that have been hit with a taser, they tend to kind of uh, kind of look for it. And it's, so there's a lot, not a lot of recidivism. They'll, they'll see the taser on officer's belt, <laughs> and they don't want to get hit again. So. Uh, and it is true, it's, it's, it sounds funny, but it really is true. Departments have gone to Taser. Um, you know, sometimes, you, sometimes you go to the same residence here and there, and they'll look for that Taser, and a lot of times just by having it on the belt, it, it lowers your use of forces just based on that alone. It really does. Go ahead, uh, Officers carrying both weapons with them, the firearm and a Taser, is that the uh, requirement? Sir. Yes, sir. And the way Massachusetts does, Massachusetts is way more strict than other states. If so, when you, if you go home and Google Taser and I don't want to say other states, but maybe some uh, some some areas far away from here. It's uh, the taser. The, the guidelines on it strict. Massachusetts e ops is very strict on taser guidelines. So one of the big things they have is in Massachusetts it has to be a cross draw across your belt, across your body, away from your firearm. Right. So that there's no confusion of muscle memory stress. You have to reach across your right. body. So I think that's I think that's a pretty positive thing that Massachusetts does. Michael, you had a question after the video. Because this may answer my it's question. It's just a police officer getting trained. Okay. That right there is your ideal hit. One in the upper back, one right at the butt. Oh, yeah. Major muscle groups there. And the muscle muscle plays. If he wants to do anything, he can play you. Play you. Play you. Play you. That is your ideal spread. So that's basically just a demonstration of a five second ride and that, that officer jumped up and he was he was fine two seconds later. So it works, it's a lot of pain, but there's a, the, the chance of injury is a lot less. So because the fights tend to go a lot shorter, a lot quicker, and really is, is a game changer. So that's just showing a good positive hit. Post. So how do, how do our officers train once these items come in? I'll, uh, I'll probably let uh, Sergeant Dorsey uh, take over most of the training questions, but statewide it's kind of a, Situation that everybody gets trained to be a user in, the, in the, uh, electrical weapons, and then there's like a, a recertification process similar to firearms. Officers have to go out and shoot once a year or twice a year. Same as with Taser, they recommend that once a year everybody has to go through uh, like a four hour training block or eight hour training block where they go over the weapon, they go over a new case law coming out, um, they go over any changes in the law, and then they go over how to deploy them and fire a couple cops. Jeffrey, is it a one shot or a two shot thing? Because you said they, in the video they said he got two points. So are they shooting twice? They shooting once? Well, with the with the with the new weapons, basically if you you pull the trigger once and it deploys two dots. Okay. It's kind of okay. like a cartridge, uh, yeah, positive negative. So it fires two dots. With the X2, which is a new version, it's kind of like the Cadillac, the new version, the Taser, which they've put a lot of work into. Um, they buy they, it's it's a semi-automatic Taser, so you get basically two cartridges. So uh, with the old tasers, they would carry one on the end, and you have to do a, a reload type change. With the new ones, you basically pull the trigger. If that works, then you don't pull it again. But if you need to deploy it a second time, you can deploy it a second time. Because sometimes the dots, uh, they some, you have the clothing disconnect where it gets stuck in the clothing, or the dot breaks, or the wire breaks, so you have basically a backup shot. So every X2, you have uh, two cartridges. And, and basically, you know, a lot of people are afraid of electricity. It's like, I think it was like public speaking, fires, and, uh, and uh, electricity. People are afraid of electricity. So just to kind of low the way uh, that the deal is, you're getting, people hear 50,000 volts with tasers all the time, like 50,000 volts, 50,000 volts. It, it really is, when it, when it deploys out of the weapon, it's 50,000 volts, and I'm not, 
I'm an electrician, so don't start asking me a bunch of medical questions or electrical questions. I'm just a ham and egger cop, that's it, okay? But, uh, but the way it works is, um, is uh, by the time the electricity acts through barriers and clothing, they're really only getting between 12 to 1500 volts. But the, the voltage, it's the amperage that causes the, the problems and, and things like that. So the amperage is so low on a taser. And even since I've been, um, since I've been doing this, they're constantly trying to make the weapons safer and safer, and, and they really are. They have, a, they have a, I've been out to the headquarters in Arizona where they're always trying to lower the amperage, and even since I've started, they've lowered it down. So basically, this is this is a this is a wall outlet. And if you ever like myself, try to uh, stick the keys in the outlet as a kid and start up the house, and eat the leg thing. So, <laughs> so you stick the you stick the key or butter knife in the uh, outlet, and you get a shock, right? Nobody ever did that. Somebody else did. That's, That's why I'm bald, right? <laughs> so you get that shock, you go, holy, holy cow. Get in your hot pods over. That's uh, that's 16 amps. A Christmas tree bulb. Sometimes they blow up in your hand. That's one amp, and that's how much amperage is in a uh, is a tage is, is 0 0.0021. So it's high voltage but very low amperage. So that's why there's no you're not you know I hear in court all the time you electrocuted the guy, you shot the guy. That's that's not really the case. Okay, it's an electrical current that's five seconds long, but the amperage is extremely low. And this just gives you a little bit of a nomenclature what the weapon looks like. And again, uh, I think Believe North Reading is looking at the yellow ones. That's what I would you know, recommend for patrol, just because it looks a less, less like a firearm. And uh, it fires these two probes, attached to two copper wires, and that, uh, that sets a gun. It's just, again, that's, uh, that's the yellow version of it, and that's just showing the, uh, the different versions. Um, and really what this is, is it, it really is just a, it's a computer. It is a weapon, but it really is a computer. Everything is recorded in here. So, um, and you know, they, you just basically plug this into a computer and all the information is recorded on there. They make devices that have video cameras on there. Um, it's, a, it's a much more expensive weapon and I'll be honest with you, it's not, it's not really necessary because everything is recorded in there. So, uh, not that the police, if a police officer says he, he, sh he fired the weapon three times and you plug it in, it's gonna show how many times you fired the weapon, how long it took to hit, like everything is recorded in there. It's a very sensitive computer. Yes, what, what is the range of a Standard cartridge is basically a, t a 25 foot cartridge. They make different lengths, 25, 35, but in patrol, basic range is 25 feet because on a 25 foot cartridge, you can fire up to 25 feet away, but if something happens that you end up in too close, there's no over penetration. So it's the same, 25 foot cartridge is okay from here, and it's okay from, from me to you away. But standard cartridge, 25 feet, which lessens the chance of injuries versus batons or pepper spray because you have that distance in, in your advantage. Jonathan? If crime is being bullied, um, why do we need more tools? I'm sorry, say that again? If, if, if crime is bullying, it has been bullied for quite a while, like two decades, why do we need more, like, tools? I can, further in the presentation, you're going to see why. Um, we've had instances in North Friday, which side of the going to explain to, and maybe they'll give a better idea. I, I guess it has nothing to do with the primary. This has something to do with what we deal with on a daily basis. The rates can be, you know, the, the crime rates can tell you what's happening in the city of Boston. We're concerned about what's happening in the town of North Reading. So, speak the just, if you have any questions after Sergeant Bush is done with this presentation, then we can address them. Okay, I, I guess I just I have one other thing that is just generally about these. So, I know you say say that like they're they're there to replace other like mechanisms of force that are potentially more dangerous. But I'm just, I'm going to read you just like a paragraph from an article on police force in the Washington Post. And it says here, tasers were initially touted as a substitute police for lethal force, a way for cops to subdue violent suspects without killing them. Over time, however, they've become a compliance tool used to quell dissent, move nonviolent protesters, and punish people for talking back. A 2011 National Institute of Justice study found that cops use tasers too often and in, in inappropriate circumstances. While there is no national data on taser use, a 2012 Chicago Tribune report found that taser use by suburban police doubled between 2008 and 2011. In 2011, a New York Civil Liberties Union study found that nearly 60% of police taser incidents in that state did not meet expert recommended criteria for using the weapon. It's also <coughs> worth noting that Amnesty International has documented more than 500 cases in which a suspect died after being shot with a taser. So I guess my question is, is I just hope that like, if we do int introduce this to our community, that it just won't become, uh, the amount of 
threaten of violent force used against citizenry won't in general increase because there's lots of evidence that in the country that has actually occurred. Yeah, my, as far as the, I mean, that's one, that's one uh, reporter's uh, opinion, and as far as that, uh, as far as the taser cause and deaths, that's one of those, that's one of those facts that gets thrown out there um, that isn't necessarily accurate, okay? There isn't, there's no, uh, no they can't attribute it, when they look at uh, taser, when they look at police in custody deaths uh, across the country, um, there's, there's a bunch of factors that that happens, okay? And there's not, but when, but the way that, the way you read the article, the way that's written is that the taser, people get hit with a taser and that they're dying from the use of the taser, and that's not true. Same as if we went through with pepper spray years ago. We were told that pepper spray was killing people and then they came out with the facts that it wasn't happening, it was maybe a contributing factor as well as a bunch of other factors. And as far as the crime statistics, it's, it really is just one, uh, it's really just one person's opinion. I can just tell you, in terms of using them on the street and what I see in terms of training police officers, and they um, they absolutely positively cut down on injuries to good guys and bad guys. I never said it was to replace a force option. It's an additional, less lethal force option. Okay, and I've seen it on the street where it actually prevents uh, officer-involved shootings, and it's it really just another force option out there on the street. So, Paul, uh, we, we do have checks and balances in place. We have administrative staff that we use every use of force incident that we have. Um, and when we do review those incidents, we determine whether or not the use of force was justified. And if not, we take corrective action either through training um, or other corrective actions. As far as, as the tasers go, we have no plans to, this is not taking the place of anything. This is giving us another option um, because we've been in situations like I explained, Sergeant Bush will talk to you a little bit about it, but we have no options other than putting our hands on people and it's caused injury. So we will address that a little bit further and I, I would like to get a copy of that study to see who authored it and certainly take a look at it. Um, not that I, I've never seen that report, um, but anybody can make a report to either justify or, or be opposed to something. Um, so you know, we'll take that into account, certainly taking a look at it. And just so, just so across the board, just so, uh, like I mentioned, Massachusetts, there is there is different different guidelines state to state, and Massachusetts is probably not shocking. There's pretty strict guidelines on, on the taser, and as far as where 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 police taser use falls, use of force, not to teach a class in use of force, but basically it's, it can only be used on certain individuals, and the drive stun can be used on people that are actively resisting arrest, and the probes can be used on people that are assaultive, combative individuals, and those are the state guidelines. So. That's, I can speak of Massachusetts. Those are the guidelines in Massachusetts. So you can't use it as a pain compliance tool just to get somebody to do, to, to, to do something that they don't want to do. You can't use it as a tool of punishment. There's very strict guidelines. You can use it on assaultive, combative individuals, and that's what, that's what the executive office of public safety said. Yes, isn't the purpose of a taser to minimize the use of a more lethal weapon? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The last statistic I saw was uh, they call them a safe. And you know, myself and Sergeant Dorsey can speak on this. You know, a, a scenario where it could have been an officer involved shooting, that it didn't have to be an officer involved shooting, i.e. a person, suicidal person, and then you hit him with a taser and you take him into custody. That person could have possibly been shot, they'll call that a save. And the last statistic I saw was uh, the Rose Bowl, in terms of saves, the Rose Bowl could be filled plus 10,000. So, that, and those are, those, are, those are facts. Just one point on, on something that jumped out at me when we talked about using the taser to move protesters along. Um, I don't know the situation which they're referring to. If they're blanketing, I'm sure certainly that there was some discipline that followed if that was the case, because that's clearly not what the intent here is. We have a use of force uh, continuum here in our department, and, and, and we measure based upon every incident um, whether or not that use of force was justified. Um, clearly, just in, as a, you know, if you're talking about moving protests along, it's clearly not the, what the intended use of it is, and, and certainly wouldn't be allowed. Um, so I kind of question that that one statement that this does not make sense. I can't imagine any law enforcement officer just using it to move people along. It's not what it was intended. And when, and when a police officer does, you know, they get they get trained. Uh, a big part of the training is we teach how to use it, but more importantly, when to use it. Because the when to use it also involves what, when not to use it. So there is there is extensive training that goes in with them when you can use it. When
this is just a uh, video. This is Big Mike. He's a uh, convicted felon. The police. He's well known to the police. He's about six four, three hundred pounds, and we use it just to show change in behavior. We can live without it. Yeah, we can we can live without it. Resistant as far as not uh, giving the officers his hands, and they elect to use a taser on him. He's tasered, he goes down to the ground, and after that point, he's, he's more than compliant. He, he can't do enough to, to help the officers out. Um, again, it's just a use of force option. Um, again, my name is Sergeant Paul Dorsey for North Rank Police, and I was just asked to briefly go over some situations that we've seen locally and across the country where. A taser has been deployed, uh, as well as our plans for moving forward. Wilmington Police uh, recently had a uh, report of a man wielding a knife on the Wilmington Train Center. The man allegedly attacked two people at the commuter rail station. The subject also attacked responding officers with a knife. After a 25-minute standoff, the officers attempted to subdue the subject with pepper spray and a 40-millimeter uh, sponge round. The subject was eventually taken into custody when a responding officer from the Nemlock SWAT team used a taser to take him into custody. The uh, Wilmington Police reported that two officers were injured during the incident. Salem, New Hampshire, Salem Police used a taser to subdue a driver who jumped out of his car and attacked an officer during a traffic stop. Freetown, Mass, officers used a taser to disaim, disarm a knife-wielding woman who had already slashed her son and tried to keep the police at bay by waving knives at them. And then uh, Utica, New York, a 15-year-old. So officers used a taser to disable a deranged 15-year-old who had rushed at them, brandishing two knives. The boy had recently stopped taking his uh, psychiatric medication. So all of those incidents uh, are bad, not bad people, but people having a bad day. And use of force, as far as a firearm, was justified in every one of those situations. But like Officer Deschar had already said, those are considered saves because a life wasn't taken. Uh, an ulterior method was used, i.e. the taser. Uh, we're not trained to you know, shoot to wound people or anything like that. So the taser gives us an opportunity to disable people uh, so we can effectively take them into custody without us getting hurt or without them causing any further injury. And our last incident, it was in North Reading. Uh, we had an emotionally disturbed person off his medication for some time. He had made threats to hurt himself and his family. 
Eventually, nine officers had arrived on scene at this residence to help try to take the subject into custody. Pepper spray was used. Pepper spray can be effective on some of the population, and sometimes it's not very effective. In this instance, when pepper spray was deployed, all of the officers around him were subjected to the spray. So it, it causes effects. Uh, there's also a decontamination process that goes through. So this would have been a, a good um, application. So after a short standoff with the subject, he was eventually taken into custody. Basically, they kind of bum rushed him and, and, and grabbed hold of him, which could cause injuries to us as, as well as to him. The uh, So uh, you asked as far as training. For the initial end users, our offices will be an eight hour initial training, and then it's four hours each year after that to recertify with the tra uh, taser. Each taser will be signed out by the officer. Uh, we'll have uh, compatible holsters on their duty belts already, so they'll sign it out, put the uh, taser on their duty belt and go off, and then when they return back from the end of their shift, they'll re-sign the taser back in. And the tasers will be uh, used a correction of tasers will be purchased using an assurance program, which once you pay out for the tasers, it allows you to buy uh, new tasers, or excuse me, replace the tasers after five years with brand new models. And, uh, so myself, Officer DeCharo, or the Chief, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Mr. Prisco and Mr. O'Leary. Just from the training standpoint, uh, the labor hours associated with this training, Chief, is it in the budget? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Steve, uh, so you're not looking to, uh, so they'll be deployed by shift, so not everybody's going to have them. It's, uh, are all the patrol officers going to be carrying them on the shift? Yes. Or is it, yes. So everybody will have one. Is but that's not, uh, originally we looked at outfitting the whole department, um, but it, you know, the cost was getting up there, so we decided that we would have a sign-off process in place, mm -hmm. so each officer will be issued it at their shift. I do remember that the, the, the tasers were actually purchased. Um, I'm not sure why the chief did not implement the program. But I'm not sure that they were they were actually purchased, so they were town funds were used to purchase. And I still have the taser that's that was purchased. So I'm not sure why it was just never implemented. You're talking about a single taser? A single one taser, correct. Um, so just, just in summary, of, as far as the, the tasers go, um, we're, not, we're not looking to, to replace anything. And I have to be honest with you, I have a baton. I've used it once in my career for 21 years. Um, they do have a use, but in order to use your baton uh, on a suspect who is being combative, you need to be within three feet of him, which means that he has access to your weapon. He has, he has the ability to cause harm to you as well. Um, the taser is, is an option where the no an officer can take a step back, and if the, the subject is not complying, then he can utilize that tool. If we go from, from baton and, and the use of force is escalated, because we're so close and, and, and a suspect could grab my gun, now we're at deadly force option. We have no other options. Um, so this, this is a, you know, and it all comes down to training um, and policy, and, and we've already had our policy approved through the Executive Office of Public Safety, which has to be um, based upon the law itself. Um, so, and, and, and uh, Sergeant Torsi talked about one incident in North Riding. We've had many incidents um, where I'm concerned as a chief that we're going to run out of <coughs> options, um, and that you know we have people that are, are um, as as he described, you're having a bad day, but the bad day is caused by whether it's emotionally deep, disturbed, um, drug issues. Um, it, it, there's a lot that goes into it. So um, having just a, a baton and spray and a firearm, um, I'm not I'm not liking our options when we're dealing with people that that are just having a bad day. Uh, but we also deal with, with um, criminals that are, they don't want to go to jail. Um, you know, a particular person, six foot four, I'm not taking him down by myself. It's not going to happen. And if he decides that he's going to fight, um, I'm probably going to lose. Um, 
MMA fighters. There's, there's a lot out there that we have to deal with on a daily basis, and um, this I feel is is our best, at least, option for another tool. Um, and, and like you said, it's a computer. It, it's it's not. This was not available to us before. Had it been, I don't know if we would be using pepper spray today. Um, you know, certainly something we're going to be looking at down the road. If there's no need for us to use our pepper spray in the future, we'll eliminate it. Um, but there still is that need for, for I think, both. Did we ever have beanbag? Uh... We do have. And part of what we, um, one of our goals from last year, that's what the munitions training was. So we do have that. That's not something you carry with you. Um, that would be, if we had an incident, an officer would come in, go to the station, get it, and bring it out to the scene. Um, and, and these guys are, are, are experts at it. They could explain more. Um, it works in certain circumstances, but if there's a big guy, it's probably not going to affect them too much. Very similar to pepper spray. It just doesn't, I mean, people put it on their sandwiches. It just does not affect some people. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. The subject in Wilmington, they did try essentially to fortify the portability. 40 millimeter bean bag. Mm -hmm. They did deploy that on him, um, but someone who is, like the chief said, on drugs or, or emotionally disturbed, they're not feeling that pain right away. So the bean bag is more of a pain compliance mm -hmm. to have the person do what you want them to do. And sometimes it's, that disconnect is just not there. Whereas the taser, they may not want to do what you want, but they're not going to physically be able to do what they want because of the, the muscular lockup that it, it creates on them. So it's just a safer alternative to physically kind of lock them up using a taser as opposed to making them pain compliant with any other options. But as I said, now Wilmington does not have taser. There was a NEMLEC officer that came in from another community. That's that, correct. Right. And Wilmington, I believe, has it in their budget this year to get tasers. Chief? Okay, um, so I'll, I'll just briefly talk about our Safer Roads campaign for, for the upcoming year. As we talked about placing the um, signboard and hotspots enough to reduce speeding and aggressive driving. Uh, we're also going to be working with the, um, the school system to educate young drivers on the dangers of distracted driving, um, most prominent being texting. Um, we'll continue to do selective enforcement um, as a means to educate as well. Um, a lot of our officers do stop people and may not give a citation, um, but we want to, um, you know, have, essentially the goal is to have people comply with the laws, not to, to um, just punish. Um, we'll continue to work with the schools and private businesses on, on bicycle safety as well, um, and continue to use social media to educate and make residents aware of various traffic safety issues. Um, we're also working with the bus company that, that um, services the um, schools on continued safety of bus drivers and students. <coughs> the, uh, the next goal, um, I'll just briefly go over this. Um, over the next couple of years, I'm going to be working with the town administrator and developing and implementing a multi-purpose succession plan. Um, you know, it's very important for us to prepare the leaders of the future. Um, I know it's one of my um, primary responsibilities and, um, and our offices that are, are in positions of leadership. Um, you know, essentially it's important for us to foresee any vacancies within the department um, so we can ensure an efficient transition. Um, it's by identifying key department roles such as the chief of police position, lieutenant sergeants, and detectives, school resource officers, and safety <coughs> officers, and then identifying the key job dimensions and developing training around all of that um, and implementing that. Um, so that we're prepared for now and for uh, the future of the agency. Um, so the last, and I, and I know I skipped over this when, I talk, when we were talking about um, um, our goals and objectives of, of last year. And, you know, I've had this, as we all know, for the last three years, um, it's been one of my primary objectives, and, and it continues to be, and, and I can't foresee it going away any time. Um, and that's to minimize the overall social impacts of illicit, illicit drug use. Um, more specifically, at this point, our, our biggest um, problem in quality of life problem is, is opiate abuse. Um, and certainly that's not to um, lessen the impact of other drugs and alcohol um, and tobacco use by our, our young kids, but um, you know, over the last year, we've seen a significant impact on the community as, as far as heroin use goes. So 
over the last year, we've um, continued to maintain relationships with, with many of our uh, law enforcement partners, and our detectives and patrol force have, have made significant strides in, in trying to um, minimize the problem of illicit drug use. Um, these guys have worked very hard, um, and you know I think we're making an impact, um, but we're looking at the statistics, and it's just not looking like it is. And, it, and it's not certainly just our um, responsibility. There's, there's more responsibilities that have to be shared throughout um, not only the um, state, but throughout the um, uh, federal government as well. So, and I'll talk a little bit about um, statistics, because I think it's pretty compelling to hear what um, some of the statistics, and even putting them together, I, I was um, a little bit um, more shocked than I was um, when I was seeing it um, throughout our community. So um, last year we saw in the geographical region, not only here in, in Massachusetts, but the whole Northeast saw a dramatic rise in heroin overdoses, more specifically heroin overdose deaths. Um, and it was so dramatic that the governor put together a task force to try to um, try to see what they could do to try to control um, the problem at the time. And our newly elected governor has done the same thing recently, formulating a 16-member task force um, to formulate a statewide strategy. Um, last year, in Middlesex County alone, there were 146 drug-related deaths. Um, 103, I believe, to involve heroin. Comparing those numbers to 2013, um, there were 80 reported overdose deaths, and um, 33 of them believed to be involved heroin. In 2012, there were only 65 overdose deaths. Um, and I say only because of the 100% the, um, increase um, in overdose deaths since 2012. So far this year, and this is according to Mass State Police, there have been 64 um, suspected heroin death, heroin, heroin overdose deaths um, throughout the state. And the reason why the state police have that statistic is there. Um, they're required by the um, state police and the DA's office to attend um, all overdose deaths as well as any unattended deaths. Those statistics do not include Boston, Springfield, or Worcester. Um, in Boston, these numbers are, are probably double that. Our immediate area, um, the Woodman District Court, has been especially hard. Um, a lot of that is due to the mixture of prescription pills, heroin, and fentanyl. Um, and for those of you who don't know what fentanyl is, um, it's a painkiller. It's estimated to be at least 80 times more potent than heroin. Um, last year in North Reading, we responded to an investigator four fatal overdoses, um, one, of it, what, one of which was an eight-month-old pregnant female. Um, the woman and her child um, died. We also investigated an additional nine non-fatal overdoses which were a complete um, increase from our 2013 numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, those are those statistics are um, what we know. There, there, there were a lot of saves by our department with Narcan and the fire department, um, but a lot of, of the community um, families with people with heroin um, addictions are now carrying Narcan as well. Um, and we do not respond to those because um, sometimes they're um, you know, they've recovered by the time we get this, so the family just do not notify us. So the, the statistics are skewed, um, and um, like I said, we, we're doing our best to try to track that. Um, but why the question, I know that uh, Mr. Prisco kind of talked, alluded to before about um, us not sharing that information with the public. Um, and, you know, this information is medical information, and, and in order for us to um, protect the privacy rights of, of residents, um, we, we do not report those on, in our public law. Um, it's just something we don't do, and, and sometimes the law, like I said, prohibits us from doing that. But today I feel that it's important for the board to know and the finance committee to know that these numbers did happen here in North Reading. Um, it's time to bring this problem back out to the forefront. It's not a North Reading problem. Um, I've been working with our local leaders, um, town administrator and the chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Um, we're working with our representatives, um, the Attorney General's office, the Governor's office, anybody we can bang the door on that will answer. We are working to try to get involved 
how we can try to impact the problem where it needs to be impacted. And we can't control the laws. Um, we can't control the flow of drugs into our communities. Um, all we can do is, is, is act on the information we have. Uh, this, is a, uh, um, this is a problem that's very mobile. Uh, and, and, and we're hearing now that it's not just the Northeast, it's across the whole country. Um, the federal government has to get more involved. We have to come up with stronger laws. There has to be um, more education in, in our schools. And there also has to be better treatment options um, because the treatment options that are available now, they're there, but they're not working. Because as we can see, our, our, since 2001, when we had, um, we knew about our major drug problem. And then in 2004, five, and six, when we lost six of our local kids to the heroin, um, the opiate addiction, we saw a decline at some point, but now we're back. So we're, we're, we're back at, at numbers that are just um, jumping off the charts. So whatever is happening and whatever we're doing as a society is not working. Um, there are many articles that are out there. There's an article that was in the Boston Globe at the end of January that hits it right on the head and, and says that we're 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 behind the eight ball in this. And, and there's, there's, you know, we need to have more people involved with it and look at this as a as a major crisis. Um, we've we've seen too many families in North Riding affected by it. Um, and I know that the government rallies when we, we have a crisis, and, and, and I get it, but I, I, I have to say this is probably the biggest crisis we've faced in my career, um, and, and, and it's not gonna go away, and it's just gonna get worse. So, um, but what we're doing on the, on the local fronts, um, we're gonna be looking at um, more education for our youth, because that's where, where it starts, um, and, and we, we understand that. So um, Amy Lockowitz um, has, on behalf of the North Rand Community Impact Team, applied, or is applying, I'm going through the process now, um, of applying for a grant, which essentially would um, give the town of North Reading $125,000 over five years um, with an option to reapply for five years that would provide us um, with the tools to essentially get in and educate our, our school age kids on the dangers of, of using um, illicit drugs as well as prescription drugs, tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana. Um, so the grant requires science-based education for the public and the students as well as utilizing the seven strategies of community change. Um, I do have a handout which, which um, I can hand out to you just so you can have it. Um, it does talk about what the seven strategies are. Um, so we're submitting this grant um, in March. I think it was March 18th, right around that date. Um, and we would, um, not sure exactly what, what the um, response date will be, but uh, my understanding is sometime in September. Um, so we, like I said, we would be able to reapply Thank for you. that after five years. So if we were to get this Thank grant, you, um, we would, the town North Reading would benefit from $1.25 million. Um, and like I said, this is for education purposes. And um, if you look at the, the left-hand side of the screen, it talks about 12 mandatory sector representatives. Over the last year, um, the Community Impact Team, once we decided that this was something that was worthwhile to, um, to look at, we um, went out and, and essentially got volunteers from all those organizations. We have youth volunteers, we have parent volunteers, businesses, a lot of people involved that have really um, done a lot of the behind the scenes work. And like I said, Amy Lockowitz has been working um, very, very hard in trying to um, make sure that, that we're gonna be very competitive for this grant. Um, so that's one, of, that's one of the things that we're going to be doing locally. Um, but one of the, I think it's collaborating with other law enforcement entities, um, leaders in, in our uh, state office, um, state offices, the district attorney's office, um, the executive office of public safety, and the attorney general's office. Because I think that they need to really hear from, from the people that are actually out there um, dealing with this on, on a daily basis. Um, I met with the district attorney last week as um, part of my position with the Middlesex um, Chiefs of Police Association, and, and she's done a lot of great work. Um, 
of my discussion with her is that it's not filtering down to the communities. And a lot of what's happening at the state level is not filtering down to the communities. So we need to open up that communication um, line again and, and try to try to look at this um, and look to see what we've been doing that's not working and try to um, adjust some of the strategies so we can make an impact on this. Anybody have any questions on the <coughs> Michael and Jeff? Thanks for the information, and, and I'm glad we're out having a discussion about this topic um, because it does frustrate me quite a bit. You know, you go and look at global warming, and we've invested so much money at a federal level on global warming, and look outside, it's crazy, right? I mean, this is an area that we it gets neglected, and I think the focus of training is fine, but I think we're missing the boat as a community, all the local communities. We need to find a solution to provide treatment. There are people that are sick right now. You know, you mentioned the flawedness because we have Narcam out there, which frustrates me because it does flaw these statistics because Narcam seems to be getting used more and more. And, and I was gonna ask the chief earlier, maybe we can't talk about it in an open forum, but how many times have our guys had to go out and administer Narcam? How many of your guys had to go out and administer Narcam? That is a serious statistic. We should talk about it. Because that tells the story. The problem exists. And we're keeping these people alive because they're not camp. But we need to get them the help. We can train, we can educate all you want. But if we don't have a solution to, to get these people into treatment facilities, have a process. With all those local communities you have up there, we should have a process that we use that we can all work together in to get these people into a system. Am I, I mean, am I way off the market here? No, you're not, and, and, I, and that's the unfortunate part of it. We don't have much control, and that's why we're reaching out to um, people that do make those decisions or can influence that process. Um, this does not include any treatment. This is just an educational grant, um, but we are working towards that end of it. And, you know, the, the jury's out on treatment. I mean, you know, we're, we've seen on our end of it, I'm, and I know that treatment does work, but we're seeing them go into treatment and come back and out and use went to treatment, come back out and use. And when I said that there's something broken, we need to address that with the, the people that are making the decision to say, okay, well, if they're going to treatment, why are they back out here again? So we're not, we're dealing with the symptoms. We're not dealing with the problem. So you, you're, you know, and that, and that becomes, a, I mean, it, as we all know, you know, people that are clean, you know, the overdose deaths happen when people are clean for a certain period of time and then they go back to using the same, the same dose. And, and um, but there's also uh, an increase um, in, in the purity of heroin as well as mixing with other drugs that are causing the overdoses as well. But, um, you know, we're not involved in those discussions. I have to be honest with you that I'm disappointed in the governor's task force. There's not one police chief on the, on the, on the task force, and there's not one governor on the task force, I mean, one DA on the task force. That's disappointing to me because, and I've been reaching out to the governor's office, um, and I'm going to continue, um, but it's just, it's not Thank that you. they, they just need to, we just need to touch base and we need to be heard. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. I, I guess, Michael, uh, I mean, what we can do, and it relates back to this grant, is, is to educate, do a better job of educating our youth so they don't fall into the trap. Um, there's a market out there for heroin, right? And that's why the dealers are, uh, are able to uh, supply uh, these drugs to people who get addicted and that's one part of the problem we can't necessarily fix on our own but if we can prevent future youths from falling into that trap we're reducing the overall market and at some point it may have an effect and, you know we've had long discussions about this uh, in CIP because it's, it's you know it's very very frustrating and we can't do things uh, the chief talks about, you know, uh, arrests that they make, and they, they go in the door, and then they go to rehab, and they're there for a day, and they're out. And uh, uh, you know, those are laws and things that uh, our legislators have to deal with. Uh, I mean, we can we can make a lot of noise about it, but unless some action is taken, uh, all that we can do is try to prevent our future youth from falling into this trap. Well, for, I, I'm looking at it a slightly different, and, and it does relate back to a budget issue. T 
today we can't go out to the public and say, if your son or daughter or your husband or your wife or someone within your family has an issue, drug issue, we have a way. We, you can come here privately. We can get you into a, a place, a facility that will help treat you. That to me seems more powerful than this education process. And we don't have that. We don't have a way to tell the community we have this in place to help your kids. Instead, because the kids don't think it exists out there, so they're going to continue to keep using it, or the adults continue to keep using it, because they don't know where to turn. They get this problem. But I would love us to be able to create a program that, that we invest in that we can get these people help. You're right. We're not going to, they're going to get in and get the help. Maybe not all of them will get fixed. Maybe they'll fall off the wagon, but maybe there's a few that we can save. And and we haven't you haven't answered my question about the Narcam, and I would appreciate that. But we can finish this discussion as well. Right. So we had Jeff had a yeah. question, Jonathan, and then Abby. Jeff. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, Chief, I think when you first came on board, this was a top priority of yours, right. and I, and I I want to commend you for that for pursuing it and, and being dogged about it. So I think uh, North Reading is well served because of your efforts. Efforts. Um, I think that if uh, information becomes knowledge and knowledge becomes power and that power is the the ability to solve problems that come before us you know I, I wonder about uh, the choice or the decision about reporting versus not reporting um, in all of the efforts that that the police do uh, they may go in front of the schools and the seniors and, and the middle school and so on and and lecture and usually when a, a student is sitting there that it's just sound sometimes it's just it's just an echo of, of noise um, so I I wonder that if you reported what happens in the paper and the more people see that it's happening the more believable it becomes my suspicion is that community-wide I'm not sure people are, are really aware how bad the situation is that you're describing. So therefore, if you're echoing in meetings such as this uh, and, and lecturing in, 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 in at the schools, then I'm not sure it's being heard because it's not being felt. And I think that's very important. That's one of the, the values of, of the use of the media is to get that information out so that we know it's really there. It was in black and white. There was a call. The police blog is, is longer on this. Uh, it, 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 I guess one of the fears is, well, we don't want our town to look <laughs> that bad because compared to other towns, if they're not reporting it. But our, uh, to, to Mike's point, our concern is to solve the problem. And, and information is knowledge, and knowledge is power, and power is the way to solve, uh, is, the, is the route to solve uh, these types of problems so that when you go out to the community you get the community more involved because they really now see it so that that was my thinking on the choice of whether you report or don't report so and I, I don't disagree that like I said there are laws that prohibit us from from logging certain information for the press um, but I don't disagree with you and I've had a conversation with the town administrator regarding this um, and, and the chairman of the board is, is how much information do we get out? How do we get this information out? Uh, we have in the past done um, drug awareness seminars for the community, and we, can, we, we plan on doing that in the future. Um, you know, it, and I've had conversations in the budget sessions regarding it, and, but it's probably not enough. And we're only going to be able to help minimize this. We're not gonna solve it. It's, it's, right. it's beyond, our, beyond where we are. Uh, we have control over it, and, but to get the community involved and get the community to help us um, solve the problem. That's, that's the only way we're going to be able to make a dent in it. Um, so I agree with you, and we are coming up with a strategy to try to get the information out without violating um, citizens' personal rights. Jonathan, you had a question? Okay, so I just want to say that I'm really glad that your taking a really conscientious approach to this, and so I, I just want to say that. Um, 
So I guess um, I have a few concerns. The first thing is that, um, so I, 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 I believe all the time in Boston Global House, we have some kind of opiate crisis, I, I believe that. Um, however, I do know that drugs of choice have come up and down. So there have been times when cocaine, cannabis, methamphetamines, and LSD go, go in and out of fashion. And we've had a drug problem in the United States probably at least since the 1970s as a consequence of the Vietnam War and some drug use even before that. So I guess I would be interested to know, okay, so what's the per capita illicit drug use? The uh, reason why I'm, and, 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 I, and, and I don't think we should ignore it. And, there, and, and continuing on with that, the reason why um, I'm concerned is that I, I would guess that part of the reason why this education doesn't work is because there's a lot of exaggeration. So there, there was a thing, I, so I should just say I'm a biochemist, and so I actually understand the science of this. And so I've, um, and I've actually taken courses that have looked at the biochemistry of these drugs. And they aren't as bad, and they aren't as dangerous as people let on. And we have far bigger risks in our society, like the fact far more people died from not having adequate health care, health insurance, than, than this thing. Far more people die because of other problems in their lives. Not that I'm minimizing it, but I think if you just, 1980s had this famous campaign, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. And you tell these kids, you know, just one little bit of, you know, some opioid and you're gonna be addicted. And then they take it and they're not addicted. Um, you lose your credibility. So I think that when you, I think exaggerating um, doesn't help. And so I think it should be a bit more scientific. Um, talking about science, oh, can, I can, I just, can, can I just, sorry, if you I, I, I'm gonna have to respond. Okay, okay, go ahead. Heroin, you can't study that as a scientist. It's impossible because you don't know where it's coming from. And unless you're testing the drug after the fact that it's seized from the police, you don't know what's in it. There's rat poison in it. There's fentanyl in it. There's a mixture of many different drugs in there. So there is no science when it comes to heroin. It's that simple. Okay, so if you're talking about what it's coupled with, then yes, I'm aware that there but that's, are But there is no process for it to be inspected by anybody. And I can tell you that the heroin, that we're, we're finding different compounds in heroin all the time. So when you're saying that it's over-exaggerated, I have four people that died in North Reading last year. That's an over, not over-exaggerating. If you talk to the families in town that have kids that are addicted to heroin, they're going to tell you that it's not over-exaggerated. No, I, I, no, I understand you. Now, if you're talking about the 1970s and, and then putting an egg on, on a commercial and saying this is drug frying the brain, I wish more people listened. We wouldn't be in this predicament that we're in right now. Okay. Um, I, 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 there's not much I can say. I, I, I can only say what I can say. I think a little less of almost to take the emotion out of it would be better. Um, I completely understand and I agree with you. What you're saying is correct about the, the poisons that it's cut with. Um, but uh, I would argue that the, the general tenor of how dangerous drugs are is not supported by the evidence. There was a famous study in the 1970s that was, that, was, um, that was commissioned by the Carter administration that proposed the legalization of marijuana in the 1980s because of a huge uptick in crime associated with drugs that completely fell away. Um, I would say dispassionate medical evidence indicates that we shouldn't criminalize marijuana as a consequence. Not that I think that any of these drugs are great, and I would rather that nobody took any of them recreationally. I have no particular personal affinity for any of them. Um, but I would like to say that in terms of to be optimistic, so I'm aware that in the field they're developing currently vaccines for some of these drugs. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, but right now they're in medical testing. Um, so um, what they're doing is that they can create um, a vaccine so that when someone is given this vaccine, they no longer get the high from that particular drug. And I would, um, and I'm pretty certain that within 10 years' time this will be approved by the FDA. So I just want to say that, that this, this is a huge breakthrough, and I personally, in context, I personally am aware of, uh, of the research team that's doing this. So that's a really, really big deal, because in the future, you get a vaccine, someone's a drug addict, they take it again, they don't get the high, they just won't do it. They might do something else. Yeah. I have to interrupt you there. That, that's not accurate, because right now, 
people that are using heroin are not doing it to get high anymore. They're doing it to survive. There's a, there's a dose that they take just to feel like me and you do today. Because if they don't take heroin, there's a breakdown. And, and their bodies are, they, they can't get up in the morning. Their muscles are sore. So, and this is from interviews personally with people that are addicted. The, 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 the respiratory system, the, all the other physiological things that happen when you, can, when you ingest or inject opiates into your body, that you cannot stop that with what you're saying. So that's not going to stop our overdose deaths, and it's not going to stop people from using just uh, because okay. they're, hold on a minute, they're addicted to the drug. Okay, what you're talking about is dependence. And dependence can, uh, okay, so there's, there's two issues here. There's one is the height, and the other thing is dependence. So yes, they are dependent, but they can be weaned off. And the issue is, is that once they're weaned off, they'll still get high. If someone can go to treatment for long enough, three to six months, and be off it, they can try to take it again, but if they've been given this vaccine, they won't get high and they won't get dependent again. Um, I actually know someone who's conducting some trials with some young adults, and it's been quite successful. So um, I would reserve judgment until you've actually seen it. But I know what you're talking about, so you've got to deal with the issue of dependence, and that's something else as well that I wanted to talk about. And that is, so, I, would, I really hope, so I would ask this town to at least consider in the future to put aside some money for treatment. And so I don't know who, who suggested that. But I personally, I don't know them very well, but I know someone who um, has an alcohol problem. And they just, their problem is they're just addicted to alcohol. Um, and they're drunk all the time, and it's ruined their life, and they've got in trouble with the law. And I said, why don't you get treatment? And they were like, I would, I, but I don't have the ability to go to a program where they can help me. Um, they, they're not eligible. Their insurance won't cover it, they're just out of options. So I would say that there are a lot of people who do want help, who can't get help, because we don't have a system in this state to do such a thing. So I would, I don't know what it would cost, but I almost would wish that like, at some point this town could even try like, a, a pilot program where you put $100,000 aside. Maybe we can only help 10 people, 20 people, I don't know. Or maybe only five people, and we can at least see how effective um, how effective that is. I also can I just to touch on that point. So there are programs out that are out there to help people. Uh, we and I was going to speak to this um, when you were finished, but we do refer people to treatment, which is sometimes covered by the programs themselves. So we have we have the resources to refer people. It's getting people to come to us. Is, is the bigger problem because there's a lot that goes with it. Is number one, they probably don't want us to know that they're addicted to heroin or opiates or any other drug. Um, but there's a lot of shame involved, and and I don't know how we get over that. Um, I had a family member that was addicted, and the and the family did not want to come forward because they didn't want anybody else to know. So they tried to mask that. So. There are problems that are out there. Are they the best? That's what I said. I don't know if they're the best because we continuing to, um, the statistics are going up, they're not going down. So there needs to be something more done. But I wanted to touch on one other thing. I, I talked to the Middlesex County Sheriff a couple of months ago. He, they interview every, every inmate that comes in. 82% of the inmates that were interviewed said they were on drugs when they committed their crime. That's a staggering number. I, 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 and but you were, you were saying that it's, you know, the, that using drugs does not cause other problems. We see it almost, I don't want to say all, but it's pretty close. Are the crimes that we investigate somehow, somewhere tied to drugs? I believe, I believe you, you, what you're saying is true and I don't dispute that. I'm talking, I, 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 very briefly, the, that's not, the, what you're saying is true, a very, very high percentage of antisocial behavior is because people are on some kind of recreation of drug or alcohol. I completely accept that. What I'm trying to say is that there is this perception that society is on the verge of falling apart. And, you know, if drug abuse just goes up a little or, uh, uh, higher, all hell will break loose. And yet, GDP hasn't fallen apart. And there are other problems that kill far more people. And the, in the 1980s, we had a raging drug problem. And our homicide rate was double what it is right now. And we have the lowest, one of the lowest mur per capita murder rates in the history of the history of reported crime in the United States. And crime continues to fall. So it's not that I'm saying we shouldn't take this seriously. I think we should have treatment. What I'm saying is we need to kind of look at this in perspective and say, 
we are not having, like, all hell is not breaking loose. This is an area where antisocial social behavior is falling. Even amongst adolescents, amongst children, they are less, like, they did studies, they found that actually, they're actually more likely to listen to a person on authority than the 1970s. I, I don't really wanna, I, 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 that's not my, that's something that I know about. But what I do wanna say is in terms of what to do with these people. So, they come to you, I don't know what the situation is with in terms of like the criminal aspect of it, but I think it might be useful if somebody could say, look, I haven't been caught doing drugs, but I know I have a drug problem, and I'm doing this illegally. I wish that they could come to you and say, look, I know I have a drug problem. I don't have any drugs on me right now. I want to solve my problem. And somehow you can help them without arresting them, without giving them a criminal record, and I wish that you as a police, I always feel as though I wish that the town could employ a social worker or a psychologist that would work together with the police department and say if someone voluntarily turns themselves in, you cannot criminalize them. And the reason why I say that, we lock more people up in the United States per capita than any other country in the entire world, more than China. Like, we lock more people up as, than all the other all the other dictatorships in the world. So obviously putting people in prison doesn't work either. All right, uh, Jonathan, I'm gonna have to cut you off right now. I think you've made your point. We're running out of time and we've got to finish this budget. Abby, you had a question. I think to some degree uh Richard has answered it, and that is that my understanding was that if we use services Martin Fair's um, health department, which is a member of various local um, mental health uh, services, and the police department, that they, uh, on an ongoing basis, work together to support the citizenry who have issues or who want to know about placements or want to know about support. So I, I, while, I, while I don't think that this is necessarily going to solve all of the athletic problems, I don't think that North Reading has been sitting around saying, and by the way, to that end, uh, we are adding to the uh, community impact team, uh, I don't know whether it's the health agent or a member of the Board of Health, but we're yes. taking steps to bring that Remember together. But we don't have a budget for the CIT going forward, right? Correct. We're running out of our money, and that's one of the reasons why <laughs> I wanted to bring this up. We, we've, we've made a lot of progress with the CIT, and we're out of money. But I don't see it in anybody's budget if we're going to continue with and replace that with town funds. Yeah, a lot of what this will cover was what the CIT does now, but a lot of it is in kind hours essentially that, you know, myself and other department um, or town employees essentially, we meet on a monthly basis. We talk about what the quality of life problems we're seeing are, we, we work to address them. So there's really no cost involved with that. And I, and I, I agree with you that we can be doing a lot more. Um, but I just don't know if what we're doing a lot more here as far as treatment goes, whether that's actually going to impact the problem. And, and I, it's going to take a lot of work by a lot of people. And we're, we're meeting with, um, it's okay if I can talk about, we're meeting with our, our local reps um, in, at the State House um, next month. So we're, we're going to have a seat there to, to talk about this very issue. Um, this is the only thing on the agenda, so we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a frank discussion about it. I'm gonna let them know what we're seeing here. Um, there are, on our website, and on the Community Impact Team website, there are referrals. Um, um, we have referrals on the website you can go to. Um, so there are, there are um, resources out there. Um, but people know where to go for help. Sometimes they're not always going to come to us, and I agree with you. You know, if somebody comes to us for for help, and I don't know I'm sure where you're getting your statistics from. I can assure you, our first priority is not to arrest them. It's not a statistic for us. But to be honest with you, it does not matter. Getting them help and, 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 and getting their life back on track is what matters more. We're more we're we're just as much of a social service agency at our police department, and what our guys do on a daily basis with this drug problem is not about arresting. It's about eliminating the problem. And these guys take it to heart, and so do I. And we're working towards that, so we don't arrest people when they come in and say, I need help, and I have a bag of heroin in my pocket. I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, you know how the same way as the ambulance really got treated in airlines? I always wish that one police officer 
who maybe get extra training, and they could be the sort of police officer with social with social worker training, so that they could like be a little bit more expertise. I don't know whether such a thing exists. I don't know whether they can take a special police officer and a little bit of social work on the side kind of thing. But I think that would be very useful. Okay. Michael, you want to go on one two? Yeah, I only have a. I think Steve wanted to say something. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's Jimmy. No, no, it, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't that's mean right. to, uh, no, That's okay. The uh, it, I guess I, I'm at a, a bit of a loss as to what suggestions you might be making, but just a couple of comments. I mean, I, I think probably all of us uh, know somebody that's uh, that's had some issues with their families, uh, friends, or relatives uh, in relation to the drug problems. I mean, I see it. You know, I do people's taxes. You know, hundreds of taxes. And, um, I've seen them financially ruined because, you know, kids get in trouble. You know, the, the, to Michael's point, you know, we need some treatment facilities and we need some programs and, you know, I don't know that there aren't enough beds and there aren't enough programs for the problems, you know, that, that society is facing today. And I know people that have struggled to find programs to get their, their kids and their relatives into and have, you know, cashed in their 401ks uh, in order to go out of state some way to get them into some sort of a program that insurance doesn't cover or only covers for 30 days, which is certainly isn't enough to, uh, to, to help them get over their addiction. Um, you know, and to me, get to, back to the chairman's point, I, I think it's infor important for us as a community to invest in the, uh, the education of our youth, the education of our, of our young adults, uh, get the communication out. I think forums such as this and uh, the programs that were run last year as far as uh, you know, people that uh, and drug addiction uh, in their families was you know, very powerful, uh, and helpful of, of raising awareness. Uh, you know, but if, if you're going to be reaching out, you know, as chief of police, the police department, and you're saying, you know, we have some resources and programs available for families that need it. You know, this is a great forum to do that. And that's I don't know if that's the message you're looking to get out, or, yeah. or, or you know, are you really looking for for, for uh, financial resources? Um, that's fine, but for what? And to me, uh, I'm with the chairman at this particular point. Uh, I mean, we, we're not going to build a facility here in North Reading, a treatment facility here in North Reading, you know, for, for heroin addicts. Um, I mean, I know elderly who have been robbed by their grandchildren, you know. Uh, it, it, the, the ripple effect is, is other crime. So what is it we're looking to do, other than heightened awareness right now? Uh, I'm in favor of, you know, if we can get some sort of grant monies, you know, to, to help us and assist and and getting the word out and uh, getting programs and getting educating edu educating people absolutely now if we have to uh, commit some sort of resources um, that's fine but at the expense of what I mean we have finite resources too so what is it exactly you're suggesting for us to do as selectman you will said is that the community may or may not know we've, we've come to you in the past I've, I've done drug awareness seven hours Today is n not looking for more resources. I'm looking to let the community know that this problem does exist. It has not gone away. Um, it's gotten worse. Um, it's not tied to just North Reading. It's a regional and a national problem. This is across the whole country. We're seeing the trends everywhere. So we're, we're, we're looking at what's working and what's not working. And there's more not working right now. That's my honest opinion from what I'm seeing. So, but I don't have I don't have a seat at the table where all the you know the, the task force is sitting, so I, I can't I can't speak to what they're talking about. And I'm sure they're all doing good work, but I think just you know more needs to be done, and um, you know the the treatment is, is huge, but referral from either us or from people have to reach out to us, and we will begin to do more of a informational campaign to let people know. Um, but but somebody did say it about you know it does happen people do get upset when we put statistics in the paper um, that maybe it doesn't affect them or they don't know about it it does happen it has happened to me I've had people call me and say why are you putting that in the paper um, so what we're trying to do today is just to let everybody know that it is still here and it, and it, and it is has gotten worse and that we're going to continue to do everything that we can on our end to make sure that it does not negatively impact the community um, like it has in the past. And we're trying to, to rein it in so it, it, 
it minimizes the problem. And, and again, you know, we have, we have the drug addiction problem, but you have mental illness problems too that aren't being dealt with either, which are which you're dealing with on a daily basis right. too. You know, it doesn't have to do with heroin or, or anything else, but you've got other people who are mentally unstable. There's no programs for them. Uh, they've deinstitutionalized people as opposed to they put them on medications and they get off their medications and we need to taser them. You know, so it's um, there's a whole host of social issues that we're dealing with here. Um, and I'm all for public awareness and education and, and, and making way, and I applaud you for bringing it out uh, today. Um, and we should you know, periodically use forums like this, but other forums, and I know you're making the attempts to do so, the community impact <coughs> is also. So uh, continue the well, good work, but let's. What do we do if this grant doesn't come through? Do we just, we just stop all these efforts that we have? Find another one. And that's why I brought it up as a budget it, discussion. I, I think it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's being discussed in other communities. I read other newspapers and, you know, see other news reports. And uh, so, again, it comes down to our national and state political figures to start doing something as far as the funding programs and treatment centers and educational uh, because we can't support it on with real estate tax money. It's not going to solve it. Uh, so, to your point, is we are doing things right now, um, and there are, there is cooperation with the schools um, we're doing surveys um, and we're implementing programs right now so that is happening the the grant itself is going to be above and beyond it's having a full-time person dedicated to dealing with um, youth education geared towards substance abuse so that we're, we're actually going to be enhancing what we have right now in place um, and, it, and if it doesn't work out which I'm pretty confident that it's going to happen um, if it does not, when, then we can just continue to take whatever resources we have and maybe look at down the road at adding more. Um, but you know, I th I think that I think like I said, I think it's I'm pretty confident that it's going to happen. But if it doesn't, we'll have to address it. Thank you. I think uh, uh, Jonathan, please. At this point, we've been at it for six hours. I think you made your point. Can we finish the? Uh, this is just a uh, this is a summary, just kind of recapping everything. A uh, uh, budget increases uh, and the reasons, some of the top reasons why, and, and then the decrease of overtime. So, um, I believe that this budget and um, the preparation that everybody's done here would uh, best um, serve the community um, from a police department perspective. Mr. Chairman, just a note, as I said with the fire department. The chief has proposed uh, or made requests for his department, and I've reviewed them with the finance director. And uh, you'll see that, um, with the exception of adding the animal control program oh, to the department. You said fire. Oh, oh, sorry. Please. Oh, sorry. Please. Not fire. You're all set. <laughs> <laughs> I said fire. It's been a long <laughs> morning. I was, yeah, I was sitting there. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, thinking, oh, okay. I'm, I'm trying to piece it together. The finance director and I have met with the police chief with regard to the police department's budget. And as I said, with regard to the fire department, so is the same with the police department. With the exception of adding animal control to the department, the chief's requests are what I'm recommending to the board and the finance committee for next year's budget. I just wanted to add that. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just in relation to the taser, I didn't weigh in, but uh, you know, to, to me it's just training and education for our officers. I think it's a great tool and I think it would be very useful and uh, something that we should engage in, in getting. But just with proper training, an ongoing training. I, I think we'd all also be grateful uh, if the situation arose where the alternative was to uh, use a firearm and we end up in a situation like it's been broadcast to the nation recently. Right. And, uh, to but I just needed that issue and then uh, I think it's money well spent. From a, from a safety standpoint for the officers and domestic situations, and all, I think it's a good tool. I, I want to uh, comment and uh, make a comment to the board. Uh, we've gone through this uh, uh, initial three major budgets. Uh, there have been some points that brought up that uh, it's open for us to have a future meeting, a conversation about items that you might feel should be in the budget, and that would go for this thing that you brought up, Michael. That, and then we'll have to look at, you know, how we make it fit if, if so. Mm -hmm. uh, the town administrator has presented a budget to us that is essentially balanced based on uh, our current revenue. And uh, albeit, uh, you know, we've got to make some guesses because we don't have the governor's budget at this point. 
Uh, it's a very, very tight budget we're going into in fiscal 2016. Uh, the, school, the school gap is horrendous at this point, and uh, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. But I, I think it's fair that programs and things that have been either recommended by the town administrator to be removed or items that the board thinks are important, we should bring those up at a future meeting as we get closer to tying the whole budget together. So I, I would ent entertain that, see if we can collect all these points, put numbers associated with them, and then determine you know what action we would like to take. What are we talking about as far as this uh, grant application timeline? When do we anticipate hearing something? I mean, uh, you, you, I, September. it was September you said, so yeah. And it, so. it starts October 1. So we, the turnaround will be pretty quick. <coughs> yeah, then we can uh, talk about Amy coming in and making a presentation to the board at a future meeting here. Yes, we thought it was important today to just touch upon, based upon the discussion of the, the opiate problem, to at least just, this is just a, uh, I'm just touching upon the grant. Amy will discuss in further detail um, when she presents her her budget. You know, so that uh, I think in anticipation of that, you know, for the October town meeting, we aren't just reserve an article, article space for that in case the thing falls through. We'll have something if we want to uh, take some action and find some resources to, to commit uh, to well, move we'll, a program we'll forward. We'll be reviewing the youth services budget. No, but I'm talking about. Yeah, he's no, talking about a September timeline. Yeah. You know, just put it in the tickler file for October town meeting, have an article already there because the timeline will have come and gone by the time we hear about the grant application. Uh, just give us another forum to discuss and see what we can or can't do. Abby, you had your hand up. And you know, uh, have you seen our uh, uh, coming to agendas in which departments were going to be? No, uh, Mr. Chairman, we just reviewed those with the, with you yesterday. We'll be sharing them uh, on Monday. Okay. So we have s scheduled for the next right. two meetings uh, the balance of the uh, departments. Just one of the things that Liz and the finance people, I like the new format a lot. Mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to read the uh, spreadsheet, so thank you very much for implementing that. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank uh, Officer DeCaro for, for coming. Obviously, he had to leave, and we appreciate his, yeah, his presentation. And yeah, yeah. Please, please convey that. Uh, we appreciate his being here uh, today. Thank you. And, thank you, guys. For your entire staff, yeah. you for putting all the effort in. And Fire chief, I think he just left. He left. Just thank you. Thank you. Fire. Uh,